following is a chapter reading by the Worm Audiobook Project. Please support the original author at parahumans.wordpress.com. Thank you, and enjoy. Brian was waiting for me as I passed through the door and into Coyle's underground base. He held a paper out to me. Sirs and madams, the terms of engagement are as follows. 1. Three days to each member of the Slaughterhouse Nine, so we can conduct our tests. Tests will be performed, one after the other, with eight rounds in total. 2. A successful test, or the removal of a candidate who has failed a test, will earn the test or bonus time. 3 to 12 hours for a successful test, depending on the number of candidates remaining, and 24 hours for an execution. 3. Should a tester suffer a sound defeat at the hands of any individual during their allotted time, they will be penalised one day of allotted time. 4. Each tester operates independently, with no hands-on assistance from other members of the Slaughterhouse Nine. Assistance may be bought, bartered, or otherwise rendered in a hands-off manner possibly including medical assistance, information, provided equipment, and suggestions. 5. Candidates may receive assistance, hands-on or otherwise, from Brockton Bay residents only. We are fully aware that Legend and his teammates are in Brockton Bay. Should they interfere with the tester, all candidates will lose the protection of any rules. All terms offered here will cease, and the threat implied in point H will be carried out. This only applies to confrontations with the active tester. 6. The Slaughterhouse Nine will handle the punishment of any members of their own team in the event of failures, the inability of the tester to perform at least a partial round of testing, or killing a candidate without notification. 7. Should the defending parties have two or more candidates remaining when the eighth round of testing concludes, the Slaughterhouse Nine will depart Brockton Bay without incident and refrained from returning for three years at a minimum. 8. If and when the Slaughterhouse Nine do eliminate five of the six candidates, or if any candidates leave the city, the Slaughterhouse Nine are prepared to penalise the city for their failure. Mannequin is the first to carry out his round of testing. He has two days remaining. We will be in touch. Where is everyone? I asked, handing the paper back to him. He pointed down the hall. Christ, Brand said, shaking his hand as he walked, rereading the terms. He opened the door for me. Coyle was inside, at the end of a long table. The undersiders sat at one side of the table, with Circus sitting at the furthest edge beside Coyle. The travellers, minus Noel, sat along the other side. I took note of the blonde teenager who wasn't even wearing part of a costume, Oliver. Coyle was the opposite, as fully covered as ever. Everyone else was costumed, but they had their masks and helmets off. I got my first good look at Lisa since I'd left her bleeding in Ballistics Headquarters. The scar ran from the corner of her mouth to the corner of her jaw, and the dark stitches ran down the length of it. The slang term for this kind of injury was a Glasgow smile, or a Chelsea smile, but the term seemed ill-fitting. Where Lisa often had a grin on her face, the cut pulled the corner of her mouth down into a perpetual lopsided frown rather than a smile. Bitch gave me a dark look as I entered, but many of the others were smiling. The people of my territory are singing your praises, Skitter, Ballistic said. My territory, too, Alec added. I didn't do anything that special. My power did the work. And you kicked Mannequin's ass, Trickster said. He leaned back in his chair, balancing on two of the legs, his feet on the table. You had a busy night. Honestly, I didn't kick his ass. He got some of my people. He thrashed me. I got a piece of him. No, Lisa said, her voice quiet. She couldn't really move one corner of her mouth when talking, so her words came out slightly slurred. I saw her work her tongue in her mouth and then take a sip of water, wincing. Brian had updated me. The cut had probably damaged one or more of her salivary glands, and she'd have dry mouth until it healed. Maybe forever. The really scary part was that she might have suffered some nerve damage as well. How much of that half frown was because of the direction of the cut and the way the stitches pulled? And how much was because her nerves were damaged enough that her face was drooping. She caught me looking and gave me a wink. She took another gulp of water and cleared her throat before speaking again. They took one day from Mannequin because they thought he lost. If the enemy thinks they lost, Brian said, 
that's a good enough reason to think you've won. I privately disagreed, but I didn't say anything. I pulled up a chair and sat at the corner of the table furthest from Coyle, wincing at the pain in my ribs as I bent down. So, Brian said, you intend for something like this to happen when you made your suggestion, Tattletail? Lisa shrugged. Sorta. Thought he'd take the bait. Didn't know how far. It's not all advantageous, I said, thinking aloud. Yes. We are now in a position where we could win, with some planning or luck, and the plan we were hashing out at our last meeting might be easier now. But we're also facing pretty heavy consequences if we fail. Heavier consequences. And there's a lot of places where this could go wrong. We don't even know who all the candidates are. Me, Bitch, Armsmaster, Noel, probably Hookwolf, and someone in Faultline's crew, Alex said. No. Jack said they picked two heroes. Hookwolf, yes. But their last pick is a hero, and not one of Faultline's, Lisa said. And we can't say for sure who this person is, or what actions they plan to take, I said. Too much hinges on everyone else's willingness to cooperate and play by the rules. And the stuff that happened at the last meeting of the city's villains makes me sceptical, Brian nodded. It's important that we find this person, make sure they play along, so we don't wind up losing before this game of theirs even starts. There's other problems here, I said. We can't forget what Dana said about Jack. If he leaves town, it could mean disaster. If we win, we could all lose in the long run, because it would mean he'd left town and Dana's prophecy would come true. Hell, a lot hinges on whether the Protectorate is on the same page as us. If they arrest him and take him out of town, it could mean the end of the world. Right, I said. Hickwolf has proposed an all-out attack. Quill spoke for the first time since my arrival. He wants to gather the more powerful members of his alliance together into an army and attempt to overwhelm the Nine and kill Jack Slash in the chaos. That won't work. Brian shook his head. These guys specialize in dealing with crowds, and they're experienced when it comes to that sort of thing. Hookwolf believes our local capes are collectively strong enough to do what other groups couldn't. Maybe they are, but I wouldn't bet on it. We should be focused on what we can do, Bran said. You guys are better set up for information gathering and escapes, Trickster said. We could take them on, depending on who it is and how small the group is, but I don't know how well we do in those circumstances. We should mix up our teams then, Bran said. Just between us, we've got three candidates. Noel, Regent, and Bitch. Three targets. Crawler couldn't reach Noel where we've got her stashed, Trickster said. I'm not sure what the others could do. What about when Siberian comes after Noel? I asked. Will the same measures stop her? Probably not, Trickster replied. This would be a lot easier if you tell us more about her, I pointed out. Unless you think she can hold her own against the Nine, we're going to be helping protect her. Trickster frowned. There's not much to say. She's in containment, and if she doesn't stay where she is, things could get worse. Fast. So she's dangerous, and she's not entirely in control of her power? He tilted his chair forward, until it was flat on the ground, and set his elbows on the table, hands clasped in front of his mouth. He glanced down at the table at his teammates. I wasn't sure, but I thought maybe he glanced briefly at Coyle. With a resigned tone, he told us, She's dangerous enough that if Siberian got to her, I think she'd make it out okay. The rest of us wouldn't. The table was silent for a moment. I could see something in the faces of the travellers. Pain? It wasn't physical, so perhaps it was emotional. It could be fear, guilt, regret, or any number of other things. Trickster's words reminded me of what Sundancer had said back when she and I had fought long. Sundancer had held back in using her power because she was frightened about hurting bystanders or killing the people she attacked. Her power was too hard to use without hurting someone. Ballistic was the same. Was Noelle another case of the same thing? That same, too powerful ability, only on a greater scale? Brian sighed. We'll deal with Noelle's situation when it comes up. We have three targets they're going to be coming after, with a fourth if we consider that Manicon will be after Skitter. If we split into two groups, then we can maintain enough offensive power to defend ourselves against the ones like Manicon, Burn Scar, Jack, or Shatterbird. Sundancer cut in, which makes me wonder. Sorry if this is a crummy idea, but... What if we waited for Jack's turn, and then tried to kill him? No guarantees there, Brian answered her. I think we'll have to be proactive in going after him. Maybe we can use Hookwell's distraction. Maybe he'll get cocky and make a mistake. Doubt it, Tattletail said. 
He lasted years doing it what he does. I couldn't help but nod in agreement. Besides, he goes last, Tattletail finished. To get back to what you were saying, you were proposing dividing the teams, Quail spoke. Yeah, Bran said. Bitch has offensive power of her own. Skitter does too. If there's no complaints, we could play this largely geographically. Maybe me, Imp, Bitch, and Skitter? If you guys can put your differences aside. No problem, I said. Whatever, Bitch answered, noncommittal. It was only when Brian mentioned Imp that I realized Aisha was present. I'd almost missed her. I wanted to believe that it was because she was sitting at the end of the table, and there were four of my teammates between us. But I couldn't be sure. It would be damn nice if there was some sort of gradual immunity to her power. And maybe someone else who isn't raw offensive. Circus? Brian suggested. Coyle spoke before Circus could reply. No. I pulled her off a task as a precautionary measure, as I had one aspect of my long-term plans derailed last night with Trainwreck's demise at the Nine's hands. I would rather she did not fall to an unfortunate coincidence of the same nature. What happened? Sundancer asked. They've eliminated the merchants, Coyle said. I wasn't sure how to feel about that. The merchants were scum of the worst sort. It wasn't just that they polluted everything they touched, and did some reprehensible things. They reveled in it. They wanted to be the lowest of the low. On the other hand, it was a point for the other side. Seven or eight power humans we no longer had to fight the nine with. Also, I would prefer her involvement in my operations stay under wraps. She can defend Noelle and myself for the time being. Then Trickster, or Genesis. Brian said. I would rather stay close to Noelle, Trickster said. If Genesis is willing, that would be fine. And that leaves Ballistic, Sundancer, Trickster, Noelle, Regent, and Tattletail for the second group. We stay together, we keep an eye on our territories to watch for trouble from Hookless contingent, and we keep an eye out for our opportunity. Tattletail, you're good with watching the downtown areas? Lisa nodded. And Skitter has the sensory abilities to check areas of the docks where the Undersiders have territory. I'll need to visit each area in turn, unless we have some people to pass on messages and a means of communication. I arranged a delivery, Coyle said. You'll each be provided with a satellite phone before you leave, with mobile phones to use when the towers are in operation again. It won't be immediate, but I have shipments of new generators, appliances, laptops, and other necessities on the way. With the information Hookwolf has provided us about Shatterbird's power, I think we could shield the most necessary pieces of equipment with soundproofing in case of a repeat incident. My bugs did hear something, just before the blast hit, I said. Is her power ultrasonic? Something like that. Tattletail believes the Chatterbird's power causes glass to resonate at a very particular frequency, where it generates that same resonation in other pieces of glass with the aid of her power, perpetuating the effect until it runs out of large pieces of glass to effect. And, Lisa said, she probably has a reason for hitting the entire city like she does. She took another drink of water. Big pieces of glass help transmit the signal. Maybe smaller shards help her in another way. Probably helps, or allows, more delicate movements. I'm not saying I'm not happy to be getting more concrete information on how they operate. I just wish it was against the ones we don't have any idea how to stop. Like Crawler, or Siberian, I said. We use the same strategy we used to fight Aegis, Bran said. When fighting an opponent, who won't go down, you run. You distract, you occupy them with other things, and you contain them to buy yourself time to do what you have to do. He was right. It just wasn't ideal. Avoiding or containing them was easier said than done, for one thing, and it was less an answer than a stopgap measure. We've addressed the most pertinent crisis then, Coyle said. Is there anything else? Any ideas or requests? I had an idea, Aisha said. No, Brian said. I know what you're about to say because we talked this over. It's a bad idea. Let's hear it, Trickster spoke up, leaning forward. Brian scowled and Aisha smiled wickedly. The biggest threat from these guys is that they could strike at any time, from any direction. So why don't we spy on them? We find out where they are, and then we keep taps on their movements. I can handle one shift. Genesis does the next. They won't notice me and Genesis can stay concealed. It's far too risky, Brian said. You joined this team so I could stop you from getting yourself killed. It would be nice to know what they're up to, Trickster cut in. They won't even know I'm there. You'd think they won't know you're there, Bran said. There's a distinction there. It's important, and it could either lead to a major advantage. 
A huge advantage, Aesir said. Or it could lead to you being turned into a human test subject for whatever fucked up idea Bonesaw had recently, Brian finished, ignoring her. No, I got a power, and it's a useful power, except you don't want me to use it, because you think it's going to stop working, all of a sudden. Or someone is going to see me. Dragon saw you, Brian said. And you're only alive because she doesn't kill people. Looking at Brian and Aisha, I knew this discussion would get worse before it got better. I cut in before either of them said something regrettable. Imp. It's a good idea. But they do have a way of sensing you. Cherish can sense emotions. And if Dragon has any indication, your power primarily works through sight, hearing, and touch. Like Ruse. She can probably find you and track you down. We don't know that, Aisha said. It's a pretty good educated guess, I think. I know you want to be useful, but we can make more use of you if you're with us, going up against someone like Mannequin or Shatterbird, who are far less likely to be able to see you. Help us defend ourselves. This sucks. Imp, Gru said, as he glanced at the others at the table, and frowned. We're in the company of our employers and our peers. Let's stay professional and discuss this after. Professional? You asshole! You're the one who's refusing to use my talents, because I'm your sister. I've been on the team longer than Skitter was when you guys were robbing a bank and fighting the ABB. You're younger, and she's more level-headed. Enough, Coyle said. It served to shut them both up. For a few seconds, anyway. Aisha scowled. Enough is right. I'll see you guys later. Hey! Brian stood from his seat. I think I wasn't the only one to look up at him. I wonder why. He looked at us. Similarly confused, and then sat down, just as quickly as he stood. Lisa looked pensive. I nudged her and asked, You okay? Yeah, she replied. Then she looked at Coyle. Hey, while you're asking for suggestions, I have an idea. Anything helps? You think you could get your hands on some surveillance hardware? Skitter's working on some new costumes, and I was thinking we could have something like small cameras mounted on our masks or helmets. I can inquire with my usual suppliers. Why? Well, we've got one teammate that's sort of hard for the rest of you to keep track of, and I think it might help. And if nobody objects, I'm kind of wanting to take a less hands-on approach from here on out. I've battered a pretty low percentage as far as injuries go over the last few months of action. Glory Girl, Bakuda, Leviathan. Now this incident with Jack. If I had a means of communication and the gear to give me some eyes on the scene, I think I could be more useful. Coyle looked at Brian. I gave you a hard time about your having to take the same risks as the rest of us, back when you first joined, but I think you've done your share. So long as you're contributing, Bran said. Quail nodded. I'll see what we can prepare. Lisa smiled a little, using only the one side of her mouth. Our canine mounts raced through the streets with impunity. The glass that covered the roads, the lack of windows, windshields, or working dashboards, and the few cars that still ran all contributed to the glacial pace of traffic. There was little for the dogs to watch out for, no moving vehicles, and few bystanders. Every stride the dog took made the bag I was carrying bang against my hip and made every injury I had explode with pain. I clenched my teeth and endured it. There weren't many other options. I could hardly complain to Bitch. Bitch was well in the lead, and there was a kind of aggression to how she rode. She pulled ahead, evading cars by only a couple of inches, forcing them to swerve and she goaded Bentley faster with kicks and shouts. We hadn't raised the topic of Bitch and her nomination for the Nine. I think the others hadn't wanted to add tension and the possibility of an argument or violence to the already complicated situation. I know I hadn't. My last real interaction with Bitch was when we'd parted ways after the fight with Dragon. I told her we were even, but there had been some anger and hurt feelings on both sides. I was the last person she wanted to have grilling her. Bitch made Bentley slow down to walk as she reached my territory. It still took us a good thirty seconds to catch up. Using my power, I signaled Seria and Charlotte. Gru, Bitch, and I climbed down from our dogs, and then led them forward. Mannequin slipped by you once, Gru said. You going to be able to keep an eye out? I had some ideas, but I'm running low on resources, I said. Let me see what I can do. Genesis began to appear a short distance away, near Bitch. A blurry, beige and yellow, vaguely human-shaped figure coalesced into being. The shape then sharpened into features and altering hue, until there was a figure of a teenage girl, vaguely cartoonish. By the time we reached her, she looked indistinguishable from a regular girl. 
She had auburn hair, freckles, and thick glasses. A small smile touched her face as she stretched her arms and legs. Everything good? Gru asked her. Good enough. I'm going to keep this shape until Coyle's people can deliver my real body. Then I'll need to recuperate some. Sure. Bitch growled at me. Bastard, her puppy, stood beside her. He had received the brunt of her power, and looked roughly as large as an adult Great Dane. The features were different from her usual dogs. The spikes had more symmetry to their arrangement, and the muscles looked less like tangles. It tugged briefly on the chain that led from her hand to its collar, and she pulled back sharply. It didn't pull again, though it was easily powerful enough to knock her over. My people met us as we entered the neighborhoods, where my lair and the barracks we'd set up were. Surya and Charlotte were in the lead, the three ex-ABB members behind them. The O'Daly clan stood at more of a distance, all either members of the family, friends, or romantic partners. Other, smaller families filled in the gaps. My gang numbered nearly fifty people in total. Holy crap, Janice said. It's why we wanted to set up base here, Gru said. Skitter's the most established of us. I've been focusing on structural repairs and building when I'm not helping my teammates, Genesis said. I don't have many threats to get rid of, and it was the best way for me to be productive. And meanwhile, you're further than I expected to get in half a year. I couldn't bring myself to feel proud. I guess I'm motivated. Genesis whistled, looking around. There were some looks of confusion as she strode forward into the crowd. I suppose it was unusual for a teenage girl to be in the company of three known supervillains and a mass of monstrous dogs. Surya, I said. Status? We're nearly done with the second building. There isn't a lot of elbow room, so we've been cleaning up the road. Good. No trouble? Not that I know of. I pulled the bag from over my shoulder and handed it to her. Distribute these to the people in charge of the various groups. Work it out so you can pass on messages quickly. And get any necessary information to me ASAP. Okay, she grunted as she took the bag. Genesis, I spoke. You said you were doing some rebuilding. She slapped her stomach. Made some mortar, just a matter of sticking stuff back, where it's supposed to be, if it's obvious enough. Want to see what you can do before your body gets here? She nodded and headed off. My minions rapidly backed away from her as she began dissolving. Charlotte? Yes? How set up is the building you guys were working on? Mess is cleared out, but we haven't moved much in. That should be fine. We ready? Gru asked. I turned to face him and bitch. Just a bite. Bitch, there's a space set aside that we can use for your dogs. We'll patrol through the various territories in an hour or so. Stop by your territory and pick up some supplies for them. And you can bring your dogs here. I had to resist adding an... If it's okay. Firmness would work best with her, even if it did carry the risk of provoking her. Fine. Good, Gru said. Let's go rest and eat. We can wait for Genesis, and the other gear coils dropping off. I had enough bugs nearby to start setting up my early warning system. With the assistance of a horde of flying insects, I began guiding spiders through the various points of my territory. They drew out lines of silk across the alleyways and doors, windows, and rooftops. I couldn't spare the spiders, so I placed ants on each line. They would feel it if there were a vibration. Not as well as the spiders, but well enough. Ten thousand tripwires for a mannequin to navigate past. My expectation was for the lines to maybe give me an early warning of mannequin's approach. Sometime in the coming hours. Maybe in the dead of night. I didn't expect to find him in the span of a minute. A figure on a nearby rooftop was striding through the webs and avoiding the bugs. I stopped. Mannequin? Everyone froze. Even the dogs seemed to mime their master's stillness. But he was already leaving, moving with surprising swiftness as he pushed through another few lines of webbing at the edge of the roof furthest from us. A second later, he was on the ground, moving through an alleyway. We could go after him, Gru asked. We couldn't catch him, I don't think, I said. And he may be trying to bait us into a trap. Or maybe he wants to loop around while we give chase and kill my people. Shit, I didn't think he'd come so quickly. We weren't exactly inconspicuous. I frowned. Mannequin was on guard for a trap. Enough that he'd probably noticed the tripwire and decided to retreat. 
Monica and I had an estimation of one another now. Neither of us wanted a direct confrontation. Both of us would be wary of traps or trickery. He was a tinker. He would have prepared something to ward against the tactic I had employed last time. Topping it off, amassing people to please Coil had the unfortunate side effect of making me more vulnerable to Mannequin's attacks. He could hurt me without even getting close to me. The second I let my guard down and gave him an avenue for attack, the only ambiguous advantage we had over him was that he was working with the time limit. He needed to test bitch and get revenge on me, in addition to dealing with all the other candidates, and he had less than 48 hours to do it. I wasn't so sure that was a good thing. It was beginning to dawn on me what we were in for. 48 hours of being on the edge of our seats, unable to sleep deeply, constantly watching for attack from Mannequin or from Hookwell's contingent. When we were done, we faced 72 hours of the same thing. We'd be that much more tired, that much more likely to make a mistake. Then we'd have to do it again, and again, and again. Eight rounds in total. From my altercation with Mannequin, I knew we wouldn't make it through even the first few encounters, without some loss, some injury or casualty. By the time the eighth round of testing rolled around, what kind of condition would we be in? What condition would my territory be in? I had initially seen Tattletail's deal with Jack as a good thing, a minuscule chance at success, with some drawbacks and negative points. The more I dwelled on it, the more daunting it seemed. You okay? Gray asked me. A little spooked, I admitted. He set a hand on my shoulder. We'll make it. Speaking from the perspective of someone who had gone toe-to-toe with these guys, I wasn't so convinced. Aisha's not here, Gray informed us. He locked the door to his headquarters and climbed on top of Sirius. Bitch and I were astride Bentley and Lucy, respectively, and Bastard was on the end of a chain that Bitch held. Did you give her a job before you left for Coils this morning? I suggested. He shook his head. No. I make notes, and I make her take notes, too. Keeping track of that girl is a nightmare. Tattletail's working on her idea, I said. It felt ineffectual as reassurances went. In the hopes of elaborating on the thought, I added, Maybe she'll be able to keep track of him, and stay in touch with us, to keep us informed. Maybe. You done a sweep of the area? I shook my head. Need another minute. I'm trying to be thorough in how I check each area for enemies. A mannequin can see my bugs, so I have to use silk lines to try and catch him. It's slow, and I definitely don't want to miss him. Also, it would be nice to grab some bugs, to build up and replenish my stock. I let the bugs gather on Lucy's back, depositing spiders and large beetles. The dog didn't seem to mind. Right. Good. Gru looked at Bitch. We'll finish checking out my territory, stop in yours, to help you with whatever you need to do for your dogs. Then we'll pass through Tattletail's area on the way back to Skitters. I don't really care, Bitch said, looking off into the distance. I was pretty sure she was deliberately looking away from me. It was as though she wanted to pretend I didn't exist. Gru looked at me and shrugged. This wasn't going to work. She was too distant. And that was dangerous. Not that it wasn't risky to try and address the problem. It still needed to be done. Making sure Bitch wasn't looking, I tapped two fists together and then pointed at her. He shrugged again. He didn't get it? Drawing from the bugs I had stored in my costume, I dried the words in the air, with the bugs flying in tightly controlled formations. Confront her. He hesitated. Be leader, I wrote. Then I changed the words of leader to honest. Bitch, Gru spoke. What? She snapped her head around to face him. Her eyes flicked over to me and narrowed slightly before they returned to him. This whole thing with you not talking, it's not working. So? So cut it out. Or at least explain what's going through your head. What I think is my business. No, I cut in. I couldn't help it. You're a member of the team, and if you're thinking about joining the Nine, then that matters. I'm not, she snapped. But? I added. What? You're not thinking about joining them, but? I let the question hang for a second. Something is eating you up. Did you not hear what I said about my thoughts being my business? Bitch, Gru warned. What? She clenched her fist, and I think the dogs could see something in her body language, because they tensed too. She said, fuck it. Pisses me off when you get on my case. Leave me alone. She kicked Bentley lightly in the sides, and the dog began walking. She kicked him again, and he started running. Lucy and Sirius wanted to follow, so it thankfully didn't take much effort to get them moving. Bitch wasn't riding as fast as she could, 
so it was clear enough that she wasn't trying to escape. She wanted space, and she was angry. I glanced over my shoulder at Gru. How the hell were we supposed to handle this situation? My phone vibrated at my back, and in my effort to avoid falling off Lucy, I wasn't able to get at it. I fought to make her obey me, and stop by pulling on the chains and wrenching her right, then left. She finally halted, and I took the opportunity to grab my phone. I'd missed my window. It started vibrating again. Yes, I answered. You guys busy, Lisa asked. Just patrolling our territories to make sure that the Chosen aren't up to anything, I said. A droplet of water fell on the lens of my mask. I looked up at the overcast sky. Rain? Listen, you know that I've got some people working for me. Passing on info, right? Sure. Bryce is one of them, right? Right. Well, I've got all of them keeping an eye out for capes and known faces. Known faces? Like the members of Empire 88, who were outed. Like them. Or Jack. Or Bonesaw. But that's not what this is about. Senegal just dropped by Coyle's base, and he's passing on information from one of my scouts. They saw a panacea at one of the shelters in Ballistics Territory. I'm not entirely sure I follow. All of the new wave live southwest of the Tars, the nice part of downtown. Neither of their houses were hit by the worst of the waves, and none of the Chosen or Merchants are stupid enough to attack them, and they wouldn't succeed if they were. You follow me now? Sort of. You're wondering why she's there? She could just be there giving medical help to the injured. My scouts say she's keeping to herself, trying to avoid attracting attention. Curious. Exactly. Want to go pay a visit? I used clouds of bugs to get the attention of my teammates, then waved for them to come my way when they stopped and looked my way. I'm not the best person to talk to Panacea. She kind of hates me. Remember the thing at the hospital? The bank robbery? But you have talked to her before. She was there to hear Arms Master talking about you, being a wannabe hero, betraying us. If nothing else, maybe the idea of getting answers about that will get her listening. So you can move on to a real conversation. Maybe. I don't really think so. Wouldn't somebody else work better? You guys aren't far from that spot. Who would you send? Sundancer and Ballistic are threatening by their very nature. I'm not up to it, and she hates me more than she hates you. I wouldn't trust Bitch, Regent, or Trickster to handle it. I think you'd agree with me there. Genesis? Lisa sighed. We could send Genesis. Is she with you? She's resting, or at least she's recuperating from using her power. If something comes up, she told us to call her, and she'll have one of her creations with us in a minute. Your call. The travelers seem decent, but they're hiding something. And I really do think you'd be a better person to talk to her. Okay, text me the address. I'll ask the others, and we'll call Genesis in if necessary. Cool. I hung up. Grun bitch had already returned to me. What is it? Gru asked me. Hannah sees in a shelter, and she shouldn't be. Tattletail finds it strange, and I agree with her. She wants us to check Panacea out. Why? Bitch asked. None of our business. It could mean answers. We're looking for a sixth candidate, and we can't protect candidates like you if we don't know who they are. Maybe Panacea is the sixth. Maybe someone she knows, like Lori Girl. If nothing else, I can raise the subject of whatever plague Boonsaw has that's supposed to scare the candidates and the local heroes into playing along. It also means I have to wait before I check on my dogs and the rest of my territory. Gru looked my way. Should I capitulate and tell her that we could send Genesis to give her what she wanted, or would it be better to get her to agree and risk angering her? As odd as it may be, I gravitated toward the latter option. Bitch responded better to firmness. She's supposedly in Ballistic's territory, which is close. Five minutes there, up to five minutes to talk, five minutes to get back, I said. Fifteen minutes out of our way, Gru said, and anything we find out about the Nine or their candidates can potentially help you, Rachel. She scowled. Whatever. I took that for a cent and turned Lucy around. With a shout, I got her moving. I kept the phone in one hand while I rode, waiting for Lisa's response. It didn't matter. She found me before I found her. Or, to be more specific, she found my bugs before I found her. There were enough flies in the city that most people didn't give a second thought to one landing on them especially if it landed on their clothing. I habitually used my bugs to check people nearby for weapons or masks, and when I checked the people in a building three blocks away, one of the bugs brushed against Panacea. She must have been able to tell it wasn't an ordinary bug, as she'd done at the bank robbery. She used her power to scramble them and force whatever mechanism my power activated in their system into a feedback loop. Before it could incapacitate me and my power, 
I swept up the bugs with larger dragonflies and flying beetles and probably murdered them, feeding them to the other bugs in the area and pulling them apart. Panacea was waiting in an alley when we arrived, arms folded. Her brown hair was tucked beneath an army green mush cap. The brim pulled low. She looked exhausted, worn out. She had the same devastated look in her eyes that I had seen in her cousin and aunt on the day of the Endbringer attack. I see you've got the two other horsemen of the apocalypse with you. Where's number four? I shook my head. Horsemen of the apocalypse? Never mind. I hopped down from Lucy's back. I just want to talk. I can't outrun those dogs. You've got me outnumbered, and you've probably got more weapons than me. I think you're in a position to do whatever you want. Good, I said, because like I said, I just want to talk. I could get rid of my weapons, if that would make you feel any better. It wouldn't really. I saw her step back a little, and I could tell she was ready to bolt. We were in a position to catch her, for sure, but it would be more detrimental than anything. If we chased her down, any dialogue I had with her afterward would be an interrogation, not a conversation. Okay. Grew? Bitch? You want to give us some space? Stay close enough that we can hear each other with shouts. Sure. You check in the area? Yeah, no trouble yet. He nodded, and the pair of them led their dogs away. What's going on? Panacea asked. That's what I was going to ask you. Why are you in a shelter, Panacea? Don't call me that. I raised my hands in a bit to stop her. Okay. Why are you in a shelter, Amy? Why is that any of your business? Because two of my teammates were picked by the Nine, and Jack Slash has started a messed-up version of Survivor with the candidates as players. Survivor? If I'd been pressed to say, I would have said her body language shifted fractionally on hearing that. Concern for herself? Her sister? Someone else? You didn't get a paper with a list on it, I asked. I was staying somewhere else last night. I heard from a classmate that my aunt was supposedly looking for me, so I legged it. I could have pressed for more details there, but I suspected she'd keep to the conversation better if I gave her the info instead of demanding it. They set themselves a time limit to test and eliminate the six candidates. The goal is to test the candidates and kill the ones who fail, until there is only one. Our goal is to save them. So when Tattletail figures out you're here, instead of with your family, and when we know that the sixth candidate is apparently a hero, it gets our attention. Who are the other candidates? Regent? Bitch. Hookwolf. Armsmaster. Armsmaster? Yeah, though it might be like Cherish is doing to Regent. More to screw with him than for legit reasons. Okay. I can see it, though. I've interacted with him. He really did cross the line during the Endbringer attack. And the fifth? A non-cape. I don't know the details, but she's in a secure location. Amy fidgeted. I'm getting out of here. Where? Away. I don't want to be a part of any of this. You can't leave. Why not? I can find a place to hole up and hide until it blows over. So long as you're in Brockton Bay, they've got someone who can watch you. Can watch any of us. She reads emotions and apparently uses them to find us from half a city away. It's probably how they find the candidates in the first place. Then I'll leave the city. I was going to anyways. Fuck, I still wish I had the list, I muttered. In a normal speaking volume, I said no. You can't leave a town either, because Bonesaw prepared a plague or something. If you are a candidate and you leave the city, they'll use it. They explicitly said they were using it as an incentive for the two heroes that they picked as candidates. Heroes, Amy muttered. Right. Are you a candidate? She fidgeted again. Bonesaw nominated me. Do you know why? Bitterly, she said, what do you think? She thought I'd be a good fit. And because my powers complement hers. A good fit? Just because of my interactions with you, I wouldn't have thought. No? She asked, sarcasm in her tone. Why wouldn't you have thought? You heard what Tattletail said. I'm the daughter of a villain. I haven't been nice. I haven't been merciful or forgiving or considerate. Instead of giving you a second chance, I was spiteful. I toyed with your feelings and things spiraled out of control. You know how much trouble that caused for my family? The director of the PRT and Legend and Miss Melita were all at my house, lecturing all of us about how serious these events were and how sensitive relations between the various fractions were. I... I don't want to strike a nerve or say the wrong thing. I'm not very good at picking the right thing to say, but I forgive you. I know you were tired. You were overworked. You had no reason to like me or to do me any favors. And you healed me anyways. I could see her tense. Would she storm off? Lash out at me like bitch would. She just fell silent, avoiding eye contact with me. I don't think you're a monster, I said. She laughed briefly. 
and it was a dark utterance with no humor in it. No, everyone knows how you visit hospitals. How many people have you helped over the past three years? How many lives have you saved? How many people have you rescued from a lifetime of misery? I hated it, she said. It was such a burden. I was so many long hours spent around sick people, and I got numb to it. I stopped caring. Do you know how many hours I've spent awake at night, wishing my powers would just go away, or that some circumstance would come up where I'd make some excusable mistake, where they would eventually forgive me, but where I couldn't visit the hospitals anymore? It caught me off guard hearing it, and but I managed to get my mental bearings. You didn't ask for your powers. I'm sure even doctors get worn out. They hate their job. They have bad weeks, except doctors have fellow staff members. They have friends and everything to go back to. And they're adults. You're still a teenager. You started doing what you're doing at a time when most people didn't. You didn't have the maturity and the defenses against the pain you were seeing that doctors pick up over the course of the first 25 years of their lives. She shook her head. Don't. Don't what? Don't make me out to be a good person. Bonesaw has a better idea of who I am than you do. Maybe I wouldn't have thought so three days ago when she first met me, but then I fucked up. I proved her right. Every fear I had about being like my dad came true. I didn't have a reply to that. I couldn't pry, and I couldn't elaborate. So you're the supposedly good person who was pretending to be a crook, and I'm the monster who was pretending to be a hero. But then the dust settled. We both wound up being villains. It's funny how that works. Maybe because doing the right thing is hard, I offered. She shrugged. But you can do the right thing. We need your help. I don't know your circumstances for leaving home. I won't pry. But I think you're one of the few people who can stop Crawler. Maybe even Siberian too. We need you around in case they start winning and we wind up with injuries or death. And we need you in case we start winning. And they decide to use that plague out of sheer spite. More burdens, more pressures and demands, she said, her voice quiet. Yeah, that's the way things play out. But we can help protect you in exchange. You watch our back, we watch yours. I don't know if my conscience can handle taking that final step over to the dark side, or if I can handle being in Tattletail's company. We're operating as two distinct groups. Tattletail's with Regent and most of the travellers. It's me, Groot, Imp, Genesis, and Bitch here, in the north end of town. Absolute. I didn't finish my sentence. Something constricted around my throat, fingertips digging into the windpipe, and the air ceased to flow. I struck behind me, hoping to catch my attacker, but there was nobody there. I realized what was happening too late when my feet were hauled off the ground in the span of a second. I soared up six or seven stories, the counterweight to a nine-foot-tall man in featureless white armor who plunged downward to land in a heap on the ground. Mannequin. He repaired himself this fast? Did he have spare parts lying around? I reached up and tried to wind my arm, wrist, and fingers around the chain to alleviate the pressure on my throat and to give me a grip in case he decided to let go. Mannequin hauled himself to his feet, and the chain that stretched from his arm to the rooftop and back down made me bounce, with every small movement. He advanced on Amy, who backed away. I had to do something. Calling on the bugs that had covered Lucy, I stirred up a cloud to grab Gurren Bitch's attention, then pulled all the bugs into the alleyway where Panacea and Mannequin were. The way I was hanging with Mannequin gripping my neck from the back, I had a vantage point to witness. What came next? If my bugs weren't enough of a signal to the others, Amy's scream of pain was. Mannequin caught up to her and plunged a knife through her hand, pinning it to the wall. He left her like that, in enough pain that she couldn't stand, but unable to drop to the ground because her hand was impaled. Turning, he faced the incoming stampede of Gru, Bitch, and the four dogs. While I struggled to escape, drawing my knife with my free hand while gripping the chain with the other, I set my bugs in to assist. Same tactic as last time. My bugs drew out lines of silk and plastered them around him. I focused on his free hand and his legs, aiming to hamper his range of movement. Something was different from the last time. I wasn't sure if I would have known just by going by naked eye, but I knew almost right away by the length of the silk I was drawing around him. His arms were bigger, and the weight of them was making his body hunch forward a fraction. I tried to scream to call out a warning, but I couldn't breathe to do it. I would have used my bugs to draw words but the pair were moving too fast to read anything I threw their way. I drove the knife at the hand that held me instead. Bitch ordered Bentley to pounce. Mannequin raised his arm, and the deafening boom of a gun firing filled the alley. The shot was powerful enough that Bentley was knocked off course. Mannequin simultaneously leapt 
and retracted the chain that still stretched to the rooftop, swinging across the alley and escaping collision by mere fractions of an inch. Bentley and Bitch sprawled on the ground. I hacked at the hand that held me again while grew through darkness over the pair of them. My swarm sense gave me a picture of what happened next. Grew dodged to one side, and Mannequin followed him, his arm uneerily moving to follow his target. My bugs were then blown out of the air as another shot was fired at Grew and Sirius. I could feel it spread out, hitting multiple points on the pair of them. A shotgun? Lucy pounced from where she'd been moving in Sirius's wake, and she landed half on top of the chain that held me. I surged another three or four feet up, and the hand caught where it fixed on a loop of metal that had been sunken into the corrugated metal of the roof. This was where the chain was threaded. I hacked at the hand again while gripping the metal loop. The knife caught inside a joint, and I worked at it, trying to bend it or pry the joint apart. I couldn't really see what I was doing, and the bugs I had on the surface of the hand weren't as useful as I'd hoped. Below me, Lucy and Mannequin fought, the smaller bastard dancing around the edges, trying to find an avenue or attack, or hampering Mannequin's movements. Lucy managed to get on top of him. A third gunshot sounded. There was a long pause, where nothing and nobody moved, and then a fourth gunshot. Lucy slumped over, crashing on top of Bastard. Mannequin stood, taking a moment to use a knife to cut at the thread that wound around his arms and legs. When he was done, he disconnected the chain that ran to the hand that held me aloft. I was left hanging from the metal ring. He watched me for several long seconds, his head raised. He abandoned his grip on the back of my neck, and his arm dropped into his waiting hand. The chain fed through the metal loop, running over my fingertips before it was gone. A few seconds passed, and I realized he was still staring up at me, one finger pointing at me. Me? He wanted something from me? No. He turned away, striding past Amy, who was still impaled to the wall by her hand, and stopped when he stood over Bitch. Drawing another knife from a point I couldn't see on his body, he stabbed Bentley right in between the eyes. He turned to look at me one last time, and then he was gone. My hands were tired from riding the dog, and while my gloves afforded me some traction on the metal loop, the fabric seemed to slide under my sweating fingers. I tried to haul myself up, enough to get one leg over the edge of the roof, and nearly lost my grip. My hands wouldn't give me enough of a hold, and I didn't trust my knife to bite deep enough into the concrete to serve any better. I let it fall, and raised my other hand to the metal, to get a better grip. Again, I tried to swing one leg up. This time I got it over the roof's edge. I ran pell-mell for the door that led into the crowded building below me, using bugs to get the general shape of the hallways and finding my way. Some people shrieked as I ran into and through the crowd, out the front doors and back to the alley. Gru was standing, pulling the knife free from Amy's hands so she could slump to the ground. Bitch knelt on the ground beside Lucy, while Bentley lay on the ground, the knife still embedded in his skull, and both Sirius and Bastard hung back, limping as they moved, blood leaking from a dozen dime-sized wounds in their flesh. A low growl tore free from Bitch's throat, but I knew before I looked that Lucy hadn't made it. Two shotgun blasts directly to the chest cavity. I didn't know what to say. You led him right to me, Amy accused us, sounding more than slightly hysterical. I... He slipped past the silk tripwires I put around the area, and... And they can find you, I said, the words clumsy made worse by my sense of disorientation over the surprise attack and the distraction of the pain in my neck. They can find you anyways, with Cherish. My hand... Hurts, Amy said ignoring my fractured explanation. Heal yourself, Gris said. He wasn't looking at her. His attention was on the knife he'd pulled from her hand. I can't. I'm immune to my own power. Calm down, he said. Panic won't get us anywhere. Fuck you. Fuck all of you, Amy said. Then she ran. I didn't have the air in my lungs or the heart to chase her, and both Gru and Bitch were too hurt to give chase. I could run and catch up, sure. But what would I accomplish? For now, it was better to be here, with my teammates, and make sure that they were okay. She's dead, Bitch said quiet. I'm sorry, I replied. We'll get them okay. We'll fuck them up. She looked at me, and the anger and hatred that had coloured her expression before was gone. She looked forlorn. Gru handed me one of the knives, then handed one to Bitch. It was short, only four and a half inches long, and there was a word inscribed in the steel with a smoky texture. So the six large capital letters and the row of smaller characters were pale against the gleaming, bloodied steel. Change. 2200 slash 2012-164. Bitch has her deadline for the test, and Amy does too. Ten in the evening, and I think it's for tomorrow. 
Jack said his test always involved someone changing themselves in a way that cost them something. I'm going to kill him, Bitch growled. Fucking tests. Killing Lucy. Stabbing Bentley. A minute passed as we pulled ourselves together, checking our injuries. He left me alive, I said, as the realization dawned on me. He didn't kill any of us, but had an excuse and the ability to kill me. Why didn't he? The world revolves around you, doesn't it? Bitch snapped. I was trying to think of how to reply to that. When the thought struck me, my world, my world, my people. Mannequin had been nearby when I was in my territory. He's going to hurt me by going after my gang. Sam, Sam, Celia's voice was grating and nasal. I'm coming, the heavy set man grumbled as he made his way into the living room. Celia sat on the floor between the couch and the coffee table. The white of her t-shirt and panties was a stark contrast to her dark skin. Sam leered at the woman. She was good-looking for her age. Slim, though her breasts sagged behind her shirt without the benefit of a bra. You said you were five minutes ago, asswipe. Takes you five minutes to find your wallet? Needed to piss. Your fat-ass friend was in the bathroom, so I pissed in your sink. Celia kicked under the coffee table to strike his shin. Sam just smiled and stepped back. Kidding. I went off the fire escape. That's not any better. It's all water and shit down there. Any place that doesn't smell like hot garbage smells like a toilet. Here, stop bitching. He threw a plastic movie rental card at her. She cut open a plastic wrapped block of powder and shook a small amount of the powder onto the coffee table. She used the laminated card to cut it into lines, a set on each side of the table, with none in front of her. You're not having any? I told you, I'm pregnant. You're too old to be pregnant, Sam commented. She kicked him again. Not that old. Jennifer emerged from the washroom and stopped in the doorway, staring at the scene. I didn't think you'd actually use any of that stuff. Jen, hun, Celia said. We've got enough to go around. Even if we only sold half, we'd be made in the shade for five or ten years. And you just took it? Leaders of the merchants got killed. Everyone else decided to run off with what they could carry of the stockpiles. Sam and I decided to play it smart. Sam got his truck and I guarded the stash from the other assholes. Paid off. I, what is it? A little bit of everything. Come, sit, try some. What is it? Sam seated himself at the table by one set of the lines of powder. He picked up a pinch and put it on his tongue. H. No way, Jennifer said. She dropped into one of the felt-covered chairs at the far end of the room. Aisha had to hop out of the way so she didn't get sat on. She watched the dialogue between her mother, her mother's boyfriend of the week, and her mother's new friend with a dispassionate expression. Seeing this scene, she didn't really feel much. A little disappointment. Embarrassment. Disgust. No, it was less this scene and more the discovery that her mother was pregnant that nailed her in the gut with a profound kind of sadness. The first place her mind went, before joy at the idea of having a brother or sister, before anger at her mom for letting it happen and not using protection, was hope. Sam, do you have any papers? Rolling papers? I thought you were going clean. It's just weed. I need to have something. Isn't that bad for the kid in progress? It's weed, dumbass. Nothing they tell you about it is true. Kid isn't going to wind up addicted from birth or anything, because it's not addictive, right? Sure, he reached in his back pocket and slipped a packet to her, along with a dime bag. Aisha bit her lip. Maybe hope was the wrong word, because she didn't really feel anything on the subject. But she knew it would probably be better if her mom miscarried and the kid was spared this shit. How much of Aisha's problems were because of her mom's lack of self-control, and how many others were because of this environment? She'd grown up with a mom who'd never mentally or emotionally aged past 14 or 15. A new man in the house every week or two, with his own idea of how things should work, Celia generally content to let him run things however he wanted. I should try not to think about the men. It was like having a broken arm. So long as she didn't move it, so long as she didn't think about it, it was okay. A dull throb in the back of her mind something she could ignore. But even a stray thought could remind her that the arm was broken, and then it sometimes took days before she could get out of that headspace. There was no distraction that worked, because the fact that she was consciously looking for a distraction only reminded her of what she was trying to distract herself from. Of course there was no way to avoid the countless reminders in everyday life that would remind her of Guy, or Bridge, or Darren, or Lonnie. Thinking about a broken arm was one such reminder. Being ignored by her teammates and told to go to her room and play along for everyone else's sake was another. 
How many afternoons had she come home from school, only for her mom or one of her mom's boyfriends to shoo her off or bribe her to leave the apartment for a bit? Pissed her off. She didn't need that from her brother, too. Come on, Jennifer, Celia urged her friend. She took a long draw from the spliff she held in her fingers. Oh, fuck. Sam, you jackass, this isn't just weed, is it? Thought it was. There's a kick to it. Amp or something. Celia took another puff. Amp. Hey, Jen, join in. Have some of what Sam's having. But H is fucking scary, Jen protested. So you hear. But why is it scary? It's addictive. Aisha tuned out the sound of her mother and Sam cajoling the woman and walked over to the table. Her mom didn't notice her. Nobody ever noticed her. And they noticed even less ever since she'd gotten her power. It was like a dark joke, a grim comedy. Just when she'd started to figure things out, grow up and catch people's eye, the world went to hell and she got her powers. Now she became invisible if she lost her concentration. Not that it was invisibility, really. It was memories. People forgot her as soon as they saw her, to the point that they didn't register her presence. She could feel it, her power rolling over her skin, jabbing outward, invisible to sight, touch, and anything else, making contact with the people around her and pushing those memories away. And like her metaphor comparing her memories to a broken arm, her power seemed to respond to the attention of her subjects. The harder they tried to remember and focus on her, the faster she slipped through their minds. The metaphor applied in another way, too. Her power operated on its own, doing its thing, and if she very casually noted what it was doing, without pushing it forward or holding it back, she could feel it doing something else, as if it was ready to push away memories that didn't relate to her exactly. It never did. Any time it built up enough that it came close to doing anything, she noticed, and it retreated like a turtle pulling its head into its shell. Frustrating. Her power didn't do anything because she wanted it to. It only worked if she surrendered to it, let it act on its own. Pushing it to work harder had the opposite effect. How easy would it be to just carry this stuff away? She could hand it to Coyle for some brownie points, and he could decide what to distribute. It would be out of her mother's hands, and money would become a limiter on her mother's habit. If the drugs weren't around, maybe Sam would leave. Maybe if Aisha got rid of the drugs, her mom would have an excuse to get things back on track somehow. The city was paying people who joined the cleanup crews. Three square meals, simple and bland, but they gave the essential nutrients, and they gave you $20 for nine hours of work. Fuck around or slack off, and they just kicked you off the crew for the day. No pay. Idle hopes. Aisha had spent long years wishing her mom could pull it together dating back to just after the divorce, when a bad day was still better than most good days were now. Or maybe that was nostalgia in a child's eye view. No, if she got rid of the drugs, it was more likely that someone would erupt in anger, Sam or her mom getting violent verbally or otherwise. It would do more harm than good. She sat down on the coffee table, directly opposite her mother. Reaching forward, she plucked the spliff from her mother's lips and dropped it, grinding it under her toes. Her mother blinked a few times, then reached for her rolling papers. Aisha used her hand to cover the papers and whispered, No. Again, the dazed blinking. Her mother asked, Sam, got any more papers? I just gave you a full package. The hell? Maybe that hit me harder than I thought. Aisha's mother giggled. Aisha stared her mother in the eyes. She didn't deactivate her power. Mom, you gotta stop. Where are the rest of the papers, Sam? Her mom asked, oblivious. Kitchen. But I don't want to get up. I'm comfy, Celia whined. You keep going down this road, your kid is going to be born without a face or something, Aisha said, her voice quiet. You know how hard school was for me? Even as far back as kindergarten, I couldn't sit still. Teacher tells me three things, and by the time they've gotten to the third, I've forgotten the first. And Brian doesn't have any of that. Go get some papers, Sam. Sam, McSam, Sam, Sammy Sam, Samster. I don't want to get up any more than you do, Sam growled. You're not one of the talkative ones, are you? I like it quiet. Mom, Aisha said, as if she could get her mom's attention. Ironically enough, she knew that if she deactivated her power, she'd have even less chance of talking to her mom. It wasn't just the horned mask and the black costume. She'd never had anyone just sit down and listen to her. Dad ignored her. Mom was self-centered, and Brian was too focused on what needed to be done that he ignored everything else. Mom, you're going to have some fucked up kid, and then you're going to die of an OD before it's even grown up. It's not fair that you leave some kid that's more retarded than me or some deformed freak for Brian to take care of. 
Not fair on him, and it's not fair on the kid to make them put up with the dick either. Fine, her mother said standing. I'll get the papers myself. Aisha sighed. Was it cowardice that kept her from confronting her mother, or the knowledge backed by years of experience that it wouldn't make a difference? Maybe, if everything with the Nine worked out and Coyle got control of the city, maybe she could get her mom some help, or report her to the police. But not now. Not when things were like this, when she had to prove she deserved her place in the group. Abandoning her mother to a noisy search of the kitchen, Aisha headed into her old room. Her room smelled like sex, and faintly of urine. Her mom had apparently had a party since Aisha had left. Holding her breath, she opened her closet door. She pushed past the clothes she'd stolen, shoplifted, and bought, and past the old clothes she couldn't or wouldn't wear anymore. Her closet was in layers, and each layer held clothes and trinkets from a different era. Her girl guide stuff was in the very back, too wrinkled by years to wear. Her dad had pushed her into that. He wanted her to have structure. After a year and a half, even he had pulled her out. A bad fit. She didn't have the personality type for it. Around the girl guide stuff, she found a small tape recorder and an old pair of binoculars. After finding an old backpack that had never been emptied of the school supplies, she found some notebooks that had only been filled in about a third of the way. She tore out those pages and tucked the notebooks under one arm. Everything went into a compact black handbag, along with her taser and knives. Small things. Nothing she couldn't have bought in a well-stocked convenience store, maybe. But she would operate best if she was relaxed, and having some personal items made her feel better. That only left the problem of finding them. They'd attacked the merchants, and observing her mom had given her the chance to find out where. It was a starting point. It was worse than she'd expected. She ducked under the police tape and pushed one officer out of her way as she stepped into the area. Police cars and PRT vans had formed a broad perimeter, with police tape strung between them. She momentarily wondered why they didn't have the wooden barricades. It was flimsy as security went. It was drizzling, and the small amounts of rain did little to clean the streets of the blood that spattered it. Water soaked into the white and brown sheets that had been draped over the bodies that still waited for someone to clean them up. The brown, she realized, was dried blood. Aisha picked her way through the fallen. The worst of the carnage was at the edges, as if some invisible line had been drawn that nobody was permitted to cross, and in the center, where the masses of people had gathered before being murdered together. She'd hoped for a lead, a piece of evidence or an overheard tidbit of information from the cops. No such luck. There was an overabundance of evidence. By the time the cops processed everything here and managed to identify the bodies, the leaves would be falling off the trees and the nine would be long gone, one way or another. The cops weren't talking either. They were working silently, or the things they were saying weren't interesting. Catching the nine wasn't their job. If they found something worthwhile, they would pass it on to the local capes, probably. No, if there was something to be found, it wouldn't be here. She headed to the edge of the scene, where the police cars had all stopped. There were still spots and spatters of blood here and there, and bloody footprints, but not much. She walked around the police and the cars to check each set out. In every case, it seemed, the bloody victims had either fallen where they lay or disappeared. Ambulances? Having checked the area, she moved further down the street to see the next closed-off alleyway. The same thing. A few more bloody footprints, but nothing beyond that. The third blockade offered something. There was a spot where the blood was thicker, which didn't match up with the other spaces. The trail extended further than it did elsewhere. Looking around, she spotted a smear of blood on the side of a building, three stories up. Okay. So maybe they'd gone this way. The trail of breadcrumbs that the blood provided were slowly being eroded or masked by the light rain. The water raised the oils from the cracks in the road, giving the ground a rainbow sheen. The signs of blood faded too soon, and Aisha could only guess whether she had taken the wrong road, gone too far, or if the rain had cleared it away. She might have given up right then, but she saw a group of men standing outside of an apartment building. It was only when she got close that she saw the badge clipped to the front of one of their jackets a detective. There was blood on the door that led into the apartment lobby. The elevator wouldn't be working. She headed for the stairwell, only to find more blood. It was as though a body had been dragged. Going forward was a stupid idea, she knew. Brian and Skitter had gone into way too much fucking depth about the risks. Still, that hadn't stopped her before. She got her taser and knife from her bag and made her way upstairs. Third floor up, blood on the door leading into the hall. More blood trailing down the hallway, stopping at one apartment. She double-checked that her power was active and pushed her way inside. Only a few of the nine were present. 
Crawler slept with his ponderous head on paws that were crossed over one another, his back rising and falling with each deep breath. He was large enough that the highest part of his back rose nearly to the ceiling with each breath he drew in through his nostrils. Only half of the eyes on his body were closed, covered with thick, dark gray lids. Shatterbird and Burnscar were on the couch. Burnscar stretched with her head on the armrest, her feet propped up on Shatterbird's lap. She held a graphic novel on her stomach with one hand and created flames in the other, shaping them to match the people she saw as she flicked from page to page. Shatterbird was sitting upright, a novel in her hands. Bonesaw stood over the dining room table, with a mechanical spider thing on the opposite side of the table assisting her. A young man was on the table itself, his wrists and ankles tied down. His torso was open from collarbone to crotch, his ribs splayed apart. Bonesaw and her mechanical spider were elbow deep in the contents of his torso. The spiders. Aisha moved quickly aside as the spider moved from the kitchen, past her into the table. Whatever cameras or artificial intelligence it used, it didn't seem to notice her. It handed Bonesaw a diet cola that the little girl opened with bloody fingers and drank. With a little more confidence, Aisha moved further inside, giving a wide berth to Crawler and Burnscar's foot-high images of flame. Holding her weapons, Aisha stood next to Shatterbird, at one end of the couch. Aisha had never killed anyone, but here she was, holding a lethal weapon. She could slice Shatterbird's throat, and they wouldn't even realize she was there. They would, she suspected, realize that Shatterbird was dead or dying. There was a 50-50 chance, anyways, that it would force them out of whatever effect her powers had on their brains. It had happened to her before. Except that Shatterbird would kill her in her last moments, using the glass that had been swept to the corners of the room, or one of the others would. Burnscar and Crawler could deal a hell of a lot of damage, even if they didn't know who they were attacking. Slowly, she walked over to Bonesaw, navigating around the drones. Could she kill the kid? On the one hand, Bonesaw was the one who kept the other members going. Removing her would take a lot of problems off the board. She could finish off Bonesaw and run for cover in the kitchen, out of Burnscar and Shatterbird's line of fire. From there, it was only steps to the front door in safety. On the other hand, it was still murder, and it was a kid. A kid that had a hundred kills under her belt. A squeaking sound distracted her from her thoughts. It was like air being let out of a balloon, but in shorter spurts. Bonesaw? No, the girl wasn't making any noise. The mechanical spider? No, not the spider either. Stepping as close to Bonesaw and the spider as she dared, Aisha investigated the sounds. Where were they coming from? Bonesaw smiled. You're going to have to speak up if you want me to hear you, Jonathan. Jonathan? Aisha looked down at the body and realized the heart was beating inside Bonesaw's hands. The man's eyes were moving, and his lips moved as he struggled and failed to make words coming up through his windpipe. The surge of horror and disgust gave Aisha the strength to cast aside her doubts. Sorry, kid, she said. She plunged the knife into Bonesaw's bare throat. Bonesaw screamed, shrill and loud, which caught Aisha off guard. With a knife in her throat, the girl was screaming? Reacting more on instinct than wit, Aisha pulled the knife out and then slashed it horizontally across Bonesaw's throat. She'd expected a spray of blood or gurgling. Neither happened. Bonesaw screamed again. So she pulled the knife free and stabbed Bonesaw in one eye. The blade scraped against the bone of Bonesaw's eye socket. Flame erupted and pieces of glass came to life around Aisha. She backed away quickly as a wall of flame rolled over Jonathan on the table and divided her from Bonesaw. There was a rumble and the sound of falling furniture as Crawler stood. Ow, 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 ow! Bonesaw shrieked. It hurts! Why isn't she dead? Aisha yanked the knife out and then gripped her taser. Is it Jack? Bonesaw asked, looking around, then turning to the window. What the hell? It's not Jack, Bonesaw said. She snapped her fingers and the mechanical spider leaped on top of her, beginning to suture the wounds in her neck. I gave Jack the same safeguards I gave us. He would have succeeded if he tried it. Shatterbird scowled. Then who or what was that? Crawler, do you know? Aisha backed toward the front door. She stopped as Crawler appeared in the doorway that led from the kitchen to the front hall, looking through to see his teammates on the far end. His voice was a mangled mess of sounds that only barely approximated anything like speech. I don't smell anyone. Smells can't find me, then, Aisha thought. Still, she didn't have her escape route. Torch the apartment and make a break for it? Burnscar asked. We can meet up as a group later. No, Cherish has had a hard time tracking Mannequin and he won't know how to find us, Shatterbird said. I'm okay, Bonesaw piped up. She held one hand to her eye socket, which had trails of smoke rising from it. 
You don't need to worry. I can put my throat back together easy after I get my kid out to check the sheets for my vitals to make sure there's no abrasions and I've got spare eyes. I could go with green eyes, or one green and one blue, or if I alter them, I could have... Quiet, Chatterbird cut in. It's less about you being hurt and more about the fact that someone had the audacity to attack us here. Burnscar, put out those fires. We don't want attention. The wall of flame shrunk and faded away. Really hope you don't have another way of sensing me, big guy, Aisha said to Crawler, ducking between his legs and stepping towards the door. I'm going to make my exit now. None of the nine reacted as she shut the door behind her. Lesson learned. The more vulnerable members of the nine weren't as vulnerable as they looked. Sheaths, Bonesaw had said. Stepping into the lobby, she stopped in her tracks. One of the detectives who'd been standing by the door was dead. His throat slit. He laid in the center of the lobby. Two more blood trails ran to the side of the lobby opposite the stairs. Manager's office? Her weapon drawn, she reached for the doorknob and collided with Jack as he strode out of the office. What's wrong? Cherish asked. Aisha backed away. Nothing, Jack said. You grab the last body and then find a mop. Me? I think I've been exceedingly generous giving you a second chance. You can repay me by doing the heavy lifting. Ever the gentleman. Go on now. I'll wait here. Aisha watched as Cherish walked past her, grabbed the heavyset detective, and began dragging him inch by inch toward the office. She only remembered one other time when her heart had pounded this hard. It had been when the fledgling merchants had attacked her and her father. It was another chance. While they were separated, she could go after one. But which? She held the taser and the knife, adjusting her grip so she was secure. Jack was the key figure. Aisha knew she could attack him, knew she maybe should. But would she succeed any more than she did against Bonesaw? Cherish might be able to lash out with some kind of blind fire, affecting the emotions of everyone nearby. No, Cherish was the newest member, wasn't she? There were better odds that Cherish didn't have the protections that Jack and the others did. Exhaling slowly, Aisha followed behind Cherish as the girl tugged the body into the other room. She stepped inside and shut the door. Put the weapon away, Cherish said, her voice quiet. Aisha gulped, realizing the trap she'd just stepped into. You can hear me? A second passed, and there was no response. Put it away, or I'm going to leave you quivering in a corner, shitting your pants. You can't hear me. I should grip her weapon and step closer. Cherish whirled around, her eyes flitting right and left, searching for Aisha. I'll scream. He'll come in here in a couple swings of his knife. He can cut you down, invisible or no. It's not invisibility, Imp said, uselessly. Put your weapon away, Cherish said, her voice quiet and carefully measured. We only have a few seconds before Jack gets suspicious. Listen, I want to strike a deal. How the hell was that motherfucker that fast? He wasn't even trying to avoid my bugs, so I had a sense of where he was as Gru, Bitch, and I tore down the street on our dogs. I rode behind Gru on Sirius, my arms on his shoulders, while Bitch rode Bentley, Lucy's corpse lying across her lap. We lost a couple of minutes as we helped Bitch retrieve Lucy's real body. It was eerie to see. When the dogs grew, they really appeared to be adding mass, literally growing and stretching. Somewhere in the transformation, after they weren't recognizable as the animals they had once been, the real bodies were reformed inside a placenta-like sac. Mannequin's gunshot had opened a hole in Lucy's chest and penetrated that membrane to kill the real dog within. We used my knife and Gru's raw strength to help pull the dog free in a grim sort of anti-childbirth. It might be seen as a waste of precious time in a crucial moment, but I doubted we would have Bitch in our corner otherwise. And without her, we wouldn't have a ride, so to speak. I'd console myself with the fact that we had a pair of massive, muscular steeds that could outpace any car you'd see on the street. A mannequin was limited to his two legs. The thing was, somewhere around the point where he stopped trying to evade my tripwires and my bugs and picked up speed, when he really started moving, I realized he was actually faster than the dogs. Mannequin covered a lot of ground with his long legs and seemingly endless energy, and he didn't have any injuries. The dogs, Bitch, and Gru did. Mannequin had been aiming at the animals more than he'd aimed at Gru or Bitch. So the damage to my teammates was more or less limited to a few flecks embedded in the legs, buttock, and feet. The injuries were small, but one in Bitch's stomach worried me. There were way too many vitals that could be hit with that location, and it was bleeding worse than any of the others. She wanted to press on, and I wasn't about to try and change her mind. I wouldn't be able to stop her for one thing. 
and I did want to help my people. Monica moved in a straight line, onto rooftops, down to the ground, or halfway down and through windows that had been stripped of glass, emerging from the far side. My bugs swarmed him where I could get them to, trying to snag him with lines and threads of silk and hamper his movements. But I could only get him with a small few at a time. He was approaching the edge of my effects reach, and I knew I'd lose track of him shortly. Once I did, I wasn't sure I'd catch him again. He could apparently see my bugs, and since our last confrontation, he gained the ability to see the spider silk I was placing on him or in his vicinity. It was remarkably high-resolution vision for someone who hadn't been able to notice that I didn't have a pool of blood spreading out beneath me during our last fight. Or was his inability to see that because he was calibrated to see the small things? It wouldn't matter if I couldn't find him or catch up to him. He's veering left, I shouted to my teammates. Faster, Sirius, he's getting away. I could feel a tremor in Sirius's body, like a momentary tremor of a twitching muscle, but in every muscle. My legs spread a fraction further apart as he grew larger, his ribs expanding further in either direction. The increase in his speed was small, but noticeable. I cast a glance over my shoulder at Bitch. Her mask had fallen off at some point when we'd been retrieving Lucy, or during our ride. She looked drawn, the lines of her mouth and the bones of her face that much more prominent. Had I failed to notice she was like that before? Was it pain from her injuries that did it? Or was it anger? Whatever it was, I suspected this use of her power was drawing on reserves she didn't have. Mannequin disappeared into the penthouse floor of an apartment building, and I positioned bugs at every periphery, at the very periphery of my reign, to prepare lines of thread and to gather so they could land on him as he emerged. Somehow, I can say how, he emerged from a lower floor, mere seconds after he'd entered the building. He brushed past a small handful of insects, and then he was out of reach of my swarm. He's out of my range, I shouted. Nobody responded. I had to do a double check that bitch hadn't fallen from Bentley's back. She didn't look any better than she had a moment ago, and she looked out of breath. I expected the pain from her injuries was taking its toll. As for Gru, I couldn't really see anything but the back of his head and his shoulders while I clung to his waist. I didn't get the sense that he was about to pass out either. No use in responding when you can spare the breath and everyone knew what the answers would be. We'd search for him at the last place we'd seen him. My territory. Giant paws pointed on the wet pavement as we raced for our destination. How the hell were we supposed to fight him? If we could even find him. He'd have some countermeasure for my bugs and my cocoon strategy. There was no way he'd let himself get caught up in the same trap twice. Gru's power didn't affect him. Bitch's dogs did affect him, but they weren't bulletproof. That was without factoring in any additional weapons he had. One arm around Gru's waist, I drew my phone from my utility compartment and dialed Genesis from my contact list. Genesis here. What? Mannequin en route to my territory for some kind of revenge against me for our last fight. How fast can you pull a body together? Two minutes. He'll be there in five. Clear people out of the way and put together a form that can take a beating and hamper him. On it. Syria was the first and only contact I'd entered into the phone beyond the ones Coyle had put in prior to giving them to us. I contacted her next. Syria here, boss. Clear people out of the area and contact everyone you gave the phone to, telling them to hide and take cover. Mannequin's coming back to make trouble. Got it. I hung up. With the jostling movement of the dogs running, I didn't trust my ability to put the phone away in the compartment, so I held it in one clenched fist. During the six or seven minutes it took us to cross from ballistics territory to my own, my teeth were clenched so hard I thought I'd break something. My neck and shoulders so tense, they felt more like stone than flesh. I valued my ability to come up with answers, but my mind was empty. I wasn't sure how I'd deal, and the worst part of it was that it wasn't me that was necessarily going to pay the price. As we entered my territory, I felt strangely composed for the anxieties that tore through me, a little detached from things. My bugs swept through the territory, and I did my best to recall where tripwires had been set and figure out which had been broken. I checked on my people, using bugs to make sure they were standing and that they were somewhere safe. Could I sweep through my territory using squadrons of flies and dragonline silk stretched out between them, to the point that he couldn't slip past them? It would take time to set up. No, there was no need. As I approached the heart of my territory near my barracks, I find him, standing in the middle of the road. There, I called out to my team. We changed direction and charged toward the street in question. We stopped when he came into our view. Mannequin stood in the centre of the road, his back to us. Half a dozen of my people were lying on the road, unconscious or dead. I couldn't see any blood. 
There were a couple more people in the nearby buildings that had fallen as well. Why had he reached them? Why hadn't Genesis and Surya been able to get everyone out? A quiet horror ran through me like ice water. Genesis, too, was on the road. In the process of dissolving, she'd taken on the form of something like a stegosaurus crossed with a scorpion, all brawn and armor plating, with a long, prehensile, wickedly spiked tail. He'd beaten her. Very little of the silk I'd laid on him was still intact. My bug settled on him and began to draw out more silk, binding him. He turned our way, and his mouth opened like a ventriloquist dummy, or Christmas nutcracker. It jiggled up and down, silently mocking. Laughter without sound. Fucker, bitch screamed. Then she whistled, with a volume and pitch that could make crowds stop in their tracks. Bentley charged. The bugs I had on Mannequin began to die. They took me a precious second. Bitch, it's a trap! She turned to look over her shoulder, and Bentley took some cue from that, because he turned slightly. Maybe that helped, because she hauled him into a hard left turn, wheeling around. Whatever it was the mannequin was doing, it spread fast, knocking my bugs out of the air and reaching out past Bitch and Bentley before they realized the threat and started running away from him. Get back, I shouted. Bitch urged Bentley into a run. They made it four steps before Bentley collapsed, tumbling to the ground. Bitch landed and couldn't sustain her own weight with her injured leg. She landed flat on her stomach and then began making retching sounds as she gasped for air and continued to crawl forward. Mannequin's mouth continued stuttering up and down, and he took a step closer to us, his hands upturned at his sides. Gas. Colourless, scentless, swift spread, and it incapacitated in seconds. My bugs were any indication, it also killed its victims shortly after. I looked around, hoping and praying for some sort of outside assistance. Nothing. It was down to me. Grew, serious, and bastard. Bastard looked unnerved. His master and Alpha were out of action. He took a step forward, then back. He was unnerved by Mannequin, and I suspected he could smell the gas. Bastard, I said. He whipped his head around to look at me. Here's hoping that Bitch trained him well. Get your master. Go. Fetch. I pointed at Bitch. Bastard turned, started forward, and then stopped. Go. Fetch. Fetch. He bolted. Mannequin continued walking slowly towards us. He didn't move as Bastard approached and picked up Bitch by the back of her pants. It would be so easy for him to simply shoot Bastard and slow him down long enough for the gas to take effect. He didn't. Bastard, come. Come on. The puppy ran back to us. There was nothing we could do for Bentley. I hopped down and grabbed Bitch as Bastard came back to us. He growled as I approached, but he didn't protest as I took Bitch into my arms and dragged her back toward Groot and Sirius. Groot didn't dismount, and I doubted he would have managed well if he had, given his injured leg. I tried to ignore Mannequin's steady approach as I propped Bitch's limp form up against Sirius's side, long enough to lift her arms up to Gru's waiting hands. Together, we hauled her up, so she was lying astride Sirius's shoulders, just in front of Gru. Gas, I muttered. There's a cloud of gas around him. Fuck me, Gru said. I'd hoped we could at least hit him. I looked at Bastard, too small to ride. He was the size of a pony, but he wasn't built for riding in the same way and the spikes and bony plates that covered him were too densely packed for me to find any sort of flat patch to sit on. I reached for the chain that trailed from his muzzle. He growled again. Vicious. I was taken aback for half a second. Then anger set in. I barked, Enough! And I snatched up the chain. He growled again, and I hauled on it. The way it was rigged, it looped around his snout so it would tighten around the end of his nose when the chain was pulled. It was like a choke collar, but focused more on the sensitive snout than on the throat. He recoiled and tried to pull away, and I tugged again. This time, he went still, resisting less. You're with me, puppy, I said, pulling on the chain, as I backed away from Mannequin. Grew, take bitch and get to cover. I can't see inside your darkness so long as that gas is wiping out my bugs, and he isn't bothered by it, so remove it as fast as you apply it. But try to push the gas away, or displace it, or whatever. We need a plan to win this, he said. Priority one is surviving until we can think of one. I replied, Genesis will be back in action in a few minutes. A few minutes is a long time. I know. I looked at Mannequin again. He closed his mouth and was standing still. I pointed, you go that way, I go this way. Keep an eye on the sky. If there's trouble, we signal each other. He nodded once. Go. We split and Mannequin broke off, chasing Gru. I headed the opposite way. Think, Taylor, think. Mannequin was a smart guy. Everything he did would be calculated to achieve some specific goal. Why was he here? He wanted to hurt me. He wanted to hit me where it hurt. And he'd done it. 
He'd killed no less than ten of my followers, Charlotte, and Syria could easily be among them. He had let us find him, because he wanted to bait us into a trap, and it worked against Bitch, for the most part. She wasn't dead, I hoped, but she was out of action. What about the small stuff? The little things? After he'd caught Bitch, he hadn't shot her, and he hadn't shot Bastard when the puppy was making its rescue attempt. Why? He could have been conserving ammunition. What was that term for the simplest answer is often the correct one? It didn't matter. It was impossible. I moved my bugs closer to Mannequin to test the presence for gas. Only if he perished. There wasn't much, if any. His mouth was closed. He was catching up to Gru. Gru must have noticed because he directed Sirius up into an alley and towards the roof. Mannequin stopped and raised one arm, then fired. My bugs felt the concussion of the shot, but no reaction from Gru and Sirius. There was a pause, then another shot. Again, no reaction. Two misses. Okay, so Mannequin was shooting now, when he hadn't been before. Were there other clues? What had changed after he closed his mouth? He started running for one thing. So he hadn't been running. He hadn't been shooting. What had been holding him back? It could have been him trying to look imitating, but he could have achieved the same ends by shooting Bastard and making me watch Bitch die. He could have been just as scary running towards us as fast as he sprinted from the ambush site to my territory. The gas. If the gas was coming from his mouth, then he was being careful in how he moved. That meant there was something about the gas. I even had an idea about what it was. Maybe he hadn't wanted to blow himself up. He'd been invested in terraforming once upon a time, making inhospitable environments hospitable. Chances were he was loaded down with custom-made organisms that were primed to generate the gas he was using, maybe even storing it in a compressed form. Given his tinker abilities, they could be advanced enough to account for the sheer volume of gas. It could even be how his guns operated, with compressed, combustible gas used to fire the shot. There was no way to say for sure, but my gut told me I was right, or I was pretty close to the mark. His actions, both the obvious and minor ones, made a complete logical sense if I assumed he was spewing out massive volumes of flammable gas. Could I even take advantage of that? The amount of gas he seemed to be putting out would make for a devastating explosion. It could potentially hurt him. But I couldn't say if the shockwave or the blast itself would kill me or any nearby innocents. If there was enough gas, it could even damage or destroy nearby buildings. Some of the structures around here weren't exactly sound. If nothing else... It gave me a clue about what to watch for. It also gave me a last-ditch weapon if things really went south. I ordered my bugs into the building I designated as my people's barracks and collected some small items with silk and clouds of bugs working in unison. A spear of darkness soared towards the sky. When it lost momentum, it began bellowing outward and drifting slightly with the wind. A signal. Come on, bastard, I ordered. I bolted for Brian's location. I crossed the street, glancing at the fallen Bentley and I headed toward an alley. My bugs crossed paths with me, and the items made their way into my hands, a cheap plastic letter and a packet of matches. I stashed the matches between my belt and my hip, and slid the letter into a small pocket in my utility compartment. I really hoped I wouldn't have to use them. Entering the alley, I swept along the area with my bugs, directing them to extend outwards with lines of silk between them. They were gathered close enough to one another that Mannequin wouldn't be able to avoid them. I find Mannequin, and the black smudge of Groom's form at the opposite end of the alley. Sirius and Bitch were a distance away, both sprawled at the base of a building, covered in rubble. I wondered how the scenario had unfolded. How had Mannequin hit them that hard? Groom had reached the roof, the last I saw, and I'd missed what came next because I hadn't wanted to lose precious bugs from my swarm by getting them gassed. Whatever had occurred, Mannequin had turned the tables and brought them back to the ground, hard. Mannequin looked at me, and his mouth was open. Engaged in that same shuddering up and down movement as before, I raised one hand to the fabric that covered my nose and mouth and backed away. Were Bitch and Sirius close enough to be getting gas too? I could feel bugs crawling on them. Both were breathing, though Bitch's breaths were rapid and hoarse. My bugs were alive as well, which meant they were safe where they were. A quick test with my bugs told me that the cloud around Mannequin was small, with a radius of about four or five feet. There was no gas around me either. The bugs on me weren't suffering, and they'd be the first to die or feel symptoms. Gru had surrounded himself in a thick cloud of darkness, to the point that I couldn't make out his arms and legs in the midst of it. From what I could gather, he was getting some benefit from it, and was pushing the gas away. How long could he sustain that, though? 
Was the darkness filtering it out? Or was he holding his breath, slowly suffocating? Mannequin, I said, sounding a million times more calm than I felt. You're going to back off, and you're going to let him go. He cocked his head to one side. I raised the matchbook, and after checking again that my bugs were gas-free, let it. A handful of my bugs carried it into the air. Or I light you up, I said. Could I? I believed I could. Maybe it was fatigue speaking. Maybe it was the grim recognition of the fact that Mannequin had spoiled any hopes I'd had of winning Coyle's respect and saving Dinah when he'd murdered the people of my territory. Single-handedly destroyed my reputation and dealt a grave blow to the thing that had been driving me forward. Maybe a teeny tiny part of it was hopelessness, knowing that I can beat him otherwise. So yeah, if he was going to snatch my hopes of saving Dinah from me, if Bitch and Gru were about to die anyways, I could turn the tables and blow us all up. I might not save Dinah, but I could save all the people Mannequin would murder otherwise in the course of his career. No bluffing. He stepped back, and I realized his foot had been on Gru's chest. I watched as Gru stood, and he began limping toward me. Faster growled and tugged on the chain that I held. I was in the process of reaching out for Gru to help steady him when I saw Mannequin move. He closed his mouth, raised one hand, and I could see a hole appear in the base of his palm. The barrel of a gun. No. The word was as much of grunt as anything else as it came from my heart, as anything else as it came from my throat. Too choked for me to say anything normal. I grabbed for Gru as I'd planned, and I shoved him to the ground. In a movie, that might have been the heroic sequence that occurred in slow motion where the lunatic villain missed the pivotal shot by a hair and blew himself up in the process. We'd be left bloody, but victorious. But Mannequin didn't fire. He was too collected to do any of that. He adjusted his aim, directing his handgun to where I'd push Gru to the ground. No, I said. The sound wasn't a grunt this time. I stepped in the way, putting myself between Mannequin and Gru, arms spread half kneeling, Bastard tugged on the leash again, as he stepped forward, and I almost fell on my face. I could let him go and sick him on Mannequin, but he'd almost certainly die, like Lucy had. Bastard, back, I said, tugging him to one side. I wasn't about to let a dog take a bullet from me. Besides, a part of me suspected that Mannequin was going to let me live so he could make me watch while he killed my friends and followers. I stared at his blank, featureless face, praying my instincts were telling me the truth. Then he shrugged. And my heart fell. Three things happened all at once. The first, and most painfully obvious, was that I got shot, full in the chest. The second, was that I realized Gru was using his power to shroud us in darkness. He probably started the second mannequin shrugged. The third, was the explosion. Long, disorientating seconds passed in the aftermath. The pain hit me like a summer rain. There was a second of nothing at all. I realized it was starting. And then, I was treated to buckets of it. I writhed, my ribs screaming in agony, trying to find some position where the pain would be less and failing. I felt like a hot poker was being shoved into the spot in my ribs where I'd taken the hit the previous night. Hey, hey, Gru said. You're okay. You're in one piece. I shook my head, unable to catch my breath. Each time I inhaled seemed to double the pain. You gotta stand, Skitter. Stand up. More through Gru's efforts than my own, I was helped to my feet. Every movement exacerbated by the pain in my chest. I gingerly touched the side of the gunshot. Flecks of what looked like glass fell as I ran my hand over the cloth. I still couldn't breathe. The explosion had ignited every piece of rubbish at this end of the road that stood taller than the inch-high water level. Gru and I weren't, thankfully, blazing. My hair hadn't been ignited either. And perhaps most importantly, we hadn't been pulverized by the shockwave. It hadn't been a huge explosion but it had been substantial enough. I looked for our opponent, and I saw Mannequin virtually unscathed, lying in the shallow water. The blast had knocked him sprawling, but he'd disconnected his parts so only lengths of chain attached each. An application, perhaps, of that martial arts principle. How'd it go? An oak is broken by the hurricane's winds, but the supple willow only bends? He was already pulling himself together. There was barely a mark on him. Run, Gru said. I was about to voice an agreement when I saw Bastard lurch to his feet. The chain leading to his muscle wasn't in my hand. Bastard pounced on Mannequin, taking one of the villain's arms in his jaws. Clenching, he began whipping Mannequin around like a rag doll. Twice, Mannequin's lower body was bludgeoned against the nearby wall. Yeah, didn't expect us to be that tough, did you? Mannequin turned the tables in a second. Between one of Bastard's shakes and the next, the villain stopped flopping around. 
I realized he'd ejected the knives from his toes and staked them in Bastard's neck and snout for leverage. His one free hand dangled at his side, moving with agony. But I was lurching towards them in a half-run before I fully realized why. Mannequin raised his free hand and pointed it at Bastard's left eye. I caught his arm and hauled it back in the same moment he fired. Bastard repaid my kindness by whipping Mannequin to one side, striking me. Both Mannequin and I fell sprawling to the ground. No sooner had I fallen than Gru was there to help me up. He was slower than I was, with a granular buckshot in his leg, so he'd only just caught up. Mannequin on the ground, Bastard off to one side. Largely untrained, with no master and nobody holding his chain, Gru and I both helping one another stand. That vibrating mouth of Mannequin's was going again. Puffing gas into the air, maybe to buy himself some breathing room from the dog. Bastard, stay, I said. What commands had I heard Bitch give her dogs? Off. Couldn't say whether Bastard obeyed, or if he just didn't want to attack anyways. I had to check twice to see that there wasn't anything burning in Mannequin's immediate vicinity. No stray garbage to ignite the gas, sadly enough. I looked behind me and saw that the flames were raging. Even the water's surface was on fire. Why? Had there been some chemical nearby or something in the gas that transferred to the water surface? Our avenue of retreat was shrinking. Whatever. I reached behind my back and retrieved two items. The change first was the first. I popped it open. A variety of quarters, dimes, and nickels, all kept in place with wadded tissue and a few small paper packets of smelling salts. It was stupid to be carrying change around, really, but I wanted to have some on hand since it had crossed my mind during my first night out in costume. I grabbed a tissue and tore it, once, then twice, until I had a series of strips, then I ignited them with the lighter. The item I grabbed from my other hand. Dragonflies gripped the burning tissues in the instant I let them fall from my fingers. Mannequin shut his mouth, stepping back. Half of the tissues went out, or were dropped by the burned dragonflies before they got close enough, which meant that the other half made it. Gas ignited for the second time, but I didn't get to see it. Gru shielded us with his darkness once more, whether it was to dampen the shockwave, or keep us from being blinded by the light, or something else. I don't know. I could only trust that it worked. The darkness dissipated and we were standing. The mannequin wasn't. A whistle from Bitch's direction and a signal that was too brief for me to catch sent Bastard forward. With Bitch's condition, I couldn't imagine how she handled it, but she managed to pump Bastard up. He grew to half again the size he'd been, roughly as large as a small car, and when he bit down a mannequin's arm this time, he broke the material. He adjusted his grip until he had mannequin's lower body and legs in a hold, but the material there proved sturdier. Two arms and two fights, I thought, with a grim satisfaction. The flames at our backs were getting a touch too close for comfort, so I stepped forward, supporting Gru. His arm around my shoulder, we approached as close as we dared to Bastard's mayhem. Sirius was hauling himself out of the rubbish, with bitch in the arch that formed from his front legs, chest, and the grind. She stood, shaky, still breathing funny, making rhythmic facial motions like she was swallowing convulsively or gagging. Gru limped over to Bitch's side. She couldn't stand without Sirius' support, but Sirius was shoring up the rubble with his body. Gru gave her the support she needed, and the pair of them made their way towards us. Sirius stepped away from the wall, and the rubble he'd been holding up tumbled to the ground, and he returned to his master's side. Bastard, Gru said. Monster. Freak. Gru took Bitch's hand and placed it on my shoulder. She didn't pull away. Once he was sure we were both standing, he stepped away. Bending down with an excruciating slowness, Gru picked up a piece of rubble that had to have weighed fifty or sixty pounds, roughly cone-shaped. Bitch seemed to follow his line of thinking. Serious? Hold. The dog lurched forward and placed both front paws on Mannequin's body, pinning his arm and chest. Buster growled at the one who was intruding on his quarry, and Sirius growled back. Buster quietened. It seemed he didn't fully realize that he was bigger, more dangerous, and less injured. He was too used to being the puppy, and serious as the full-grown one. Gru limped around the scene until he stood over Mannequin's body. Ignore the head, I said quiet. Nothing important there. I'm not joking. It's a decoy. Get him in the chest. Gru nodded and hefted the chunk of rubble until it was over his head, point facing forward. Would a puncture? Hard to say. Worth a try. Do it. Bitch growled beside me. Killed Lucy. Bentley, too. Maybe, I said, quiet. I'm sorry. I don't know if he made it. There was no way to save him. Do it, she repeated herself. Gru didn't get a chance. An eruption of fire tore through our surroundings. 
Not an explosion. There was no shock wave, and barely any noise. It was more like a push, intensely hot and brief. We were not sprawling, dog and human alike. The agony in my ribs hit me worse than ever as I was knocked flat onto my back in the water, and a half of air was struck from my lungs. No, Gruss said, you can't interfere. The protectorate? It would be disastrous if the protectorate... No. I fixed my eyes on the scene. Much worse than the protectorate. Burnscar tapped her finger to one side of her nose. I won't tell if you don't. You can't assist him. They're your rules. Jack's rules, not mine. But fine, Birdscar said. Something about the tone of her voice, it sounded casual. But there was something in it that reminded me of Shadowstalker and Sophia. It wasn't angry like Shadowstalker was, but it had the same emptiness. I just hadn't really picked up on it in the past. Burnscar gave Manikin a hand in getting to his feet. Cracks marred his lower body, and his left arm was a mess of cracked ceramic and pale grey organic pulp. I heard her murmuring something. Manikin shook his head. Burnscar said something. He raised one hand, and Burnscar slapped it in a lazy high five. She turned towards us. There. He just tagged me in. Forfeited his turn. She cracked her knuckles, and every flaming piece of debris in the street became a pillar of fire, stretching vertically for the sky. The fire snaked over the surface of the water to cut off our avenues of retreat. My go. I'm taking round two. Bad, 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 bad. Burnscar stood with Mannequin just behind her, sporting a red shirt and black jeans, cigarette burns running down her cheeks, and a dead look in her eyes. Bitch, grew, serious, bastard, and I stood a dozen feet away, walls of flame like bonfires barring our escape routes to the rear or sides. Droplets of rain fell all around us, making ripples on the inch-high water that flooded the streets. The air was thick with the smell of smoke. We'd at least had time to mentally prepare for the idea of facing Mannequin. My strategy had been last minute, but I'd been in the right frame of mind to fight a tinkerer. To anticipate ambush and tackle someone with decent defensive abilities, strong defenses, and a crap ton of tricks up his sleeve. Burnscar had flipped things on us. She was in a totally different ballpark from Mannequin. If I had to guess, her offensive capabilities were top-notch even if they didn't break the scales like some other members of the Nine. I couldn't even guess where she fit on the spectrum of defensive ability, but she'd been with the Nine for a little while, and she was still alive, so that was some indication. And utility? She had every trick a pyrotechnic like Lung had at his disposal, and she could teleport through flames as well, opening up a mess of tricks and avenues of attack. Happy now? she asked Gru. Not so much. Burnscar's voice was flat, without humour, like an actor reading the lines from a script without actually emoting them. I am following the rules now. Let's see. Trying to remember how this is supposed to go. Test you. You pass or fail, and then I kill you. You only kill bitch. If she fails, I said. Opening my mouth was more automatic than intentional. The majority of my focus was on our current situation. Options. What avenues of attack did we have? What about self-defence? Or escape? And my pepper spray, my knife and baton were available too, though I doubted my ability to dish out more hurt than I suffered in an exchange of hits with Burnscar. Gru in his darkness and both of the remaining dogs were in okay shape. I had my bugs, but neither my costume nor my bugs would do well against the flame. I can still kill tall, dark, and eerie, and the alien girl, Burnscar said. Bug girl, I corrected her. Don't really care. Bitch? The test is an old one, but it's good. We don't get to do it often enough because it requires research. Got to do it with Cherish because she gave us the necessary info. Wasn't very bright, but she did. Now that she's on the team, she can give us all the info we need. We talk too much, bitch snarled. Get to the point or go the fuck away. You're going to have to face your greatest fear. Destroy any hold it has on you with violence blood, and death. I don't want you to just conquer your fears. I want you to murder them before anyone else can use your feelings for them against you. She put a special inflection on the word murder, making it clear she was being quite literal. I expected Bitch to say something along the lines of, I'm not afraid of anything. She didn't. Her eyes narrowed. 
I'm not going to fucking hurt my dogs. I'm not asking you to. Dogs are easy, replaceable. Sure, you might cry when they bite the dust. You love them. The lack of inflection or emotion in Burnscar's voice made the words sound almost mocking. It's sweet. But that hole in your heart mends. Time heals the wounds. You get more dogs, and you bounce back. I think you're underestimating how much she loves her dogs, I said. A wound like that never heals. Bitch turned her head just enough to give me a hard look. I'm not saying she doesn't, Burnscar shrugged. I'm saying the idea of losing them isn't what scares her the most. So forget the dogs. I'm not asking you to hurt them, maim them, murder them, or anything like that. Bitch glanced at Bastard. He was growling, barely audible, low and steady, and his hackles were raised. Were they still hackles if they were mostly fragments of calcified muscle and bone spikes? Kill them, Burnscar said. She pointed to Gru and I. Bitch laughed. If you could call it that. It's more of a snort, with zero humor to it. That's supposed to be my biggest fear. I don't give two shits about them. You do. They're the closest thing to a human connection you've had your entire life. Maybe you haven't thought about it loud to yourself, but you're terrified at the idea of losing them. You know as well as anyone else that this relationship with your team is like winning the lottery for you. Bitch scoffed. Sure, it's shitty as relationships go, Burnscar continued. Anyone else would find it depressingly lame. But they're the best you can hope for because you're fucked up. Believe me, I know when someone's fucked up. Like I said, you talk too much. They're the best you'll ever get, and according to Cherish, you're losing them. Whatever bond you made with them, it's fucked up now. Maybe you did it. Maybe them. Maybe both. But it's dying a slow death, dog girl. Rip off the band-aid and finish these losers, who aren't going to be your friends in a few weeks anyway. Do it. And I let you and your dogs walk away. Why the fuck should I listen to you? Because if you say no, if you try and run or walk away, if you attack me, I'll consider your test a fail. So, I'll have no reason to hold back. Your team dies, your dogs die. And you'll wish you were dead. Fuck you, bitch retorted. But she glanced at Gru and I, and I could have sworn I saw doubt. Was it indecision? The way Burnscar had framed this, bitch either had to admit she cared about us and fight for our sake, or bitch could attack us to secure her safety and her dogs. I couldn't say which road she'd take. Not with any kind of certainty. My gut told me it wouldn't be the answer I wanted. She's considering it which meant I had to take matters in my own hands. Burnscar held the advantage, and Bitch was leaning her way. I needed to flip things and take that certainty away from her. I drew from the capsaicin-treated bugs in my armor compartment. There hadn't been any point in using them against Mannequin, but they might incapacitate Burnscar. The trick was catching her off guard. You're doing it wrong, Gru said. What? Did you even read the rules Jack gave us? Yes, Burnscar frowned. I did. Then why are you doing it differently than he did? Who pointed at Mannequin. He was buying us time, using Mannequin's inability to talk, and Burnscar's less than firm grasp to throw her off her stride. He didn't know it, but he also provided me with a distraction. My capsaicin laced bugs made their way down my back and the backs of my legs. Near the surface of the shallow water, they spread out, sticking to shadows. The cover of burning rubbish and the darkness that swirled around grew. Doing it differently? This isn't that complicated. Burnscar said. How's it going to look if you do it wrong? I imagine Mannequin's going to get punished for fucking up, Gru said. But he at least tried. If you screw up here, right at the beginning, you really think your team is going to be impressed? No, they're going to be embarrassed. And I bet they'll take it out on the person who embarrassed them. Mannequin tapped on Burnscar's shoulder. She turned and he pointed to his mouth slightly before drawing an X over it with one finger. Mannequin says you're lying. Crap. My bugs weren't in position to attack yet. You really gonna gamble on that? Gru asked. Yes, Burnscar said. The flames around us swelled in size. I had no time left for subtlety. I gave the order for my bugs to attack directly, closing the distance by the fastest and most obvious routes available. They rose from every corner and shadow of the area, approaching Burnscar from every direction. I had directed them towards the exposed skin on her hands, ankles, face, and neck. The second they landed, they bit, stung, and clawed at her. I even felt if you touch her face. And then I felt her move. For an instant, I thought she had some kind of enhanced strength or speed that let her throw herself 
to one side like she did, except it wasn't her. It was Mannequin that moved, throwing her to one side, so she landed in the midst of a flaming pile of trash. The bugs on her were burnt to a crisp, and she promptly disappeared. Run, Gru shouted. Bitch hauled on Bastard's chain, shouting, Go! She climbed halfway onto Sirius's back, unable to climb up higher with her injured leg. Gru and I followed as Bastard crashed into one of the walls of flame, sending burning trash flying and spreading out the flaming water. They threw Sirius through the break, and Gru and I hurried after. Hot. I stumbled as the heat built. I was supporting Gru as best as I was able, with the pain in my ribs protesting even the slightest movements of my arm, let alone trying to support a nearly grown teenage boy. The heat of the flames increased. I think we could have made it, if it was just one or two steps, but it wasn't. Five paces failed to carry us out of the flames. We were too slow to keep up with Bastard and make use of the way he was scattering the flames for us. I fell, and the same moment we finally got free of the flames, and Gru fell with me. There wasn't fire underneath us, but I could still feel the heat, intense, accompanied by a blinding pain. I was on fire. The water was too shallow to extinguish the fires as they licked around us, and even rolling in it failed to do anything substantial. Gru smothered us in darkness. I fought alongside him before. I'd been under the effects of his power countless times, but this was different. I was hurting. I wanted to find solutions, and now I couldn't see. I couldn't even use my swarm sense to assess the situation because the flames Burnscar had spread around the area were limiting my bug's movements. Our enemies, Mannequin and Burnscar, were similarly out of my reach. I felt a swelling panic as I thrashed, trying to immerse myself. I felt something heavy on top of me. Then three quick taps on my shoulder. A signal? Gru. I didn't fight him. As he used what must have been his jacket to pat me down and splash water onto me, I felt the water touch my bare skin. The pain and the heat continued as Gru hauled me to my feet. But the rational part of me knew he wouldn't do that if I was still on fire. I was burned. It hurt. I wasn't in imminent danger from anything or anyone except Burnscar and Mannequin. Using my power, I found difficulty at every turn. Everywhere I sent my bugs, I encountered fire. I felt like a blind person tapping their can around himself to get a sense of the surroundings, encountering only danger, destruction. A picture was gradually unfolding, and it was an ugly one. We ran, Gru leading the way. We fell four times. My legs and back were burned. Gru and his injured leg, and we were running slightly downhill. He was clutching my shoulder hard enough that it hurt, and leaning heavily on me with every other step, while my legs had none of the strength needed to support him. When we moved past the darkness, we were standing in the midst of a shattered boardwalk. We half slid and half climbed down the ruined area to the beach, and walked over to the water's edge. From our new vantage point, we could see what Burnscar had done. My territory was on fire. Gru's shadows still covered the ground levels of the area, but I could make out the tops of the taller building. Not every building burned, but there were enough. Rain fell around us, but it wouldn't matter against the blaze like that. In the gloom, the plumes of smoke there were as thick around as any building appeared, black against the light grey backdrop of grey rain clouds. Come on, Taylor, Gru said. He tried to pull me to my feet, and I didn't move. We can deal with all that later. Right now, we've just got to get away. We survive. Survive, I muttered. I'd been prepared to die against Mannequin. If it meant removing one monster from the world, it was a pretty good indication of how much I valued my life at these days. I'd cut ties with my dad, dropped out of school, helped get lung arrested, and started a chain of events that had led to the ABB terrorizing tens of thousands of people. I'd served as a distraction so a par-hungry supervillain could kidnap a girl and keep her drugged up in some underground cell for months. I stood by to let a man die. I became a full-fledged villain, pledged to protect people and let them die horribly. Not once, not twice, but three times. What the hell had I been thinking? Wanting to become a superhero. Come on, Gru urged me. I stood, leaning against the concrete wall that divided the beach from the street above. Genesis is going to be there, I said. We need to go find her and help her. We're too hurt to do anything, Gru answered. Genesis can handle herself. She can always make a new body with her powers. And her real body? She had it sent to my lair. Gru paused. Your lair could be on fire. Exactly. He considered for a few moments. All right, just let me call bitch. Don't. I stopped him as he got his phone in hand. What? A call at the wrong time? Her ringer could go off. It could mean alerting the enemy about her position or distracting her. Wait. He nodded, and we ran. 
Gru was letting his darkness dissipate for the most part, as we were under cover and out of the way. We made our way to the storm drain, using the wall for support. We headed through the secured doors and into my cellar, and then up the stairs to the main floor. My lair wasn't burning down, but I could see the faint flicker of flame in nearby buildings through the slits on the shutters. A quick investigation with my power showed that it wasn't anything serious. I set my bugs in place as an early warning system. We headed straight for the bedrooms. I wasn't expecting to see what I did. There must have been fifteen of them. Kids. None of them older than ten, some as young as four. There had been three to a bunk, sitting or lying down. Charlotte was with them, the eldest. Don't be mad, she said in a small voice. Mad? She spoke quietly, as if the kids wouldn't hear. I didn't know where else to take them. Surya said we had to hide, that Mannequin was coming. I saw him killing people without even moving. He went after families, but he was focused on the parents, not the kids. He killed them and let the kids run. Stop. My voice was harder than it meant to be. I don't want to hear it. This is my failure. I didn't know where else to take them. You did good, I said. I sounded like Burnscar. No emotion behind the words. Someone else should have come here, a girl or a woman, probably with an escort. Charlotte didn't answer, but moved aside. Genesis. Genesis slept on one of the bunks I'd set aside for my employees. Her face was contorted in an expression of concern. Average looks. If a little round-faced, she had long eyelashes and her auburn hair was a mop. She had to sleep to use her power. Could we afford to disturb her? If we tried to move her and she woke up, would it mean taking her out of the middle of a fight where she could do something to burn Scar or Mannequin? Where are the rest of my people? I asked. Surya divided us into teams and sent each of us in a different direction, telling us to get people to evacuate. I almost ran right into Mannequin. I hid and saw him attack. I felt it with my power, sticking exclusively to the building interiors to avoid inadvertently barbecuing my bugs and frittering away my resources. I used the bugs in the area to try to get a head count. The geography and the spread of people in this area was becoming familiar to me. Very few were still alive in this area. Too many had died. How many bodies were there? Thirty? Forty? I didn't want to think about it. Charlotte, did you come in through the front door or the other entrance? I asked. Front door? I was thinking about taking these kids and running for it, but I didn't know if you'd want. Secrecy is not that important right now. Take them down to the storm drain and stay there. It's more or less fireproof. It's not going to collapse on their heads, and it's a better hiding spot than this. It seemed like getting orders invigorated her. Okay, come on guys, get ready, shoes on. This way. The kids began to get sorted and follow Charlotte's instructions as she herded them out of the room, staying by the door to ensure nobody was left behind. There was no complaints, and there was nothing like chatter or crying from the kids. How many of them had watched the parents die for them? They were so stoic, or shocked. Gru looked at me. What are you thinking? They take cover, we stay. I'm going to try and use my swarm to get a sense of where Genesis is and how the fight's going. The second things go south or this area gets too dangerous, we get her out of here. You'll need this, Charlotte said. I hadn't noticed it with all the people in the room. At the foot of the bunk, in the corner of the room, there was a folded-up wheelchair. Can't ever be easy. That might complicate things if we had to run for it, Gru said. I didn't have a response to that. Charlotte left with the kids, and we took the time to manage our wounds. I headed into the ground floor bathroom to run cold water over the burns on my legs and back. Gru sat on the toilet's lid and began gathering the necessary things from the first aid kit. My power found Genesis, but only briefly. She was big, some sort of flying puff fish with a hard exterior and tentacles. It was a hard image to piece together. She floated slowly over the streets, and the bugs that I had on her died as burn scar pelted her. I tried to send some bugs after her, but she disappeared into the side of a burning building as they approached. I tried and failed to find where she teleported to. Frustrating. Whatever her destination, it was a place my bugs couldn't reach, so I had to wait for her to move away or start attacking from another vantage point. Nearly half a year ago, I'd got my powers when I was trapped in a locker, wanting to be anywhere but where I was then. I'd reached out, my mind extending out to something, anything, to distract me and draw my focus away. I wasn't trapped in a locker, but I felt very close to how I had then. Except, it wasn't the feeling that I was trapped. My power's range hadn't increased. It felt like that in a different way. We can't do this, I said. Hmm? Gru had torn open his pants leg and was suturing one of the cuts. We can't endure this. We won't last. We got unlucky, and we took the brunt of it. We'll get a breather. 
Will we? These guys are experts in preying on weakness. They're going to target us and come after us until we defend ourselves. They'll kill us. Then they'll go after Panacea or Armsmaster or Hookwolf or, or Noel, and they'll do the same thing. Taylor. I push myself into a standing position. They're going to do the same thing they're doing to us. And they're not just going to win. They're going to ruin everything while they do it. Stop! I hobbled past him and he grabbed my wrist. Between anger and the fact that my sleeve was wet with water of the shower, I managed to rip my hand from his grip. Don't. Don't do that. What do you think you're going to do? I'm going out there? They're just bullies. They're powerful. They've got every advantage. But that's all the more reason we can't let them get away with this. I'll bait them out, or find where they're hiding. I can take Burnscar down, if I get the right bugs to bite her, or sting her enough times. I just have to do something. I can't stay here and let them get away with this. You're so hurt, you can barely walk. If they find you, you won't be able to run. Sick of running. He stood and followed me. He got ahead of me despite the fact that he was probably hurt worse than I was. I ducked around him and he pushed me against the wall. Don't do this. If you want to get revenge on those guys, if you want to help your people, you need to stop, rest, recover, and plan. I struggled briefly, but the pain in my ribs and the burn on my back made that far more trouble than it was worth. And it was already pretty futile. I hated this, hated feeling weak. Even if it was Gru, I was comparing myself to. My bugs alerted me to movement from Genesis. I didn't say anything to Gru and simply waited as she grabbed her wheelchair, unfolded it, and transitioned into it before wheeling out into the hallway. Did we wake you? Gru asked. No. I can't be woken by anyone except myself if I'm like that. It's more like a coma than a sleep. You were watching me? Gru and I nodded. He must have felt self-conscious, because he backed off, letting go of me. I did note that he positioned himself between me and the end of the hallway. I wouldn't be able to run for the cellar or the front door without going past him. It didn't really matter. He was right. Maybe I would have gone on if it hadn't stopped me using my anger and frustration to drive myself forward until I got myself killed. Gru and Genesis, in their individual ways, interrupted that. I felt simultaneously angry at him and embarrassed that he'd had to stop me. What happened? I asked Genesis, trying not to look at Gru. She glanced between the two of us, realized Mannequin was using her gas, got a form together to fight that and occupy him, like you recommended, but he wasn't there when I reformed. Burnscar was. Mannequin forfeited his turn. Burnscar went up next. Ah. You managed to stop her, Gru asked. No, I wasn't prepared to fight her, but she couldn't really hurt me either. She left. Can you get a body together to fight the fires? I asked, hugging my arms against my chest. I'll try. My reserves are low. Thank you. I'm sorry I wasn't able to stop them. Gru got his phone out while Genesis retracted back to her bunk. I made my way upstairs to curl up in the armchair. So many dead because I couldn't save them. I felt doubly guilty because my reasons for regretting their deaths were partially selfish. It was a death blow to my plans to seize my territory, earning Coyle's respect and making inroads into saving Dinah one way or another. I took off my mask and let it drop to the ground. My costume I saw was in tatters where it had burned. Our enemies were good. They were smart. Mannequin had been toying with us, and we'd taken that advantage and beat him to the ground with it. But every action was calculated. Cherish was informing them. Shattered Bird was apparently smart in other ways, and Jack was the brains of the operation. Had Jack calculated things so everything would play out the way that he wanted, like Mannequin was? Gru appeared at the top of the stairs. Bitch isn't replying. We should go look for her. Okay. You okay? Gru asked. Pissed. Me too. Though, I get that you have more reason to be angry. I just... I stopped, clenching my fist. I don't... I blinked back tears. Fucking contact lenses. He wrapped his arms around me in a hug. My face was mashed against his shoulder. His grip was too tight. My back was sore where his hand touched a spot near the burn. There was also that mess of awkwardness from when I confessed my feelings for him. That now I seemed so minor and distant compared to everything that was going on. We'll get through this. No, I said, pulling away. Not like this, we won't. We fight them every time they come. We're going to be worn out. Exhausted from always being on our guard. And if these past fights have any indication, we won't make it through eight rounds of this. The way you phrase that, you don't sound like you did in the shower. I shook my head. No, because I've realized Jack wants us to focus on each of his people, one by one, because he knows it's going to play out like that, like it has so far, and that we won't make it through eight rounds of this. Let's change that dynamic. 
Let's take our testers before they get their turn. We go the offensive. Offensive. Dinah said that a direct attack would be suicide. So we go for the indirect attack. They want to play dirty? Let's play dirty back. Bentley had been turned on his back. And Sirius had one side of Bentley's ribs in his jaws, pulling. Bitch was holding the other side, tugging on it with her entire body, in an effort to pull it apart. Bastard was chained to a streetlight, lying on the ground with his chin on his front paws. He had shrunk from the size he was before. She's alive. After Bitch had gone incommunicado, I'd worried Burnt Scar had gotten a hold of her. The flesh of the bulldog's monstrous form was decaying, sloughing off and putrefying into a liquid slop over the span of seconds. As the tissues connecting the bones disintegrated, they became loose, bending in place. Bitch was trying to get the ribcage apart before the remainder of the flesh collapsed in on the dog's real body. Find her, I spoke into my phone as I hurried towards her, my rain boots splashing. Yeah, contact the others about meeting. The pain in my legs made me gasp if I stretched my foot out the wrong way, and each gasp only triggered the pain in my ribs. The air was heated, though there were no fires in the immediate area. The hot, smoke-filled air combined with the pain in my ribs to punish even my shallower breaths. The fuck you doing here? Bitch asked. I drew my knife and held it by the blade, extending the handle towards her. Helping. She didn't respond, but she took the knife and climbed partway into Bentley's body to start cutting him out of the protective sack. I stepped in and used my shoulder to help leverage the ribcage open. My legs screamed with a strain, but I could deal with the pain. It would be better to suffer some pain than let Bitch get crushed inside Bentley's chest cavity. She climbed out with the bulldog draped over her arms, falling to her knees the second she was free. She laid Bentley down on the ground. Is he okay? She checked. He's breathing. Good. Her eyes narrowed. Don't act like you care. I do care. Fuck you. You heard what that psycho horse said and now you think I like you. I don't. I'm not thinking anything along those lines. You're probably already trying to figure out a way to use it against me. Fucking hate people like you. Manipulative. Two-faced. Hey! I shouted, cutting her off. Sirius growled at me. Bitch brandished my own knife, pointing it at me. Do you know how much fucking simpler my life gets if I get rid of you? It doesn't. You might get the nine of your case for a few days, but you'd be facing every test after that all on your own. Believe it or not, I'm on your side. I want to help you through this mess. Don't bother. Go. Leave. The knife didn't waver. I'm not going anywhere unless you're coming with me. Don't get cocky because you think I can't cut you. Don't forget that you can be chewed. I give Sirius a glance, making sure to keep my head still so I didn't give off any sign of hesitation or doubt. If you were going to hurt me, you would have done it while Burnt Scar was threatening you. I don't like being told what to do, so no, I wouldn't have. I doubt that, I thought. I don't like being told what to do by a stranger, maybe, but I'd bet you'd be happy if you had a stable environment and consistent leadership. If you carry out their tests and join them, they'll be telling you what to do for the rest of your life. I don't care about the test, she shouted. I could see Sirius tense, ready to attack. I just want to be left alone. I know the feeling. You don't know anything. Screw that. I jabbed a finger in her direction. Maybe my life hasn't sucked as much as yours did, but I've been there. I've been hounded every fucking day by people who only wanted to make me miserable. Every day. Getting so tense that I'd feel like throwing up in the shower before leaving for school. And I'd have headaches before noon. I spent weeks hiding in the bathroom during lunch breaks because they wouldn't fucking ease up on me. Boo-hoo. I could tell you what I put up with. I shook my head and took a deep breath. I forced myself to calm down before I spoke. I'm not interested in a pissing contest, Rachel. Because you'd lose... She poked the knife in my direction, as if to punctuate her statement. Because this isn't a competition. And yeah, I'd lose. I'm trying to tell you that we're not that different. She scoffed. God, my legs and feet hurt. My ribs weren't exactly sunshine and rainbows either. I felt like I had to do something to distract myself. If it hadn't been for my legs that hurt, I would have wanted to pace back and forth. Or run. Or something. I tried to focus on bitch. Fine. Don't believe me. Here's the nitty gritty facts then. You're a member of our team. We need you, and whether you like it or not, you need us. She scowled. I don't say you don't. Don't say you could manage on your own. You've seen these guys, and you're not stupid. She looked down at Bentley, 
putting one hand in front of his snout, as if to check he was still breathing. All you're spewing out of your mouth hole are words. You only want to help yourself. I wish there was something I could have hit. Something I could have thrown. I'd settle for an enraged groan. What is it going to take to convince you? Why can't you understand that I can and have put myself in harm's way for you? That despite all the shit between us and everything we've gone through, you're my friend. You're not my friend. She didn't look up at me as she uttered the words. Fine, I've accepted that. But you're my friend, even if I don't like you half the time. You're my teammate. We're similar. The only difference is that you went through your shit years ago, and I just got through dealing with mine a few weeks after I joined this team. We've travelled down the same paths. Whether you like it or not, we're kindred spirits. We both struggle with this social. I trailed off. Bitch had reacted to something I'd said towards the end there. Flinched, almost. I sighed. This isn't accomplishing anything. I looked at my territory. The plumes of smoke had turned the sky a grey-black in colour, some of which glowed faintly orange with the reflected light of the flowers. The occasional spark floated through the air from one of the fires that burned around the nearby corner. She broke the lingering silence. Coyle told me that people would leave me alone if I got powerful enough, if I had allies, if I had money, if I scared my enemies enough. When was this? Before I joined the undersiders. He didn't tell me who he was. Left me a phone with some cash, then called me a while later. Fucking words that sounded good. Learned my lesson. She spent years on her own, on the streets with only the company of her dogs, running any time a cop or cape came after her. I itched to ask her if she suddenly had an increase in the amount of trouble she faced before she came to Brockton Bay. Trouble that could be precipitated by a certain ambitious supervillain? No, it wasn't the time. You know that joining the Nine would get you the opposite of that. It wouldn't be the kind of power that gets you left alone. It would be a life of being constantly chased, always in the company of people who are ten times as manipulative and two-faced as you think I am. I know, she spat. She picked up Bentley, then adjusted her grip to touch his nose with one hand. Whatever. Down to brass tacks. I gave her a second to cool down, then spoke. They killed your dog, hurt Bentley, killed my people, and torched my territory. I want to take these fuckers down. No holds barred. And we're going to need your help if we want to pull it off. Screw going on the defensive. I... You had me at no holds barred, she growled, raising from her crouch. I didn't dare open my mouth, not with the risk of angering her and changing her mind. I nodded instead. Together we limped back to my lair. Every step I took was a chore. Where Gru and I had supported each other, Bitch didn't offer me anything. It bothered me a little. We could have ridden serious if we'd cooperated to help each other onto his back but that wasn't apparently in the cards. My bugs find Genesis a few blocks away, or rather they find something that approximated a blend between a slug and a rabbit. My bugs identified two bulbous eyes, two tentacles or floppy ears, and a body that hugged the ground. The insects I had resting on the surface of the water could feel it flowing up and to the sides of the slug. A small mouth jetted streams of it at the fires of a building near her. I assumed it was Genesis. Educated guess. One of these days, I was going to run up against something strange and assume it was her, only to be unpleasantly surprised. I drew words and symbols with the bugs. Shortly after, the flow of water stopped, and the consistency of her body began to break down. She was on her way back. Charlotte had taken the kids away, so my lair was empty as we made our way inside. Bitch assessed the area, and then headed to the bathroom, going for the first aid kit. Want help? She glared at me. Answer enough. I headed upstairs and stripped my mannequin of the costume I'd largely completed. Then I removed my rain boots and began the torturous process of peeling out of the costume I was wearing. I'd put off investigating the damage in favour of finding Bitch sooner. Removing my mask wasn't a problem, but unstrapping my armour and getting my arms out of the sleeves made my ribs ache. A fresh bruise had layered on top of the old one, black and purple over purple and green. I had to pause for a minute to catch my breath before I began on the legs. I'd been wearing waterproof tights under my costume, and I cringed to think of the fact that I'd been wading in filthy water with injuries exposed. I got the first aid kit I brought down from my room and found a pair of tweezers. Tatters of melted plastic from the leggings clung to the creases and edges of the burn. Slowly, carefully, I worked my way down, removing the black fragments, digging in when necessary. Every area I cleaned disinfected. The largest burn covered my right heel, the top of my foot, and half of my calf but the toes were okay. The mother marked the left ankle, heel, and a patch small enough to cover with my hand on the shin. There was less damage, but there was more melted spandex crossing it. 
If I had second-degree burns, it would be there. The disinfectant virtually hissed as it touched my burns. I applied it liberally, then got out the gauze and antibiotic cream. It hurt as much as the lingering effects of Bakudu's peen grenade, but there was also the knowledge that it would take forever to heal. I wouldn't be able to wear skin-tight leggings over the injured area. Bastards. This pain was nothing compared to what they'd subjected my people to. How many people had lost parents, loved ones, friends, homes? I couldn't even complain to myself about the burn without feeling guilty. Genesis was the first to arrive upstairs, carried by one of her remotely controlled images, a crude rendering of a man who draped her in a chair and then faded as she woke. I couldn't put out any of the major fires, she said. For someone who had just spent four-fifths of the day sleeping, she looked exhausted. Thank you for trying. I took the wire cutters to the inside of my burned costume's leggings. Each squeeze got me only half an inch of cut material. What next? I've outlined the basic plan to, with Gru. He contacted the others. They should be arriving shortly, and we'll all discuss it together. Tattletail doesn't think Burn Scar's going to come back any time soon, but I've laid out spider silk trip wires over the area, just in case. A plan? Of attack. It's easier if we wait until everyone's arrived before I get into it, so I'm not repeating it too many times. Might even be smarter, if Cherish is looking in and trying to read my emotions to figure out what we're doing. Attack? Being careful and being on the defensive isn't getting us anywhere. It's keeping us alive. I shook out of my costume and examined it. Progress was too slow. I put down the wire cutters and got the plastic letter from my utility compartment. I proceeded to burn through the material on the inside of the leggings, from the cut I'd made all the way to the crutch, then back down the other side, putting out any flame that lingered. I was nearly done when I finally responded. I don't think it is. We're still dying. It's just slower. Can you honestly tell me that we're going to survive another two confrontations like this? So you want to be aggressive instead? Suffer a fast death? Yes to the first part, no to the second. Look, they're good because they're experienced. Jack has been doing this for years. He knows the exact balance he needs to strike. To be unpredictable enough that we can't plan against them, but clever enough that we can't catch them off guard. But you want to try? To catch them off guard, I mean. Yeah. Suicide. Like, what are the odds? You're going to make it through a third round? If we have a 50-50 chance of dying in a given confrontation, that's, what, a one in eight chance? You're better at math than I am. Sure. Except we're not going to fight them head on. Tell me, what are the limits of your abilities? There really aren't any. If it makes sense, if it's self-sustaining with organs and an energy supply, it's easier on me. I don't need to take up as much of the load with personal effort. Bigger and denser forms are more taxing, too. What about materials? What can you use to put a body together? I... I don't know. I, I can control it, sort of, but my power chooses for me. I visualize it as I use my power. I drift off, and I go into that sort of twilight state when you're just barely almost asleep, and your mind wanders. Anything I have firmly put together in my head gets filled in with stray thoughts and imagination. I never put too much effort into the material unless I wanted something like armor or stone skin. So ridiculously powerful. If I had her power. Damn it. And special abilities. You can give them to your forms? I have to visualize the mechanism, the organs, or whatever that make it work. I only have a limited time before I'm knocked out, so time I spend on that is time I'm not working on other stuff, like the form I was just using. You didn't see it, but I saw it. Right. The bugs. Right. Well, I visualized the water suction system and the water gun, but because I didn't focus on the body, it didn't have arms or legs, and it was slow, and because it didn't have vital organs, it drained me. Okay. I held up my costume with the legs and feet reduced to tatters. I turned my attention to the box behind my chair, tucked beneath a shelf of terraniums. A small tide of roaches lifted it and carted it to me. Inside were the scraps of fabric and mask left behind after Mannequin's first retreat. I hadn't wanted to spare any material. Why are you asking? Trying to assess the resources that we have at our disposal. I heard a car door slam outside. That would be either Gru or a collection of the others. Genesis used her hands to shift her position in her seat. I glanced at her legs. They were thin. Atrophy. She'd been in a wheelchair for a while. When I looked up, I saw she'd caught me looking. If you have a question, I'd rather you ask than keep wondering. I felt my face heat up and quickly turned my attention to the fabric of my old costume. I used the roaches to arrange the patchwork on the floor, using the tattered scraps, my spiders crawling from the terraniums to begin connecting the pieces. It didn't have to be pretty. Really? Ask. Were you disabled because of your power? 
a side effect, or something that happened in costume. She shook her head. I've been in a chair since I was four. No, if anything, it's the other way around. Other way around? My first thought was trigger event. The second was maybe that idea about people being stronger if they get their powers at a younger age is true after all. As I mentally categorized my musings, I felt them connect with a bunch of other thoughts. Of the six travelers, three were among the more powerful capes in Brockton Bay that I'd met. In terms of sheer destructive effect, Sundancer and Ballistic were top-notch. Genesis was the top of the line in sheer utility and versatility, and a combatant that could endlessly return to the battlefield with whatever form she wanted, provided that her real body was left unmolested. Topping it off, Noelle was apparently so powerful that she had to be kept in quarantine. Trickster was impressive, if not quite in the same class as his teammates. And I had no idea what Oliver was all about, since he didn't have powers, as far as I knew. How had they come together? If I ran with the theory that Genesis somehow had her trigger event at four, and was more powerful as a result, what did that mean the other powerful members of the group had done something similar? If so, how were they connected? Or was I thinking along the wrong lines? My bugs counted the people who exited the car. They were heading through the storm drain. A group. The others are coming in. Your team and Regent. She smiled a little, but it was almost a sad expression. Resigned. Back when I'd first talked to Sundancer, I could remember asking her about her experience with the travelers. What was it she said? Intense, violent, lonely? Lonely, despite the fact that they were constantly in each other's company. I couldn't exactly remember what Sundancer's explanation for that loneliness had been. It had been vague, hadn't it? Seeing Genesis's expression, I suspected Sundancer wasn't the only one who felt that way. The others made their way upstairs, followed by Bitch. They gathered around my room, all standing. I moved to stand myself, but Trickster gestured for me to stay seated. You okay? Regent asked. Alive? Hurts like hell. Through my swarm sense, I felt a truck parked outside. Gru let himself in through the front door. Before long, we were all present. Gru dialed Tattletail and put the phone on speaker. Yo, her voice came through. Me and Coil here. Skitter wants to attack the Nine. Remove a tester before they get their turn. Trickster whistled. Risky. Look at it this way, I said. Um, how many police forces and super teams have tried to beat the Nine? How many divisions of the Protectorate or alliances of Cape teams have tried to beat them? Lots, Trickster said. Too many to count. The Nine play things like my team does on good days. They pick their fights, avoiding confrontations or disappearing when they aren't certain they can win. When they do fight, they hit where it hurts. We do that. Look at what Regent did to Shadowstalker, what I did to Lung on both occasions, and they terrorize their victims. We do the same thing, unintentionally or not. Gru is scary with the darkness. Bitches' dogs make people shit themselves. Me? Everyone's at least a little creeped out by bugs. Tattletail and Regent are unnerving in a whole different way. The Nine are us, on steroids. That's not a very flattering comparison, Gru folded his arms. No, but I think it's on target. And I don't think it's a total coincidence that they wind up considering two members of our group for the Nine. Cherish's motivations aside. So let's avoid playing things like Jack wants us to. Let's not do things the way better heroes have tried and failed. We play this like they play this. Unpredictable. Calculated recklessness. We don't get caught up in a fight, and we think through every part of the plan. Gru shook his head a little, as if in response to some thought that crossed his mind. You will have my assistance, Coyle said. Jack Slash needs to die, and you'll have access to all of my resources should you move forward. All right, thanks. Bitch is on board, I think. Bitch nodded. Everyone needs to be willing to do this if we're going to move forward. I'm not just talking about attacking these guys. Sundancer Ballistic, you guys have been holding back for a long time. I know it's asking a hell of a lot, but are you guys prepared to kill? Silence hung in the air for a few long seconds. Yeah, Ballistic said. If it's monsters like that, I think I could. Sundancer hesitated. She hugged her arms against her body, lips pursed. Mars, Trickster said, his voice quiet. You've killed before. Accidentally? I thought back to her hesitation to use her power. Back when we'd fought Oni Lee and Lung together. These guys aren't bystanders. They're not people, Ballistic said. They don't even resemble people. They're freaks, monsters, the worst this planet has to offer. It's not that simple. By killing them, you're saving dozens, even hundreds of people, I said. It's not that simple. It really is, I replied. 
I don't think we need an answer now. But you need to let us know before we begin. What else do you need? Lisa asked through the phone. We can't do anything until you find them. I know the local technology is down, but the local police in Capes brought in emergency communications, just like Coyle did for us. I've been listening in on the radio transmissions, narrowing it down. I could pull an all-nighter, listen in, and figure it out. That's as good an excuse as any, Bruce said. If I'm going to help with this, I need to know that you're on the ball. I don't do this unless everyone that's going to be on the battlefield gets six hours of sleep before we begin. By that time, Tattletail will have a location. He faced me square on as he said it. I don't have normal sleep patterns, Genesis replied. In fact, I need to be awake to recharge. Exceptions allowed, of course, Gru said, without turning away from me. Six hours of sleep with everything I had on my conscience? Sure, I lied. But we attack first thing in the morning, or as soon as Tattletail pins him down. First chance, he agreed. Is there any possibility that we could deploy Noelle? I asked Trickster. No, Trickster said. If she's as powerful as you say, if Noelle uses her power in this battle you're talking about, everyone loses. The travellers were way, way too fond of that line. Then, Coyle, what kind of munitions do you have? Most. I can provide virtually anything, given time. But for tomorrow morning, well, tell me what you need. I'm thinking explosives. How much can you provide? Hold on, Lisa cut in. You're talking about Ballistic and Sundancer using their powers without limits. You want to use Noel, not explosives. And I'm talking about me using Black Widows, Brown Recluses, and every nasty bug I have at my disposal. I'm talking about us packing guns and grenades. All of us. No holds barred. Trickster rubbed his chin. Okay, they broke the unspoken rules between capes, so there's no reason to actually follow those rules. Sure, but do you actually have a plan? Yes, I replied. Keep in mind that this could change pretty dramatically depending on where we find them and what they're up to when we run into them. There were some nods from the others around the room. My bugs had finished connecting the tattered pieces of fabric. It wasn't pretty, but a few tugs to test it showed it was sturdy as anything I'd made. I draped it over my lap. Until my legs healed, I'd be wearing my new costume for my upper body, with a tattered cloth as a skirt to protect my burned legs. Then I told them what we'd be trying to do. We set up and act the second they stopped moving. Gru's voice sounded through the walkie-talkie. Be ready to move the instant Cherish alerts them. We maintain a broken line of sight over the nine and between our squads. Notify us and change position if you lose sight of them. Everyone knows what they're doing? Various ascents could be heard through the walkie-talkies. Maybe I should ask if anyone's unsure about what they're doing, he asked. There was no response. Good. Hold positions. The strategy was mine. But Gru was more comfortable than I was as a battlefield commander. I was okay with him taking charge here. Preferred it. I raised my binoculars. Seven members of the nine were strolling down the street. Jack, Bonesaw, and Siberian were at the head of the group, and Jack was using his knife to try and cut down anyone he saw who didn't get under cover fast enough. It was almost an idle amusement, rather than some mission or task he'd undertaken. Most escaped, and he didn't go to any particular effort to chase them down as though he was conserving his strength. Cherish, Mannequin, and Shatterbird were in the middle of the group, Crawler behind them, trailing behind with languid, casually effective movements that resembled those of a cat. At the very back of the group, trailing even behind Crawler, was a hulk of a man who I took to be hatchet face. He looked like he was rotting alive, and there were grafts of flesh and mechanical replacement parts filling in the gaps. The majority of my attention was on Cherish, through the lenses of the binoculars, I focused on her face. I watched the movements of her eyes, her facial expressions, and the tension in her hands. Nothing she did thus far had indicated she was aware of us. Her attention seemed to be more focused on the handful of people Jack had cut down. As they walked, she looked down at each of the wounded and dying, with detached interest. One might have for a car accident by the side of the highway. She hadn't opened her mouth since we caught up with her group. I so wanted to jump in and save those people, but it would be suicide. Our priority was stopping the Nine. Part one of the plan was simple. Up until the point we engaged, we stayed as far away as we could while maintaining a visual and some ability to act. We knew Cherish's power was more effective as she was closer to her targets. If there was any element of surprise to be had, we'd have it by striking from a distance. I spared a glance at Mannequin. 
changing the focus of my binoculars to the man in white. Again, he'd replaced his parts. His form resembled what I'd seen the first time I'd encountered him. I turned my attention back to Cherish. Shadowbird was saying something to her, her lips moving in the rhythms of speech beneath the glass beak visor that covered the upper half of her face. She was using her hands to punctuate her words. Cherish didn't respond. From the length of Shadowbird's speech, I took it to be some kind of monologue or lecture. Hey, Sundancer said from beside me. Ten or so seconds until we lose them behind that building over there. A quick check confirmed she was right. The direction their group was travelling would take them out of sight. I picked up the walkie-talkie. Moving forward, you guys have eyes on them? Yeah, Gru reported. That would be our second squad. Yep, Trickster said, from the third. I was already sitting side saddle on Bentley, with Bitch ahead of me. My burned legs didn't afford me much grip with my calves. So we'd taken a loop of chain that had surrounded Bentley and wound it under and over my lap and around my waist to secure me in place. Connecting it with a carabiner, in case I needed to get off fast. I put one arm around Bitch, for further support, and scooted forward to make room for Sundancer. Go, Bitch hissed the words the second Sundancer was in position. Bentley lunged forward, leaping to the next rooftop and landing with enough force that I wasn't sure I could have stayed seated if I'd been riding normally. Bentley was more of a bruiser than the other two dogs. With his front half adding up to almost twice the mass of the rear, it made him weaker at the long-distance leaps than any of the dogs had ridden thus far, but his powerful upper body also made him a strong climber. It also meant that he had the raw strength to carry three of us and the pair of heavy metal boxes that we'd strapped to his sides. Our progress wasn't fast, but we did make our way outside of the next building, Bentley's claws sticking into the window sills as he slowly and methodically ascended. From that building, it was one more leap and a short climb to the roof of the tallest building in the area. I released my death grip on the chains and got the binoculars and walkie-talkie out. In position on the Demesis soft tower. Location of the nine? Lord and Talman. Trickster answered me. I find the intersection. Once I had the right general area, it wasn't hard to spot them. Crawler was conspicuous. Find them, I informed the others. Our setup put Gru, Ballistic and Sirius directly behind the nine, along with the metal cases of supplies we strapped to Sirius's sides. Trickster and Regent were mounted on Genesis. We had taken the form, not unlike the dogs. The trio were positioned to the nine's left. By contrast, my group, with Sundancer, Bitch and Bentley, were positioned to the right. Each of us were a little over a thousand feet away from the nine. Three city blocks, give or take. It meant my allies were out of range of my powers. It was a drawback, but I hoped it would bounce out. They're moving with purpose, Tattletail sounded over the walkie-talkie. Trickster was sending her ongoing video with a camera and a directional microphone. I think they're heading to Doll Town. Doll Town? Parian's territory, Ballistic said. She controls these giant stuffed animals. Cordoned off an area in my district before I made my claim. I haven't gotten around to dealing with her yet, with a nine and all. They're probably trying to bait the heroes out, Tattletail said. Killing in the streets, then attacking one of the safe territories that aren't controlled by us. ETA for them getting to their destination, I asked. One minute, Tattletail spoke. Moving up, Gru reported. You guys maintain vigil. Jack was still attacking everyone he spotted. How many lives would be lost in the meantime? Worse, would Cherish notice our presence? Or would Jack look for civilians and spot one of us on a rooftop blocks away? Going into this with the element of surprise was almost too much to hope for. I put my walkie-talkie down, but I kept my eyes on Cherish. She hadn't spoken, and there was no change in her posture. Gru, Trickster said, get in position fast. I see the area where Parian marked off her territory. If they're going to stop, they're going to stop here. I use the binoculars and find the area in question. Yellow spray paint, raincoats, and scarves have been used to form a line across the street. Gru didn't respond. That could easily be because he was focusing on writing. Just in case, I asked, You have eyes on him, Trickster? Yeah, Gru and Ballistic are heading up to a spot where they can see everyone. No danger. No danger. It was a loaded statement. Burnscar wasn't here, but Tattletail was 90% certain that the pyrotechnic teleporter was off tracking down one of her hero candidates, or Herkwell, to give them their tests. My heart was hammering in my chest, and I knew that between one of these part beats and the next, one of the nine could spot us. If it was Jack or Shatterbird, we could be dead or bleeding out less than a second later. Set up, Gru ordered. I unclipped the carabiner and hopped down. Working along Bitch and Sundancer, I helped bring the boxes we strapped to Bentley's sides to the edge of the rooftop. We hurried back, 
Sundowns were giving me a hand up. I almost didn't feel the pain in my legs with the tension and adrenaline that thrummed through me. Or maybe that was the industrial strength painkillers Coyle had provided. I didn't want to think about the fact that the drugs I'd taken might be the same ones that he'd used to drug Dinah. A quick sweep verified that the area down Dull Town was largely empty of people. The flooding was bad here, and only Parian's place was really on high enough ground to be free of it. Just to make sure, I asked Tattletail, how many bystanders? Going by the video feed? Guessing there's between 8 and 20 people in the buildings around you. Then I'm set, I replied. I strapped the seatbelt chain around my waist and hips and reconnected the carabiner. Other voices echoed mine, confirming they were ready. Halfway across the roof, Sundancer began forming her miniature sun. I checked on the others with my binoculars. Trickster and Regent were crouched at the corner of one building, and Genesis was dissolving. Good. Gru and Ballistic were arguing. I was pretty sure. I could see Gru grabbing Ballistic's shoulder with one hand and pointing at the nine with the other. What's going on, Gru? I asked. He's chickening out. He's supposed to handle Cherish. I glanced at the nine. No sign of anything from her. She was standing apart from the rest of the group, her arms folded. She looks like someone I used to know, Ballistic said, as if that was some kind of answer. Who? Trickster asked. Sadie. From seventh grade. Nope, Trickster replied. Not in the slightest. Your head's fucking with you. Get the job done. But, Trickster's voice was as hard as I'd ever heard it. Now, remember the deal we made, our promise to each other and to Noel. Don't fuck this up. Ballistic hesitated. Through the scope of my binoculars, I could see him holding the football-sized warheads in his hands. She's a human being, someone with feelings and tastes, and... Regent was the one who caught him off this time. And she's someone that has forced parents to mutilate and kill their kids, and she made them enjoy it. Then she left them to live with the aftermath. Regent sounded remarkably calm given the situation. She's my sister. If anyone has the right to get sentimental, it's me. And I'm saying it's okay to off her, he finished. I... Ballistic broke off. I shifted my attention to the nine. Jack, Siberian, and Bonesaw were moving past the yellow lines, and Cherish? Cherish was turning to look in Groom Ballistic's direction. I could see her almost bounce in place as she got her feet under her and started sprinting, her mouth open. Cover blown, I shouted into the walkie-talkie. Taking my finger off the button, I called out, Trickster, Sundancer! Sundancer sent her son soaring around the nine, taking the long route so it could cut them off. In that same moment, Trickster pointed a sniper rifle at a corpse on the street and swapped Cherish's position with it. Part two of the plan, after finding them and getting into our positions, was to remove Cherish as fast as humanly possible. If we accomplished nothing else, our goal was to do that, and then make a run for it. It would pave the way for the future attacks, and it would slow them down. We'd left the task to Ballistic. With the idea the trickster would take care of Jack, Ballistic decided he didn't have it in him at the worst possible moment, forcing us to shift rules. Damn him. Cherish was struck by trickster's shot, blood splattering the pavement. Her teammates left her behind. Don't have line of sight to Jack, trickster reported. Hit the others, I told Sundancer. You mean kill them? Her voice was quiet, her fists clenched at her sides. Kill them, then. I could see the sun growing as it flew. It was maybe eighteen feet in diameter now. Just, just tell me there aren't any civilians there. No bystanders. I looked through my binocular. The remainder of the nine were making a break for it. Manikin and Siberian stood still, watching Gru Ballistic. Crawler was barreling towards them, and Shadowbird had taken to the air. Jack and Bonesaw were taking cover around a corner to stay out of Gru and Ballistic's line of fire. The thing that had once been hatchet face scooped up the wounded and anyone he could catch and deposited them with his group. Bonesaw had a scalpel out and was cutting the second the people were in her reach. A throat slashed here, a stomach cavity opened there, intestine and muscle strung from one individual to another, connecting them together as their faces contorted in pain. Some struggled to stand, to strike, bonesaw, or push themselves away, but death slices with his scalpel severed tendons and ligaments. It was a kind of grim reversal. The adults, utterly helpless and weak when faced with the child, We'll never have another shot like this. No, I said. I even managed to sound convincing. No civilians. Go. Then tell me where to move it to. Sundancer's eyes were closed. I can't see that far. Out further. Left. 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 The miniature sun slid twenty or so feet with every order I gave as I tracked the enemy's position and the movements of the orb with the binoculars. Short but left, then out. I couldn't look directly at the thing. 
but I saw Manikin and Siberian wheel around as the blinding light of the orb caught their attention. Manikin ran and Siberian lunged forward. The orb slid out into position around the mouth of the alley and then rolled over Jack, Bonesaw and Hatchet Face. Report! Tattletail's voice came from the walkie-talkie. I don't have visual. Sundancer just hit Jack, Hatchet Face and Bonesaw. Where are the rest? Crawler, heading for Groom Ballistic. Mannequin, running down Tillman in Regent and Trickster's general direction. Shadowbird's going for the bird's eye view. I don't think she's seen any of us except Groom Ballistic. Siberian? Missing. Shit. Assume they're all alive then. Sundancer's power still in that area? Alive? It is. Then keep it there. I glanced at Sundancer and she gave me a grim nod. Crawler had reached Gru and was scaling the side of the building with surprising speed. I'd taken him for a quadruped, but apparently his joints were modular. His proportions were more simian now, and he was climbing up the side of the building twice as fast as I could have run it, if it were laid out horizontally. Part three of the plan had been to hit them as hard as we could. Trickster was using his rifle to take shots at Mannequin, but I couldn't see if it was having any effect. Ballistic finally decided to contribute and fired a warhead at Mannequin. Then he reached into the box he and Gru had unloaded from Sirius's harness and grabbed two more. He fired them into the smoke cloud that had expanded around Mannequin. I could see Crawler reaching the edge of the roof, not twenty feet from Gru and Ballistic. Part four of the plan? Avoid direct confrontation. Trickster, Gru said, the one word buzzing over the walkie-talkies. Crawler disappeared, and an empty pickup truck toppled from the edge of the roof to the ground. Crawler was back in the vicinity of the other nine, not far from Sundancer's burning orb, blocks away from Gru and Ballistic. The monster lunged after Gru and Ballistic again, and was supported this time by Shatterbird, who conjured up a storm of glass shards to pelt the air. Ballistic retaliated by firing a warhead at Shatterbird, who prematurely detonated the explosive with a thick cluster of glass, shielding herself against the worst of the blast with another wall. She drew more walls around herself and maintained her assault. Bitch whistled, and Sirius started bounding across the rooftops to head our way. I could see Shatterbird turn and notice us. That was fine. I sent a payload of bugs her way, wasps and bees, each carrying several spiders and more expendable caterpillars, and the like that were smeared in capsaicin, and the like that were smeared in capsaicin. I wanted to make absolutely sure she knew where we were and that she wouldn't ignore us. Crawler reached the base of the building, only to be switched with yet another car resetting his position a second time. He roared in frustration, then turned toward the miniature sun, breaking into an all-out run as he charged for it. Sun Dancer, switch off, I called out. The orb disappeared and Crawler crashed through the alleyway, only barely avoiding Jack, Siberian, and Bonesaw. The edges of the alley were unrecognizable and the walls were on fire, but the trio were untouched. Siberian had Jack draped over one shoulder and another hand clasping Bonesaw by the back of her shirt holding her high. The pavement was a molten liquid beneath them. I clicked the button on the walkie-talkie and informed the others. Siberians granting her invulnerability to Jack and Bonesaw. Tattletail said something, but I missed it over the roar of the noise that came with Sundancer using her power. She was forming another orb. Everyone else was busy with their own things. Siberian was protecting Jack and Bonesaw. That was both good and bad. We'd planned this strategy under the assumption that Siberian would come for us, and we'd use the dogs, Gru's darkness, my bug decoys, and Trickster's teleportation to keep our distance from her until we decided we needed to make a run for it. All of that was in line with part four of the plan, maintaining our distance and avoiding a toe-to-toe fight. In the meantime, we'd intended to use our ranged abilities to take our Jack, Cherish, Bonesaw, and Burnscar. She was protecting them, which we hadn't anticipated, but she couldn't do that and come after us. Or maybe she can. I saw Siberian virtually toss Bonesaw in the air, the girl wrapping her arms around the woman's neck as she landed. Holding her two teammates, Siberian sprinted for Trickster and Regent. She was fast, but it was a speed born of her peculiar powers, more enhanced strength than augmented acceleration, not so different from battery on that count. Air resistance and an Erda didn't hamper her in the same ways. More than that, whatever it was that made her invincible and untouchable To any outside force, she had the ability to snap it out to affect any surface she touched. Her strength was virtually limitless, and the pavement didn't shatter with her footfalls because she made it as untouchable as she was. Shatterbird, meanwhile, was drawing closer, using the glass storm to bar ballistics access to the crate of explosives. Gru's power was serving to counter hers, 
and any glass that entered the darkness seemed to drop straight down like rain, bereft of her abilities. Momentum still carried, however, and any glass shards that entered at a high enough velocity seemed to exit at roughly the same speed. I wasn't sure about Ballistic. His costume was among the best money could buy, but I wasn't sure what that entailed. For at least, she'd be able to endure a beating. Beneath his motorcycle leathers, he was wearing a costume I'd made for him, and nearly finished. It wouldn't protect his head, but his helmet would serve in a pinch. Even if they wouldn't be cut to shreds, I wasn't sure they would survive if Shadowbird detonated that case of rocket launcher rounds with a shard in the right place or a large enough impact. Bitch, I spoke. The boxes. Bitch was sliding off Bentley's back, opening the first metal box and stretching out the contents. The case was a piece of camping gear I'd noticed ages ago, when I'd first been buying things for my costume. A watertight case for luggage, with the metal frame inside the campers could stretch out to use as a drying rack for clothes and towels. We didn't have luggage inside. No, the box held parts of the mannequins I'd been using for costume design, strung together with silk. Two mannequins dangled from the frame. Bitch adjusted the way one mannequin hung and headed over to set up the other case. My bugs had reached Shadowbird and started attacking her. Brown recluses, capsaicin wasps, hornets, and bees. I'd never attacked someone like this. Not someone who couldn't heal. I could see her thrashing, trying to stay aloft, even as her concentration faltered. The brown recluses were insurance of a sort. If we happened to take our bone saw, it could mean Shadowburn was out of the equation as well. The darkness Gru had generated around the rooftop disappeared all at once. Gru and Ballistic crouched at the far corner. Cancelling the darkness was a signal. The mannequins hanging from the first rack disappeared, replaced by the two boys. Gru and Ballistic disentangled themselves from the metal frames and hurried to our sides. Trickster and Regent appeared soon after the other frame was up. I could see Siberian on the rooftop. They escaped just in time to avoid being caught in a melee with her. Trickster rolled his shoulders, stretched his neck, and adjusted his hat. Don't waste time, Gru growled. Do it. Times like this call for a certain flourish, Trickster said. Trickster withdrew a small remote from his pocket and depressed the button. The rooftops the other two teams had been situated on virtually shattered with the explosions. The bazooka rounds had also carried a small collection of plastic explosives. Since Trickster's team had only needed the sniper rifle, their case had held a lot more. Part 5. Done. Beating the hook, railing them in, then hitting them as hard as we could. It wouldn't stop them, of course. The only ones that explosion might have hurt were Shatterbird and maybe Mannequin, if he'd survived Ballistic's attack and slipped around through some other angle. Ideal world, it would also slow down Siberian. More realistically, I was hoping that they'd get pissed and they'd get sloppy. I chanced a quick look through the binoculars. Crawler was stampering towards the site of the explosion. Cherish was still prone to the ground, bleeding out from Trickster's sniper fire, and I couldn't make out the others. No, wait. I could see rubble shifting as Siberian shrugged it aside. It was enough debris the crawler would have been hampered, but even with her hands tied up in holding her teammates, she cast the chunks of concrete and brick aside with the same sort of ease that I might walk through a pile of balloons. She shook her head and her hair fanned out behind her, dripping partially over Boonsaw, who was riding her piggyback. Jack wasn't folded over her shoulder anymore. He was standing, holding her hand, a wide smile spread across his face. He said something. Some exclamation without dropping his grin for a second. And Shatterbird? I looked through the rubble that had been cast over the street around the building. She was lying on the ground, struggling to her feet. The glints of glass shards sparkled for a hundred feet around her. I quickly tossed my binoculars aside. They'd be a liability if she attacked me, now. Here was the gamble. We'd hurt them, injured their pride. We would be killed, Mannequin, and we'd incapacitated Cherish. If Elisic had been on the ball, we would have blown Cherish to smithereens. As it was, a stray bullet wouldn't cut it. Bonesaw's known talents included the ability to raise the dead. Gru used his darkness to form a dozen false images of shadow-shrouded silhouettes on the nearby rooftops. I did the same thing with my bugs, but mine were animated, moving. We'd have to run pretty damn soon. There were seven of us, but only two dogs. It was less than ideal. I tried to get Bitch to bring another dog, but she didn't feel any of the others were trained well enough to bear riders. The remaining members of the nine charged, Shadowbird rising from her position to fly straight for us, barriers of glass surrounding her. Siberian carried Jack and Bonesaw with leaping vines, while Crawler headed for us. I crossed my fingers, watching intently. Two ways this could go for the final phase of our plan. Well, three ways. But I was hoping the third possibility, 
my team getting caught and slaughtered wouldn't happen. The first way this could play out was the Chatterbird's flight over the buildings would make her faster than Crawler or Siberian, who had to climb or circumvent the obstacles. When I brought this up during the meeting, assuming it would happen, it had been Tattletail who pointed out that I was maybe underestimating how fast Crawler and Siberian could be. She was right. Despite her ability to fly, Shadowbird was falling behind, which meant we went with plan B. You up for this, Greer? I asked. I could do it. My plan and I was first to volunteer. No, you can't run fast enough with those burns, Greer replied, as he hurried to the side of the rooftop furthest from the nine. He glanced down. Trickster, I'm ready. I just need an opportunity, Trickster said, watching the incoming members of the Slaughterhouse Nine. They were closing a little too fast for comfort. Sirius had arrived, and we were all getting saddled. Bitch, Sundancer, and I on Bentley, and Regent, Trickster, and Ballistic on Sirius. At Regent's orders, Sirius moved to Gru's side. Sooner than later, Gru said. Do you want to die? Trickster asked. No, but I'm willing to break something. Your call, Trickster said. Three, two, one. Gru left from the edge of the roof. In that same instant, Trickster swapped him with Shadowbird. She tumbled for a second, got a grip with her flight, then steadied. Then Regent hit her with his paw. Shadowbird flew into the corner of the roof, was thrown off balance and tipped into the gap between buildings. And Gru? I cast a glance backwards. He dropped out of the air where Shadowbird had been flying, landing on a rooftop a distance below. I could see him struggling to his feet. Go, go! Trickster screamed the words. Our mounts leapt down into the same gap where Shadowbird had fallen. We made the usual zigzagging descent down, leaping from wall to wall and landed on either side of Shadowbird and Genesis. Genesis looked like a cartoon caricature of a sumo wrestler, grotesquely obese and yellow-skinned, with eyes like black buttons. She was hairless, unclothed, and sexless, and her skin was translucent and oily. Through the skin, I could make out the vague figure of Shadowbird, pounding on the walls of the stomach. Her mouth opening in a scream that didn't reach us. Glass shards were stirring around her. A blender word cutting at the insides of Genesis' belly. She's going to cut through, I said. Bitch, we didn't get the chains. I'll try and stop her. Using my bugs, I formed words against the surface of Genesis' belly. Stop. Shadowbird only intensified her attempts. I gathered some Black Widow spiders and pressed them gently against the shiny translucent skin. They were absorbed, drifting inside, and were soon crawling around the inside surface. Genesis obliged me by opening her mouth, giving me a direct route for the bugs to travel. Hurry, Regent said. He was winding the chain around the jello-like hard, fingerless hands, gripping the chain for further traction. Shadowbird noticed the spiders. Her eyes widened as the volume of deadly spiders trapped in the bubble with her increased. I raked my finger beneath the message I'd drawn with the bugs, as if to underline it. Stop. She did. Glass shards fell into a pool around her feet. Go, I shouted. We ran. The two dogs side by side, pulling Genesis behind us like a chariot. Drawing my bugs together, I covered us as best as I was able, creating other decoys. Vague chariot-shaped lumps here and there, huddles of figures. It would all be for nothing if they returned to cherish, revived the girl and tracked us down. Left, I ordered. Bitch steered left. Regent hadn't heard, but as the tension of the chains pulled Sirius to one side, he caught on and turned as well. My bugs served as a navigation system filling up the shapes of our surroundings so I could work out a suitable plan. We charged onward, with me giving occasional directions until we find Cherish lying on the ground in a pool of blood. Get her. Bitch rode just to Cherish's left. Regent rode just to the right, and Genesis rolled right over the girl. Cherish caught like glue, suffered an unfortunate few seconds of being dragged over the road surface, and then was drawn into Genesis' bubble of a body. My bugs gave me a sense of the nine's locations, and my decoys gave them pause once or twice. We could track them more easily than they could do the reverse, and we were soon far enough away that I couldn't sense them. We only slowed when we got to Coil's underground base. We parked the dogs and then headed for the series of barred and locked doors. I glanced at Shadowburn and to Cherish, where they knelt in Genesis' round body. We weren't really giving away information here. Crawler had apparently come this way not so long ago. It was a 50-50 chance whether Siberian and the other nine would come this way. Cherish wasn't around to give them information, but she might have provided details at an earlier point that Jack or one of the others could use to connect the dots. We crossed that bridge when we got to it. Coyle was there to greet us with a tattled tail and a contingent of armed soldiers. We waited patiently as one of the soldiers scanned Shatterbird with the plastic wand. He looked at Coyle and shook his head. This way, Coyle ordered. How did he set this up so fast? 
Shutterbird's cell was large, twenty feet by twenty feet across, and the walls had the same textured black rubber soundproofing as the sound recording booths I'd seen in movies and on TV. I couldn't see the speakers, but there was a noise similar to radio static filling the room, so loud I wouldn't be able to hear if someone spoke. With our weapons trained on Shatterbird, we stood by while one of Coyle's soldiers reached into Janice's stomach and hauled her out. She was chained to the ceiling with her arms stretched out to her sides, then divested of her costume, left only with a silk camisole and slip. Coyle's people wheeled in an x-ray machine and a tank of containment foam. Shatterbird glared wordlessly at us until we had exited the room, and the heavy vault door blocked our view of her. She will be cavity searched, an x-ray to identify any hidden weapon or any devices. Bone saw our mannequin might have implanted in her. Coyle spoke, after the doors were closed and the white noise was blocked out. Regent, we have a protective suit waiting for you. In the event that she does acquire something she can use her powers on, or if she has concealed anything of her person that is small enough to avoid radiographic detection, the suit will shield you until you've finished. Regent nodded. She was bitten by a brown recluse, as I said. I'd give her a full physical examination every thirty minutes to be safe. I'm familiar with the treatment for the more dangerous spider bites. He looked at me. It's a protein-based venom, so the jerk is useful sometimes. I hadn't liked Brock's since Lisa had introduced me to him, but I could respect someone who knew his job. Yeah, seems I can leave it to you then, Quail said. Brooks nodded. Quail added, Failing everything else, it might serve as incentive to cooperate. Or cause to get desperate, Tattletail said. She might do something stupid if she thinks she'll die or suffer lifelong effects if she doesn't get back to Bonesaw. Let's not give her the opportunity. Regent, how fast can you seek control? A few hours. Start now. Regent headed off to get changed. That leaves our unexpected guest, Coel said. Cherish. Regent hadn't yet escaped earshot. He turned back to us. She'll have a trap on her. Small explosive looped around her neck with a lock and a dead man's switch. Thank you, Coel said. Tattletail, see to it at the first opportunity. Not a problem. We approached Cherish and Genesis. Cherish knelt in the small pile of glass shards that sat at the very bottom of the bubble. Her hands were pressed against the inside of the stomach, causing it to bulge like a small child in a womb. She was awake, but bleeding severely. Coyle gave the order. If anyone acts out of character, take them out of action as swiftly as possible and shoot the girl. There were no dull around. Cherish's mouth moved and the sound didn't reach us. I didn't expect her, and I did not take measures for containing her, Quell said. Keeping her on the premises may prove exceptionally dangerous. The alternative being, Trickster asked, letting her go? In the euphemistic sense, her value as a captive is minimal, and we have no way to secure her until Regent can finish using his ability on her. He's resistant to her power, Tattletail said, but that goes both ways. I don't know how we'll be able to control her. She might break free. Benefits of being family, I guess. Then I would suggest, as Trickster said earlier, let her go. We execute her and remove her from the equation, Coyle started. I looked at Cherish with her eyes narrowed. She knew exactly what we were saying. Killing someone in cold blood, a little different than killing someone on the battlefield. Not giving you the go-ahead, I said, but I'm not about to stop you. I'm washing my hands of this. The intent was to remove individuals from the line before they could conduct their round to test. Yes, this seems to be the most expedient route. Not disagreeing, I said, but I didn't sign up to be an executioner. I manage my district, and I help defend your city from outsiders, right? Quite right. No, I think your service this morning has been exemplary. I only barely managed to avoid being up to deal with about Dina. No, it was premature. The wrong people were listening, and I was worried he would point out the fact that my territory had been torched by Burnscar. Best to keep quiet for an hour. Rebuild it, reestablish myself as leader of my territory, then raise the topic. Whatever happened, I needed his respect. He turned our attention to our captive. She had raised her hands above her head in the surrender position, despite the hole in her shoulder. Do we risk it? Trickster said. Let her out. Nothing she can't do outside the bubble that she can't do inside, Tattletail replied. Quill nodded, and that seemed to be signal enough. Genesis began to dissolve, and in moments, Cherish spilled out, wincing as she cut her hands and knees on the glass that Shadowbird had detached from her costume and weaponized. Settletail bent down and looked at the device that hung around Cherish's neck. Small explosive, a combination lock. A bit paranoid. No such thing as too paranoid, Cherish said, glaring. Between my brother and the crap that Bones saw and the rest of the team want to subject me to, knowing I'll die if I leave that thing alone long enough actually helps me to sleep at night. Can't have that, Tattletail said, changing the topic. She asked, 
You like computers? Computers? Charlie startled. She seemed to insinuate. What Tattletail was doing? Not saying. Clever girl. But even that's nothing of a clue. Let's see. Four, five, four, five. Tattletail tugged on the lock. Nope. Three, seven, three, seven. The lock popped open. Cherish's eyes opened wide. There goes your bargaining chip. I've got more, Cherish said, her chin raising a fraction. Do tell, Coyle said dryly. Certain teammates of yours paid me a visit. Imp, I think her name was. So hard to remember. What did you do to Imp? I said, Girl's going to freak out. She decided to help me get back at the nine. They're planning on inflicting a face worse than death on me. You see, there was a reason I pretended not to notice you were all waiting in ambush. Thought maybe the brat passed on word somehow until you used the sucker teleport on me and shot me. Suppose you'll have to give me medical attention and keep me alive if you want the rest of the story. And your other bargaining chip? Trickster asked. Grew. I can sense him with my power. Sense my team. They got their hands in darkness, boy. I swear my heart stuttered mid-feet. Cherish smiled, but her glare didn't fade in intensity. My teammates and I already talked on the subject of John Paul, a.k.a. Hijack, a.k.a. Alec, a.k.a. Regent. You got Shatter, and you got me. We're compromised. No way they're going to accept us back with open arms. They'd kill us first. So no, don't get your hopes up. My teams aren't going to agree to a hostage exchange. Where is he? I growled. As if I'm going to tell you. To think Jack called you the clever worm. Don't call me that. I felt a flare of irritation that bordered on anger. Was that me? Or was it her power at work? Tattletail put a hand on my shoulder. I shut my mouth. She asked Cherish, What do you want in exchange for your help? You want us to let you go? Cherish laughed a little, and it reminded me of Alec's own dry chuckle. No, definitely not. In exchange for the information... About what the imp is up to, you're going to give me medical treatment. You're going to keep me here, and you're going to keep me safe. And for the info on Gru, Tattletail asked. I'm thinking a billion. Cherish winced as she moved mid-sentence and pulled at the wound. A billion dollars, so you can scamper off to the other side of the world and live the good life while you hide from those bastards. Tattletail finished. Right. Or are you going to tell me that that's too much? Is your teammate's life worth a smaller amount? Where do you draw the line, Miss Frowny Face? Tettletail glanced at me. I looked, in turn, to Coyle. He gave me a barely perceptible shake of his head. He wouldn't fork over the amount. You're not really in a position to be making demands, Trickster said. You're bleeding to death, and we do have the ability to hurry the process along. Cherish shrugged. Bonesaw gave me the works. Mess sheaths for every major artery and organ... Why a reinforcement for my skeleton? It's not going to kill me any time soon. I made a mental note of that. Chances were good that Jack, Bonesaw, and the other more vulnerable members of the Nine had some similar protection. How differently would things have played out if Ballistic had used his power and blown them up? I could, Trickster threatened. Or we can wait and see which happens first. Either you agree to share the information we want, or you slowly bleed out. A game of chicken. I'm down. Cherish prodded her injury with a fingertip. It was clear it hurt, but she still stuck a finger into the hole and investigated some. The auto-injection pump is dosing me with painkillers and antibiotics now. First time feeling this stuff work. Letting that... Lunatic perform surgery like that? Sundancer asked, shivering a little. How? Why? Not much choice in the matter. But I was awake for the entire thing, and I read her emotions as she did it. No hint of any traps or dirty tricks. Tattletail glanced at the bullet hole in Cherish's chest. I'm suspicious. It's so routine for her that there wouldn't even be a blip on the radar if she did try something. Cherish leaned forward. Are we going to do this? Test your perceptive abilities against mine? Some intellectual jousting? Tattletail shook her head. She's stalling. She knows time's on her side because... We need to rescue Gru sooner than later. Longer we wait, the worse our position. I admit, I am at something of a loss, Coyle sounded pensive as he looked over at our captive. Where do we put her? Jack did research on you assholes, Cherish cut in, still trying to distract us. I know your shtick, Tattletail. Pick up people's weaknesses, tell them stuff they don't want to know. I can do the same thing. I'm better at it than you are. 
It's a bit of a crazy idea, I said, ignoring her. But what if we didn't stash her in this base, or any of the others? We put her anywhere in the city. There's the risk that some unwitting John, Dick, or Harry will come by, and she'll get them to help her somehow. Can't station guards on her, so why not the water? A boat? Ballistic asked. I could tell you a story, Cherish said. Little girl grows up with money. Daddy pulls in six figures, maybe seven. Massive house, I expect. Maybe horses, a Mercedes, indoor and outdoor pools. I was thinking about a boy, I replied, speaking over her. Could even rig things so she's out of sight. Cuff her to it. We can be pretty damn sure she won't be getting free. What about boats coming by? Sundancer asked. Almost no boats on the water, I replied. Coastline is a mess, thanks to the Leviathan. Ships can't dock here. Good, Coyle said. Then as soon as she is given some basic medical care, I'll have my men take her there. I'll need to work out measures to ensure she doesn't escape. So the little girl who wanted for nothing still found a reason to run away from home, spent life homeless on the streets, stealing and dealing for petty cash so she could eat. What would make someone leave home like that, Tattletail? Coyle turned to the soldier next to him. Can you go find Pitter and bring him here? I want her sedated sooner than later. The soldier nodded and headed off to find the medic. He winked at Tattletail as he jogged by. I'd met him, not one of Tattletail's soldiers, but I'd crossed paths with him. Fish? Seemed like he and Tattletail were getting along. That's a mistake, Cherish smiled. With my cooperation, you won't find him. You won't be able to contact him or know where to look for her brother. Tattletail? Quill spoke. You already informed us on most of that, Tattletail told Cherish. She leaned against the wall. Your method of communication with him. You're planning on meeting her. Afternoon? Evening? As if I'm... Late afternoon, thanks. What? Cherish whined. What time in the afternoon? Four, five, six? Six o'clock, there we go. Where? Upper end of town or dark town? I'm not saying anything. You're telling me everything. Tattleton must be reading Cherish's tales, her body language, eye movements, her tone, or word choice. Let's see, you're meeting Emp downtown around six. You would have made it a place where you could talk with her for a minute while you were out of sight of the others. Bathroom? Cherish didn't move a muscle. Maybe she realized what Tattletail was doing. Bathroom, then. Same building as the rest of the nine? No, we just need to dig up where they are. And you've got no cards left. Unless you want to share that information in good faith. There was no response from our prisoner. Hmm, Tattletail said. She's cornered, and she's probably contemplating something like suicide by cop. Or whatever the term is when the other group aren't cops. She'd rather die than have us turn her over to her teammates. So she'll try to gambit, like using her powers, knowing we'll probably gun her down. Got any ideas? Trickster asked her. She liked the dead man switch for her suicide collar. Why don't we set up something similar? Put a soldier on guard, somewhere nearby. We schedule it so he receives a note from us every 15 minutes. If he doesn't get it, he passes a message to the Nine telling them exactly where to find Cherish. I could see Cherish tense. How do we get a message to them without them killing the messenger? We can work it out, Tattletail shrugged. She looked at Trickster. You think Oliver could handle it? Trickster nodded. I'll get him on thinking of some way to arrange this. Tattletail, Quill spoke. Can you gather the rest of the details from her before we secure her offshore? So long as she doesn't get stupid and try and do something more than talk. Cherish decided to speak up. Who's next? Who should I dish the dirt on? Feeling homesick, Trickster? Scary little boy pretending to be a leader? It's your fault, you know. She blames you. Everyone does. They're even starting to hate you. Can we talk without her in earshot? I asked. Quill nodded and gestured for us to leave. His soldiers moved to Cherish's side and gripped her arms. No point, Cherish grinned. I know what you're talking about. Can't keep secrets from me. But you won't be sidetracking us, I replied. You failed, you know. Cherry said, changing tacts. When someone has an obsession like you do, it's like a giant neon sign to an empath like me. All it takes is for me to peek into Coyle's head, peek into the hearts of everyone else in this base, and I know you'll never get what you want. You won't save her. You can't. The window of opportunity is long gone. I jabbed her where the bullet hole was. The strength went out of her legs, and she fell to her hands and knees. 
I stepped back, drew in a slow breath, and then kicked her in the face. She fell to the ground. Skitter, Coyle's word was without inflection. There was no admonishment or warning to it. I took it as a reminder of where I was, which might have been his intent. We can talk about that later, I told him. My priority right now is Gru. Coyle nodded. I glanced down at Cherish. Hope Bonesaw reinforced your teeth while she was fixing you up. She did, Cherish muttered, one hand to her mouth. I kicked her in the head once more for good measure, and then turned away, my hands raised to assure the others I was done. That's enough, Quail said. He signaled his men. Take the prisoner to the coastline and find a spot to depart. Cherish was dragged off to a point further down the catwalk. Her shouts reached us well after she was out of sight. Your boss is screwing you, all of you. You have no idea how badly. Your cop's in this machine, and he's only steps away from pulling it all together. Get rid of the nine, stage the final play with everyone in their proper spots, but then he doesn't need you any more. Sowing dissension in the ranks, Coyle said. He sounded remarkably calm, given what Cherish had been saying. Nothing more. Right. She could be lying, Trickster ventured. She is, mostly, Tattletail said. I doubted anyone believed what the three were saying. At the same time, nobody here was in a position to walk away in response to this unconfirmed information. Tattletail, see to the interrogation, Quail ordered. Okay. That leaves the remainder of us to decide on a way of rescuing the others. I fidgeted. The idea of Brian in the hands of the Nine was daunting. Was Siberian eating him alive? Literally? Was he at the mercies of Mannequin? Jack could be torturing him for details on us, or he could be in Bonesaw's clutches. Chances were good that they were pissed. Jack accepted, maybe. He seemed to like our ambush. In any event, any anger or sadistic tendencies were likely to be taken out on Brian. Fuck, I kept imagining uglier and uglier possibilities. They're going to be waiting and ready. They'll need help, I think, I said. Help? Trickster turned my way. You're forgetting that the rest of the fractions in the city have made a pact against us. Not everybody here agreed, I said. There was one group at the meeting that didn't agree to the pact. Am I remembering wrong? Trickster asked. Coil, Merchant's Chosen, Fault Lines Group? That's right, I said. What are you thinking, then? Sundancer asked. Coil, I said. You got some surveillance gear for Tattletail, right? Can I see it? Trickster accompanied me. We didn't get the benefit of Bitch's dogs. She wanted to check on her territory and take care of her dogs. I had grudgingly agreed that she should take care of that, and Trickster and I had set off alone. I gave him a sidelong glance as we ascended the stairs of the empty apartment building. What had Cherish said? Scared little boy? She blames you? They all do? I could remember Sundancer's remarks on the drama in the group, and how lonely it was to be around them. I recall Janice's seeming less than thrilled when her team arrived last night. Was Trickster at the centre of it? He was more ruthless than his comrades, which was interesting because his power was the least lethal. It might have been a point of contention, but what would he have done that the others would blame him for? Could I comment on that? Should I? I remained silent. We exited the stairwell at the fifth floor and entered a dark hallway. I clicked on a flashlight and we made our way down the hall. Trash was piled everywhere, and I was all too aware of the maggots that were crawling on the floor, barely visible in the dim light. Which way, he asked. I pointed a side benefit of my power was that it made it pretty damn easy to maintain my sense of direction. We tried the doors for the two apartments that led in the right direction. Both were locked. Trickster touched the doorknob, then looked across the floor at the trash in the hallway. The doorknob disappeared, and a chunk of wood fell on the ground. He repeated the process with the internal mechanisms, and the lock was effectively transported away. He opened the door and walked inside, going straight for the windows. Done this before? he asked. I shook my head. I was gathering my bugs, the stronger flyers, and drawing out lines of silk. Trickster handed me the individual components. A small spy camera, no larger than a tube of lipstick, and a similar microphone. My bugs bound them together with silk and then stretched out more to distribute the lifting among the dragonflies, bumblebees, and wasps. Okay, let's see, I muttered. Testing, testing, one, two, three. My swore managed some semblance of the words I wanted. A mix of buzzing, chirps, and chicks to form the right pitch. 
Some signs were hard or impossible to make. The p, b, and m signs didn't form, and I struggled to form something that sounded like a t in the middle of a word. It was intelligible, but only barely. It would have to do. I ensured the rigging around the camera was more or less steady, and then set the swarm out the window. I relied on my power to keep track of it while I opened the laptop coil had provided and turned on the video feed. When it had arrived outside the PHQ headquarters, I drew it together into a densely packed human form. It took six and a half minutes for the protectorate to reach the figure. That bothered me on a level. Were they disorganized? Or was it difficulty in communicating and marshalling their forces when they didn't have phones or other means of passing on alerts? They gathered in the lobby. I adjusted the camera the insects were carrying and made out Wheeled, Kidwin, Clock Blocker, Miss Melita, Battery and Legend. There were three more capes I didn't recognize. Members of Legion's team? Seeing them gave me pause. As Miss Melita stepped outside, I pulled on the headphones and Trickster did the same. Skitter? Miss Melita asked. Something like that. I replied using my swarm. I wanted to talk. Given what happened the last time you were here, I'm not sure we're in speaking terms. We have two of the Slaughterhouse Nine in custody. We are prepared to turn one over into your custody. What? I didn't hear that. Damn. It sounded natural in my head as I got them to make the noise, but I wasn't quite there yet. Maybe it would have been better just to pass a phone to her. I'd gone this route for a dramatic touch, and because I hadn't wanted them to trace us. I rephrased. Shatterbird and Cherish have been captured. We will deliver Cherish to you if you wish. We are done interrogating her. Interrogation? You mean torture, don't you? Legend asked from where he stood in the doorway. No. Why? Miss Melita asked. Why the offer? You can put her in secure custody, and we need your help. For? The nine have captured Gru. We minded one successful attack this morning. We got two of theirs for one of ours. They will be ready for a rescue attempt. They know our powers. Help us attack. Help us catch them off guard a second time and stop them for good. You're not only asking us to fight the nine, but you want us to fight alongside notorious villains? So, I was notorious now, huh? Couldn't let that distract me. I'm offering you Cherish. I could make out Miss Melita shaking her head. I'll be blunt, Skitter. I'm not arms master. I don't have a stake in personal glory or renown. I'm not going to pussyfoot around either. Put a bullet in her skull and be done with it. There's a kill order on them. Nobody's going to charge you for murder. Then work with us because it's the best way to stop the nine. I refused Hickwolf when he made the same offer, and I'm going to refuse you. The capes on my team are good people. I won't throw away their lives with a reckless attack. We're going to develop our own strategies, plan, and find a safe way to target them. And civilians die in the meantime, I retorted. Gru dies in the meantime, if he wasn't already dead. We've tried the same strategies we use against Endbringers. Multiple teams, allying with locals. Sometimes we get one of them. Sometimes we get three or four. But we lose people, lots of people in the process. The remaining members of their group always find some way of escaping. The fact that we tried and failed in going all out gives them notoriety. They bounce back after an attack like that, and they bounce back hard, with creeps, lunatics and killers flocking to them for the chance at that same sort of glory. The difference between us and Hookwolf is that we've succeeded. We have two of them in our custody. You can't pat your time, organize and wait for an opportune moment. They have years of experience fighting people who do that. Anything you try, they've probably dealt with. We win by catching them off guard with pars they don't know about, pars they can't expect, and interactions between pars. Calculated recklessness. We can handle that on our own. With more calculation and less recklessness. He studied you. For any member of your team with more than three months of experience, he already knows everything they can do, their tricks and individual talents. You have powers we need. We have knowledge on their location, firepower of our own, and two captives. We will only pull this off if we work together. Putting our lives in your hands, Miss Melita replied. Only as far as we'd be relying on you, I answered her. Who are you, Skitter? Legend asked. He floated closer to my swarm decoy. I can't get a read on your personality or motives, and that's without touching on what came up at the close of the Endbringer event. My teammate is in the hands of the Nine. 
They could be murdering more people right this second. And you're talking about me, of all people? If we're going to offer you help, we should know who we're interacting with, he said. I glanced at Trickster, then back at the image on the screen. What do you want to know? You talk with the people in your territory. Between what they say and what came out at the hospital, I can't help but wonder at your motives. There's someone specific I want to help. If I can improve the lives of others at the same time, then all the better. So where do you stand, then? Where do you see yourselves in terms of the siding scale of good and evil, heroes and villains? I almost laughed. And some of my humor must have translated in the mental direction to my bugs because they started making a noise that wasn't speech. I stopped them. It would have sounded much like a laughter anyways. All of the above. None of the above doesn't matter. Some of us wear the villain label with pride because they want to rebel against the norms, because it's a harder, more rewarding road to travel, or because being a hero often means very little. But few people really want to see themselves as being bad or evil, whatever label they wear. I've done things I regret, I've done things I'm proud of, and I've walked the roads in between. Deciding skills of fantasy, there is no simple answers. There can be. You can do what's right. I was getting an inkling of what Bitch referred to as words. Prattle that meant so very little in the face of what was happening in the present. Was this the kind of irritation, impatience, and anger she felt with so many social interactions? I clenched my fist. Speak for yourself. You want to hide here while my group and Hookwolf deal with the brunt of the Nine's attention? Just like you did with the ABB? That happened under Armsmaster's leadership. You can't blame us for being intelligent about how we go about this. I was disappointed. My swarm couldn't even convey my anger. I can blame you for being cowards. I'm going. If you want to talk about morality, start by talking to Armsmaster. Can't. He's gone. I paused. Did the Nine get him? Dead? Escaped from his hospital room. With our attention on the Nine, we don't have the resources to track him down. Does he know about the Nine's threat to hit the city with a plague if he leaves? I hope so. Fuck. Not only was that one more uncertainty stacked onto everything, but Arms Master was the closest thing I had to a nemesis. Having him running around the city was not a good thing. For a brief moment, I contemplated having Trickster teleport me to the ground level. So it was me talking to the local heroes, and not just my swarm. I could tell them I was putting my well-being in their hands, risking them arresting me as a gesture of good faith. Except I couldn't help but see myself from their perspective. Warlord of the Boardwalk. I'd rotted off Long's manhood and carved out his eyes. I'd played an undefined role in Armsmaster's downward slide. I'd robbed a bank, terrorized hostages with poisonous spiders, attacked their headquarters, and used insects dipped in capsaicin to cripple their junior heroes, incapacitating pain. All the while I acted with a seemingly ambiguous morality. Was I a good guy doing the wrong things? Or did they see me as dangerous and unhinged? There was no way I could put myself in their hands without knowing what they thought about me, and frankly, I wasn't sure how to think about myself. How the hell were they supposed to make a call? So, you in? I tried instead. I could see him look back at Miss Melita, who shook her head. Miss Melita runs the local team, so it's ultimately her call, but we've talked about it, and I agree with her. No. The risks outweigh the potential benefits. My heart sank. Then one final tip. You should know that Bonesaw's done some surgery on all her people. Implanted protection for the most vulnerable parts of their bodies. They're tougher than they look. Thank you, Legend said. You might not believe me, but I wish you the best of luck. I snarled as I shut the laptop and turned away from the scene, calling my swarm back to me. That didn't work, Trickster said. No, and we just wasted a lot of time. Well, we'll have Shatterbird working with us, thanks to Regent, and we've got Imp as our man on the inside. Maybe. We're going to outnumber the remaining five or six of them, right? It's not hopeless. They'll be ready for us. They're entrenched, they have a hostage, and we are totally unable to fight two of them. How long is it going to take to extricate Groove from whatever cage they have him in? It's not hopeless, he repeated. Whatever they're doing to keep Gru prisoner, if I can see him, I can free him. I wouldn't be so sure. Would it reassure you to know that your conversations with the local heroes gave me an idea of my own? My head snapped it in Trickster's direction. Come on, we should hurry, he said. 
I was a lot more comfortable with the risky plan when it was something I thought of, he said. You said calculated recklessness, right? Trickster asked. Part of that calculated bit is control, keeping the chaos to a minimum so we can anticipate and plan. Trickster leaned against the door of the vehicle. That may be a bit of a problem, you think. The truck passed over a pothole. Our teams were out in force. Our members divided across three trucks. I rode with Trickster, Sundancer, and Tattletail. Regent and Ballistic were in the second vehicle. Bitch and her dogs rode in the third. This was Tattletail's first time venturing out of Coyle's base in a little while. Her power was limited when she could only get information by what we communicated to her. And this was the kind of situation where we needed her at full strength. If nothing else, it felt better to have another teammate on the field with us, with Gru's absence. Sorry, I said. I don't mean to sound ungrateful. I know Gru isn't your teammate. You didn't have to come to help. We're all in this together, right? Trickster said. You mind if I smoke? I shrugged, and Tattletail shook her head. He rolled down the window and lit a cigarette, placing it through the mouth hole of his hard mask. That would be his way of dealing with stress. We were all tense, and we all had our ways of coping. Trickster smoked and stared off into the distance. Sundancer fidgeted. She frequently realized what she was doing and forced herself to stop, only to pick up something else. Her leg would bounce in place. Then she would stop doing that, start drumming her fingers on her knee pad in some complicated pattern. It made me think of a pianist or a guitarist fingering the strings. Tattletail watched people, her eyes roving over the rest of us. Her cheek bulged slightly where she touched the tip of her tongue against the backside of the wound Jack had left her. And me? I retreated into my headspace, I suppose. I was maybe similar to Tattletail, that I took note of each of the others, but my thoughts were less about simply observing than about cataloging and mentally preparing. What options did we have? What tools, weapons, and techniques did we have at our disposal? Who was going to be backing me up during this operation? And how reliable were those people? It was constructive, maybe, but exhausting. There were so many angles to consider, and the stakes were high. Brian's life. Brian's quality of life. The rest of us weren't in the nine's clutches, but it would take only one mistake before any one of us could be in the same boat. Wondering just how horrible things were going to get for us. Maybe fatigue factored in, but the more I thought on our allies, the less secure I felt. The information Cherish had volunteered about Coyle, true or not, had left me with lingering doubts. I was also acutely aware of the distinct lack of chemistry and camadre among the travellers. They were keeping secrets, with no promises of divulging the information in question. The last time we'd all been in a car with Trickster, he noted that there were two major problems the coil was helping them with. Noelle was obviously one. A part of me could buy that there was something serious going on with her, something that necessitated the help of someone like Coyle. Another nagging part of me was thinking that there was still too many unanswered questions. What was holding them together as a group? How fragile was that tie? Was this really what I needed to be dwelling on? I thought over my arsenal and the options I had with my power. i developed enough techniques starting to have trouble keeping track of them all. Should I name them? It seemed like something out of a kid's show. Shouting out the names of abilities as I used them. Firebug attack, go! Silk wrap, strike! I shook my head a little. I was tired. My mind was wandering. I couldn't remember the last time I had more than five hours of sleep. And I'd barely slept at all last night. Fear and adrenaline usually clarified things, so it probably said something, that I was feeling a little dazed despite what we were going into. Some of that was the constant aggression. Since the Nine had made their presence known, I'd barely been able to relax and let my guard down. After Mannequin had started killing people in my territory, taking even a moment to myself made me feel like I was insulting their memories, that I was feeling the next batch of people who would become victims of my enemies. We should stop here, Tattletail said. That was apparently order enough, because the driver pulled over. The long seconds of stillness after the truck had stopped said volumes. We didn't want to get out of the car. We didn't want to face the nine, deal with their traps as we tried to catch them in our own. Two or three seconds passed with tension thrumming in the air. If we one of our nerves on edge, ready to act, we act. Even now. The sound of a slamming door from one of the other trucks was the little push we needed to move. We climbed out of the truck and joined the others. Bitch had been the first one out. She had serious 
bastard, and Bentley with her. We ventured over to a fallen section of wall, peering over it to get a better glimpse of what would be the battlefield. The final two members of our group arrived a moment later. Shutterbird landed, stumbling, and Genesis began to materialize in a massive form. We were close to the site of our last fight. The nine had been on their way to Dull Town, and we'd ambushed them, divided them, and then provoked them into extending out of position. Having done that, we kidnapped Shutterbird as she lagged behind and then lipped around to capture the wounded Cherish. Now the nine were inside Dull Town. I could only hope the noise and fighting of our last encounter would have given most of the residents the time and the motivation to run. How's she handling? Tattletail asked Regent. Not the easiest power to use, he muttered. It's not a physical power, so I'm learning to use it from scratch. Doesn't help that she's really, really pissed off. I think she's a serious control freak. My control's slipping. How much is it slipping? I asked. Is there a chance she'll lose control of her? Always a chance, but I think I'm okay, so long as she and I remain pretty close to each other. Tattletail, where are they? I asked. Tattletail pointed at a squat building a few blocks away. It had the look of a small library, maybe, or a hardware store, a place meant to accommodate a lot of people for one job, somewhere in there. Then we wait, Trickster said, and we cross our fingers, waiting, the last thing I wanted to do. Using my bugs, I tried to scope out the area. Please don't let there be people here. There were. I had to be subtle not giving the nine any reason to suspect I was around. Even if I counted only the people who had bugs on them already, there were far too many people in and around Dalton. Regent, can you stop Shatterbird from listening in? I asked. Sure, he said. Shatterbird shut her eyes and covered her ears with her hands. I asked. Tuttletail, do you know where the nine are, specifically? She shook her head. There are people here. I'm counting thirty or so, but there could be twice that many. I haven't even taken a serious look at the building the nine are in, because I don't want to alert them. Ignore them, Trickster said. This is risky enough without splitting our focus. If I know where the nine are, I can tell these people where to run. Give them a chance. It's not worth a risk, Trickster stressed. He glanced at his teammates. There's still five or six of the enemy in the area. If they see what you're up to and get any advance warning we're here, this all goes balls up, and we suffer for it. Groot dies for it. Regent nodded in agreement. I looked at the others for help. Tattletail remained quiet, and Sundancer, the one other person I'd hoped would be sympathetic, looked away. Those are people, I said. Real people. So is Gru, and so are we. We look out for ourselves first. If we can take out members of the Nine, we'll save more people in the long run. The ends justify the means. You realize when this all goes down, they're going to die. Almost guaranteed. I directed Sundancer to attack a group of people who included bystanders. But they'd been goners already, dead for all intents and purposes. This was something else. Thirty people, for the sake of hundreds. It balances out, Trickster said. If we stick to the plan, and if we are successful. I can't agree with that. Then make your call, if you're absolutely certain that you're not going to fuck us over and give away the plan. If you're positive that the lives you might save are worth risking our lives and Gru's, you can go ahead. You don't have anyone's support here, and it's all on you if you fail. Tattletail spoke. If you're going to do something, you better do it fast. She pointed, and every pair of eyes in our groups turned to look. Purity streaked across the sky, followed by Crusader and a floating rock carrying a whole contingent of their group. The rest would be moving along the ground. Shatterbird, Genesis, go. Shatterbird took flight, calling up a storm of glass shards to accompany her. She flew low to the ground relying on the surrounding buildings and ruins to keep out of sight. Genesis had finished pulling herself together. Her form resembled Crawler, but with some additions. Groats on her back resembled Bonesaw and Jack. She tested her limbs, then looked at us. At me? I couldn't tell. She had too many eyes to tell. Then she ran, stampeding off. Not quite as graceful as the real Crawler, but that was one more area where we just had to cross our fingers and hope she could sell the ruse. There was the dull rumble of a distant impact as Purity opened fire on Genesis. Genesis dodged to a nearby alleyway, leading Purity and the rest of her group off to one side. Shatterbird fired on Purity and her allies, guiding a torrent of glass shards towards the incoming enemies. Not enough to kill, or even to maim. It was enough to hurt and piss them off. Coyle had informed Hogwolf's contingent about the general location of the Nine. Sure enough, they'd gathered, girded themselves for battle, 
and marched on, hoping to overwhelm through sheer firepower and force of numbers. Odds were good that it wouldn't work. It hadn't in the past. But we were hoping it would put the nine in a position where they had to decide whether to hold their position or respond to the immediate proximity of this many enemies. Shatterbird and Genesis were tasked with distracting Hookwolf's forces and preventing them from mounting a direct attack on the Nine's real position. We couldn't save Gru if Purity leveled the building. So much hinged on how the next few moments played out. The Nine are distracted. I'm going to help people run. The lack of response was as damning as anything they could have said. I waited until Purity fired again, then used the rumble as an excuse to stir various bugs into action. I did a body count, placing bugs on people's right feet, trying to calculate how many there were and how they were distributed. There was a crowd inside the building with the nine. People huddled in a room with Crawler, who lay on the ground with his chin resting on his forelimbs facing them. I couldn't find Gru. Was he in that group? No. On the other side of the building, four people were gathered at one window. A grown man, two grown women, one of whom was Nidge, and a child. A man clad in hard armour crouched in one corner, working with tools. There were enough cool bodies around them that I would have known who they were even if the body types hadn't fit. Find them, I said, pointing. They're watching. They're not stepping outside, Trickster asked. I shook my head. Gah. I could see Mencha leap from Rune's floating rock and grow as she fell. She was nearly thirty feet tall when she landed, the road cracking under her weight. Rune leapt off the rock and landed on a husk of building that hadn't survived the Leviathan's attack. A few seconds later, a large section broke off and lifted into the air. She didn't stay on top of it for long, choosing instead to gather more ammunition, moving on to other ruined walls and sections of building. This would be a balancing act. Unless the nine didn't plan on defending themselves or running, there would be something of a sweet spot. A point where the enemy forces got close enough that the nine were forced to act, yet not so close that anyone else was endangered. Now that I knew where the nine were, I could focus on civilians. I drew out messages for everyone who was hiding in their homes, along with arrows pointing them away from the nine and Hookwolf's army. If someone decided they didn't want to move, I nipped them with a biting insect or two to prod them. Dozens of people made their way to safety, following my instructions and running for their lives as they headed out back doors or out of windows to avoid being seen. There were still way too many people in the room with Crawler, and I still had no idea where Gru was. Slowly and carefully, I navigated my bugs through the rooms of the building the nine had occupied. A makeshift dining hall with a kitchen, a room solely for storing garbage then a small, open shower with three stalls. It had been some sort of office building, with no computers, desks, or cubicles. Something big, firm, and formed of cloth. One of Parian's stuffed animals? It lay prone on the ground, on the other end of the building, from where the nine was poised, so large and fat that it wouldn't be able to fit through any of the doors. I found another cluster of people on the top floor, three adult women and two children that ranged from taller age to five feet or so of height. Damn it. Why did there always have to be kids? I can't find Gru. He's in there, Tattletail said. How sure are you? Pretty damn sure. Then how long before we can move on to the next phase, I asked. I find some people which solves one problem as soon as they nine act, Trickster said. Tattletail? They're not wanting to move. Something about the hostages. Hercoff doesn't care about hostages, I told her. I know, but the nine are still holding back. Regent. I started. Don't distract me, he said, rushing through the words. I can barely dodge all the shit that they're throwing at me. I followed his line of sight to Shatterbird. Purity opened fire, and Shatterbird used a cone of glass to block the worst of the kinetic energy and reflect the light. Or something. It didn't work that well. Shatterbird was knocked to the ground. She managed to take flight just in time to avoid neuter. Trapped the boy in a cage of glass shards, and then flung a barrage of tiny glass shards at Purity and her group. I could see the glints of the shards catching the light as it flew through the air. Draw some fire towards the nine's location if you can, I said. I said don't distract me. But he listened. Shutterbird interposed herself between Hookwolf's advancing group and the building holding the nine and their hostages. Purity fired, and again, Shutterbird's glass couldn't absorb the full brunt of the hit. She was hammered down into the ground again, and what didn't hit her struck the building, not far from where the nine were peering through the window. Come on, come on, I whispered. The nine reacted. It just wasn't what we hoped for. Crawler stood and rumbled some words my bugs couldn't make out, and the hostages fled. The nine made no move to stop them. Just the opposite. 
They revealed why they kept them on hand. The hostages made their way out the doors and into the streets surrounding the building. Purity was so distracted by Genesis and Shatterbird that she didn't seem to notice what was happening at first. Tattletail watched her with binoculars. Oh, no. Oh, no? Trickster asked. Tattletail looked at me. Track their movements. The Nine. Don't lose sight of the Nine. The hostages scattered in every direction, and some invariably headed towards us. I saw what had concerned Tattletail. Even though I knew where the Nine were, I was still caught off guard. Bonesaw's talents apparently included crude plastic surgery. If crude was even the right word. Every hostage wore the appearance of one of the Nine. The group had headed towards us. Had three jacks. A Siberian. A bone saw. Their expressions were frozen. Their eyes were wide with terror. None of them were perfect. One was too heavy in his physique for Jack. And bone saw had apparently been a short statured woman who'd had her shins and forearms sawed to a shorter length and reattached. The resemblance was close enough that someone might mistake them for the wrong person at a glance. And that was all the nine needed. Decoys. The word was hollow as it left my lips. And the nine are moving out, Tattletail reported leaving the front of the building. Get ready. I used my bugs to draw a message for people still hiding in another part of the building. Crawler was the first to leave the building, charging out the front door, plowing through one or two of the nine, and barreling towards Hookwolf's army. The other members of the nine headed out. A real burn scar, Jack, Siberian, and Mannequin, at the tail end of their mass of fleeing decoys. Bonesaw's not leaving, I said. Doesn't matter. Now, Tattletail shouted. Trickster hurried to my side. Binoculars in hand, I pointed, and I could feel a pressure building around me. It was slower than his other teleports. More jarring. Didn't matter. Our group was soon indoors. Me, Tattletail, Trickster, Sundancer, and Ballistic. The interior was rank. There were smells I'd gotten to know since Leviathan's attack. Blood. Death. And the dank smell of sweat. Trickster had replaced all of the kids and the three adults that had been accompanying them. He hadn't brought Regent because Regent was focused on Shatterbird. That was part of the plan. Leaving Bitch behind wasn't. I could understand it if it was because of a lack of mass to swap with, but my doubts about the Travellers, and about Trickster specifically, led me to ask, You figure Bitch will cover our retreat? And if one of the nine is here, Trickster said, his voice low, We don't need her dogs making noise. Right. Okay. Made sense. I led the way, as I had the best sense of the layout. Boonsaw was excitedly pacing back and forth, the rest of the place was quiet. There's only a few places Gru could be. Confined spaces my bugs can't get into. Makes sense that they'd improvise a cell to contain him, Tattletail said. I nodded, swallowing. Worn and damaged posters and flyers referred to yoga and Pilates classes. Makeshift signs and notices had been raised since this building had been used for the rich person exercise classes. These were more pragmatic, detailing chore schedules, contact information, and watch rotations. These people had been getting by, maybe in the same way I had been trying to get my own people organized. I felt a growing outrage at what had happened here. What had happened to my people? Why? What purpose did this chaos serve? We checked a small sauna. No luck. No less than three storage rooms, sealed tight to keep vermin out, turned up empty. The place I'd mentally labeled the dining hall turned out to be something of a restaurant. More notices about food rationing, covered menus and signs advertising healthy eating. I headed around the long counter and into the kitchen. Crates of supplies had been opened, the contents sorted into piles. There was also other supplies that didn't look regulation. Several five-gallon jugs of water that were designed to fit into watercolors were stacked in one corner, and neither I nor my bugs had seen any watercolors in here. I stopped outside of the walk-in freezer and stared at the handle. Skitter? Tattletail asked. There's only three places left where Gru could be. The other two places are the regular fridge over there and a closet in the basement that I think is too small to hold him and still let him breathe. So, if he's not in here... Right, I said. Trap free? As far as I can tell, she replied. No, if they were going to trap it, they'd lock it first, chain it shut. Swallowing, I gripped the handle and hauled the door open. It took me a second to process what I was seeing. Brian was in there. And he was alive. I couldn't have been happier at that realization. There was no power to the walk-in freezer, so it was warm. The interior was maybe ten by twelve feet across. The walls were metal, with racks on either side. Brian was hanging by the wall at the far end, 
propped up enough that his shoulders were pressing against the corner bordering the wall and the ceiling, his arms outstretched to either side like a bird hung up for display, his head hanging forward. It was some sort of collaboration between Bonesaw and Mannequin. He'd been partially flayed, his skin stripping from his arms and legs and stretched over the walls around him. His rib cage had been opened, splayed apart. An improvised metal frame held each of his internal organs in place, some several feet of their intended position, as if they were held out for display. Others, placed on the shelves of the freezer, cases covered in ceramic shell, seemed to be pumping him full of water, nutrients, and other fluids that had been helping keeping him alive. His head was untouched. He looked at us, and he looked harrowed. The look in his eyes was more animal than person, his pupils mere pinpoints in his brown eyes. Tiny beads of sweat dotted the skin of his face, no doubt due to the warmth of the room, but he was shivering. Oh, my voice was a croak. Brian! I took a step forward, and he seized up, his entire body twisted, his hands clenching, eyes wrenched shut. Get back! Tattletail gripped me by the shoulder and forced me out of the freezer. I... what? I was having trouble processing. Trap? Tattletail had a dark look in her eyes. No. Look closer at the walls and floor. Numbly, I did as she asked. They looked like hairline cracks. Spider webbing across everything from the walls to the shelving and even the ceramic cases that Mannequin had set up. Except they were raised. Over the surfaces. Veins? Exposed nerves. Artificially grown, connecting him to the rest of the room. I stared up at Brian, and he stared back at me. There was no way to help him. I couldn't even get inside the room to try and comfort him in the smallest ways, not without causing him unbearable pain in the process. Brian moved his lips, but no sound came out. He tried to raise his head as much as the ceiling allowed. His eyes raised towards the sky. There was a cauterized scar just above his collarbone. I can make it quick, Blessick said. No, I told him. It'd be a mercy. No, I shook my head. No, we have options. Panacea is nowhere to be found, Tattletail told me. And given what happened with Mannequin, she's going to be as far as she can get from downtown. Then Bonesaw, I said, clenching my fists. Bonesaw can fix him. She's not going to fix him. I tried she'd do it on pain of death, Tattletail told me. Skitter, we'll try, I told her. At least try. I looked at the others. Sundancer was on the other side of the kitchen, hands on the edge of the sink. Ballistic had his arms folded. Trexter leaned against one counter, silent not looking at the scene. Every second you make him go on like this is cruel, she said, her voice hard. So is every second you spend arguing with me. I'm not negotiating here. I'm willing for him to suffer if it means that there's a chance we can help him. She met my eyes, looking like she wanted to slap me, yell at me, or both. Fine, then let's hurry. I gave Brian one last look over my shoulder before I hurried off, leaving him behind. The others followed. I was using my bugs to track the positions of the nine, where Siberian and Crawler were in the thick of the enemy. Mannequin apparently wasn't aware of my presence, so I had my first real opportunity of tracking his movements as he scaled walls and disappeared into manholes to emerge half a street away. Burnscar used her fire to bombard the enemy and divide them. Jack was more pragmatic, striking from behind, threatening his decoys to get them to run out of cover and draw enemy fire, and using every hiding space that was available. He was quick. Smart and devastating in how he operated. No movement was wasted. And every time he emerged from cover and swiped his knife, someone suffered for it. As far as I could tell, he was evading night and fog. My bugs could detect some noise from him that I was parsing as a mocking laughter. Maybe my imagination. Probably my imagination. I was getting a sense of what Brian had described once upon a time. That anger and outrage that didn't even come close to connecting with the fire inside. With burning rage or anything like that. It was cold, dark, and numb. We find her, in one of the exercise rooms. Yoga mats had been stacked together to serve as mattresses, forming a kind of sleeping area. Most of Dalton residents who had been living in this facility were dead now, their cold bodies lying in pools of blood. One of the culprits was at the window, clutching the frame. Bone saw. I gathered my bugs, directing them her way. Wait! Tattletail cried out. I turned to see her stagger. I ripped around to see Bonesaw. She was whirling around in response to Tattletail's shout, her eyes wide. There was a chain stretched from her wrist to the base of the window. Not Bonesaw. Decoy. Tattletail crashed to the ground, 
followed soon after by Trickster. Sundancer and Ballistic crashed to the ground a second later. Why won't you go down? The voice was petulant. I followed the voice and saw one of the corpses move, rising to its feet. Bonesaw unzipped the covering of dead flesh she'd covered herself in and shucked it off. She was wearing a yellow sundress and yellow rubber boots with a short blue jacket, but her hair and each article of her clothing were stained dark brown with the blood that had been on the corpse. A small chib was in one of her hands. I shot you with three darts. It's rude. I glanced down. Three pea-sized darts with flesh-toned feathering were stuck in the fabric of my costume, one in my dress, one in the panel of armor on my chest, and another in the side of my stomach. Bone saw, I growled. Skitter, was it? Bug girl? I really want to find out how your power works. I'll take your brain apart and find the mechanism so I can copy it. Is your costume spider silk? That's awesome. You know the right materials to work with. No wonder my darts won't work. What did you do to them? Paralyzed them, obviously. Living flesh is so much easier to work with. Paralyzed. I glanced at my teammates. Why couldn't I have finished their costumes? Stupid. I'd spread myself too thin. I should have finished one costume, then moved on to the next. Maybe then I would have saved someone. Oh, and I dosed them with a little something extra, because Jack said there's no point in doing anything halfway. She gave me a sage nod, as if sharing some universal truism. You're going to give them an antidote to whatever you injected them with. Then you're going to go to Brian, and you're going to fix him. Brian! Oh, you mean the boy we put in the freezer? I'm still trying to find out where his power comes from. The darkness comes from inside him. But what's the source? Besides the usual, I mean. So I took everything apart to see, but he wasn't cooperating. I told him I'd make the pain stop forever if he would just show me. But he was so stubborn. She stamped one foot. I'd let Brian's name slip. Dumb, dumb, dumb. I wasn't thinking straight. But no, I'm not going to do that, she said. I don't censor my art because it offends people. I could convince you, I told her. My swarm flowed forward and she backed away. Her eyes, one green, one blue, flashed as she took in the breadth of the swarm, the composition of it. She was probably already brainstorming some solution. I wasn't going to give her a chance. I drew my weapons, one in each hand, and charged through the swarm straight for her. My bugs served to give me a half second of early warning as they felt her jam one hand into the side pocket of her dress. I turned on my heel, the burn in my legs screaming in pain as I did it, and threw myself to the right as she brought one hand to her mouth and blew a billowing cloud of powder into the space I'd been occupying. I got my feet under me and lunged forward again. I didn't get two steps before I was tackled to the ground. It was a mechanical spider, the size of a large dog. It had been folded up inside one of the bodies. Its legs latched around me. There wasn't much strength in them, and even with my less than frantic upper body strength, I managed to pry the first two legs apart. I had almost got the spider off me when another caught me from behind. A third and fourth caught me in an instant later, seizing my head and shoulders and my legs, respectively. Bonesaw exhaled a second cloud of dust into my face. I held my breath for as long as I could, but there was a limit. When I did breathe, my chest seized up. My ears immediately started ringing, violently. A headache settled into place. The muscles in my arms and legs locked up. She sprayed an aerosol around herself, killing my bugs. Not that it mattered. My facility with my power was getting clumsier and clumsier as the headache increased in intensity. No, 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 no. Bring them, she said. The mechanical spiders left to obey. Within moments, me, Tattletail, Trickster, Sundancer, and Ballistic were being dragged inch by inch towards the dining hall, towards Gru. No, no, no. It took long minutes for us to get there. I could hear faint rumbles of the ongoing battle and Bonesaw's humming. It was all I could do to keep breathing. It was like my body had forgotten how, and it demanded my constant attention to maintain that simple rhythm. With the aid of her spiders, she stacked us like logs. Ballistic and Trickster went down the bottom. I couldn't even grunt as the spiders leveraged me onto the pile alongside Tattletail. I stared down at the mask of the third person below us. Imp. She'd got Imp. Bonesaw crouched, so her face was level with mine. This is going to be fun. With the shoulder bone connected to the... She paused. Hip bone. Bonesaw sang to herself as she drew a scalpel from her sleeve, investigated it, 
then laid it on the counter, and the hip bone connected to the back bone. She drew a pair of forceps from beneath her dress. Another two pairs of forceps were retrieved, joining the first, and the back bone connected to the knee bone, and the knee bone connected to the hand bone. I was scared. I could admit that. I could barely think straight. I couldn't move, and whatever she dosed me with was rendering me unable to use my power. It was there. It wasn't like what Panacea had done. It hadn't shut it down entirely. I could sense what my bugs did, and I could maybe give them crude instructions, but I couldn't do anything even remotely complicated or delicate. And the neck bone connected to the. She rocked her head to either side as she finished. Head bone. I could see the open door of the refrigerator out of the corner of my eye, but couldn't turn my head to get a better look. Brian could see us from where he hung. I didn't want to go down without a fight. I couldn't give specific directions to my bugs, but if I tried, maybe I could give one. Maybe, just maybe, I could really rely on my subconscious to guide them, even if my conscious mind wasn't up to it. I controlled my breathing, in, then out, and gave the order: attack. If the commands could be inoculous to words in my head, this was a shout. There was no control, no guidance. Or direction, I didn't have the facility. Still, every bug in reach, within a range of five or so city blocks, in every direction, began to converge on our location, veering towards Bonesaw. She noticed almost immediately, drawing the can of aerosol spray she used to wipe out the first swarm I'd set on her. One hornet managed to sting her, and with my power as limited as it was. I couldn't stop it from contracting its body in such a way as to inject its venom into her. I wouldn't have if I could. The rest of the bugs died on contact with the spray, their bodies shutting down. Except my order was a continuous directive. Much as my calling my bugs to me had been when I passed out while fighting Bakuda, it worked on its own, without my direction. It was eerie to track their movements. To see just how much initiative they took without my conscious mind guiding them, they spread out, navigated past obstacles, they organized into ranks and tried to attack her from behind, while she was spraying the ones in front of her. Some of the flying insects were even dropping spiders onto Bonesaw. This is annoying, I heard Bonesaw comment. I couldn't see her in my field of view, which was primarily limited to the floor, imp's mask. And if I looked as far to my left as I could manage, the fridge that held Brian, few of the bugs were getting past that spray, and even the droplets of the spray that had settled lingered on Bonesaw's skin, hair, and clothing, were enough to kill or incapacitate them on contact. I was unable to respond to her statement. I focused on my breathing, and taking in every detail I could. My eyes could still move, my fingertips could twitch, but nothing else. Just so you know, I've rendered myself immune to all those pesky little venoms and allergens," she said, "and I can turn pain off like I'm flicking a switch. Don't want to do that on a permanent basis, but it does make this easier to deal with. So I wasn't even hurting her. Damn it! It's still annoying. I can feel my bugs congregating on her as she put the aerosol down and fumbled around inside her pockets, test tubes. I could feel the long, smooth glass. She dropped something into each, then stabbed the aerosol can. The smoke that plumed out killed most of the bugs in the area. I couldn't follow what she did with the can and the test tubes. It's interesting, she said. I felt small hands on me, and she heaved me over so I was staring at the ceiling, and at her. Clouds of what looked like steam were rising around her, from the test tubes. It was having the same effect on my bugs that the aerosol had. She directed some kind of gaseous barrier. See, there's this part of the brain that people who study parahumans call the corona pollentia, not to be confused with the corona radiata. It's the part of the brain that's different in parahumans, and it's the part that's used to manage powers, when the powers can be managed. More specifically, there's this part of the corona they call the gemma. That controls the active use of the power, 
the same way there are parts of the brain that allow us to coordinate and move our hands. She ran her fingers over my exposed scalp, massaging it, as if she were feeling the shape of my head, the size, shape, and the location of the corona and the gemma changes from power human to power human, but it tends to sit between the frontal and the parietal lobe, beneath the crown of the head, if you will. They can't really lobotomize the corona in criminals. Some of that's because of the location and the shape of the corona depends on the powers and how they work. And trial and error doesn't work with the scary bad guys who can melt flesh or breathe lasers. She tilted my head back and felt around the edges of my mask, trying to find the part where she could pull it off. I'm really good at figuring out where the corona and the gemma are. I can even guess most of the time, if I know what powers the person has. And I can pry it wide open, make it so the powers can't be turned off. Or I can temporarily disable it or modify it. The powder I blew into your face? It has the same prions I put in the darts I shot your friends with. Cripples the Gemma, but it leaves your powers intact. Can't experiment with your abilities if I've fried your whole corona polentia, right? Right. She angled my head and stared into my goggles with her mismatched eyes. Delio is, the corona's way too small to be doing what it's doing. As power humans, our brains are doing these amazing things. The framework, all the details of our minds, are using to decide what works and what doesn't. The sheer potential, even the energy we're using. It's too much for our brains to process. And it's way too much for a growth no bigger than a kiwi. All of that? It's got to come from somewhere. And the other reason you can't just carve out the corona? If you do, the powers still work on their own. The person just can't control them. It becomes instinctive instead. She began feeling around my mask for a seam, buckle or zipper. Searching. She talked as she grabbed the part of my mask that bordered my scalp and tried to peel my mask down towards my chin. So you can see why I find it very interesting that you still have the ability to control bugs, even when your Gemma is out of order. She gave up on pulling my mask down. The armor panels made it too difficult, and the fabric wouldn't tear. She snapped her fingers, and one of her mechanical spiders stepped close. She removed one of the tools at the tip of the spider's leg, a small mechanical circular saw. It buzzed like a dentist's drill as she turned it on. She began taking my mask apart, thread by thread. I'm ten times as excited to take your brain apart now. You might give me a clue about the passenger. See, I think it's something that's hooked into your brain. It was alive up until your powers kicked in. It helped form the corona. Then it broke down. I've seen it at work, when I've provoked and recorded to trigger events. Seen it die after. But I'm pretty sure some kind of trace is still there, linked in, and tapping into all those outside forces you and I can't ever comprehend to make our power work. Breathe in, breathe out. I was having to consciously maintain my breathing. Whatever her dust had done to me, it also jammed up the part that handled the more automatic things. My pounding heart wasn't in sync with the speed of my breathing, and I was beginning to feel dizzy and disorientated. Or maybe that was the powder. Or fear. But I haven't been able to find it. It's not physically there. Or it's so small that I haven't been able to track it down. If your passenger is strong enough to let you work around a disabled Gemma, if your powers work without your say-so, maybe it'll be easier to spot. Her progress through the fabric of my mask was slow. She stopped to clear loose material from around the till. Don't worry. I'll put your skull's contents back when I'm done looking. Then we can get to the real fun. She peeled my mask off. Breathe in. Breathe out. Don't want to pass out. Or maybe I should. Maybe I didn't want to be conscious for what came next. Her scalpel slid across my forehead. So fast and precise that it barely hurt. I caught a glimpse of her untangling her fingers and her scalpel from my long hair before the first dribbles of blood flooded down into my eyes. It stung, and I was momentarily blind before I managed to blink the worst of it away. I wanted to blink more, faster, but the response was sluggish at best. 
I couldn't tell if my contacts were helping or hurting matters. I was put in mind of the incident just days before I'd gone out in costume. The bathroom stall, the showering and juice. It had started with cranberry juice in my eyes and hair. How had I gotten from there to here? I can't tell you how excited I am. It's like Christmas, opening a present. Thank you. She bent down and kissed me squarely in the center of the forehead. When she sat up, there was crimson all over her lips and chin. She wiped most of it away with the back of her hand, uncaring. She glanced at the circular saw, and it started up with a high-pitched whine. Then it stopped, clogged up with teensy-weensy bits of silk, and whatever that armor's made of, too slow. But don't worry. I have a bigger saw somewhere else. I was using it for one of the other surgeries I did earlier. Let me see if I can find it. She stood, then stepped out of my field of vision. My bugs couldn't feel her, but I could tell that she was carrying one of the steaming, smoking vials with her. As bugs died on either side of the room, then the hallway, then a nearby room, I tried to move and failed. My fingertips twitched. I could blink if I focused on it, to the exclusion of everything else. My eyes, at least, moved readily enough. I couldn't do anything. Even an instruction as basic as find bitch was beyond my abilities at present. Bonesaw had talked about this passenger, my ally, my partner, after a fashion. Was there some way to use it? To put more power in its hands? Help, I tried putting every iota of willpower into the command that I could. Nothing. Too vague. Whatever aid my passenger provided, it wouldn't think of something I couldn't. My bugs didn't respond. It was the perfect time for a rescuer to show up. My bugs had stopped going after Bonesaw, because we weren't aware about her current location. So they hovered in place, clinging to walls and feeling around for people who might be their target. There was a chance that they would bump into someone else. If a rescuer was coming, my bugs would see them. There was nobody. No people on their way. None of my teammates were moving either. If I had the ability to use my power properly, I might have done something with the smoking vials that Bonesaw had left behind. Used loops of silk to drag them away. Perhaps. I didn't. My power was clumsy now. A brute force weapon at best. And hell... I was just so tired. Physically, mentally, emotionally. So many burdens on my shoulders. So many failures that had cost so much. We had fucked up here. Had underestimated Bonesaw. I'd gone with Trickster's plan to set Hookwolf's contingent against the Nine and buy us the chance to infiltrate and rescue Brian. Even though I'd known this strategy had too many holes. Too many unpredictable variables. I'd been too tired to think of something else. Too preoccupied and impatient because Brian was in the enemy's hands. I would have resigned myself to a fate worse than death. But how did one do that? How was I supposed to convince myself to give up? It would be so easy on a level. It was alluring. The idea that I could stop worrying, stop caring, after so much pressure for so many weeks and months, after so many years... If I counted the bullying, I wanted to give up. But a bigger, more stubborn, stupider part of my brain refused to let me. Bonesaw returned all too soon. Threads, skitter, these yours, or leftovers from before. Threads? I hadn't set any tripwires. I should have, but I'd been more focused on a quick rescue mission than preparations for a potential fight. My bugs felt movement. Except... Nobody had entered the building. To the best of my knowledge, it was in one of the hallways. Big. The huge stuffed animal I'd noted in the hallway. Of course. Parian's creations had deflated without her power to sustain them. Hadn't they? The stuffed thing was inflated. Heavy. So she was here. My bugs couldn't detect her, but she was here. Outlet, outlet. Need an outlet. You'd think there'd be more in a kitchen. But no, Bootsaw muttered. She passed through my field of view, holding a saw twice the size of the one that she held before. The stuffed animal moved forward clumsily, 
My swarm's contact with it was intermittent as it made its way towards us, then passed us, veering into a hallway. Gonna have to cut a hole in your skull, Skitter. Unavoidable. I'd go up through your nose, but I couldn't reach the top of your brain with the equipment I have. Going to make a little window, just big enough to get my hand through. She turned on the saw, and it screamed. A shrill whine on par with nails on a blackboard, but unending, ceaseless. The stuffed animal was turning around, coming back down the hallway towards us. Have to stall her. I looked up at her, then deliberately blinked three times in a row. The saw stopped. Trying to say something? I blinked once. Hard. Is that one blank for yes? Two for no? I blinked twice, just to confuse matters. That's confusing. You're not just trying to delay the part where I carve up your brain, are you? I blinked twice. Not getting what you're trying to say. One blink for yes, two for no, okay? Now, do you actually have something meaningful to communicate? I blinked once. Hard. Are you going to tell me to stop? I blinked twice. She wouldn't listen if I did. And then it would be right back to the surgery. I trembled, but I didn't take my eyes off her. Tell me when to stop. Last requests. Threats. Your friends. Um, science. Art? I blinked once. Art. Yours? Mine? Another blink. If anything would get her talking, it was her art. What do you want to know? About your friend there? It's more research than anything else. Or maybe about you? I blinked. The stuffed animal was close. Art and you, huh? You want to know what I'm going to do when we're done with my investigation? Why not? Knowing had to be better than wondering. One blink. I'm going all out. Way I figure it, I set your gemma lobe to attract bugs around you, then remove it, so you've got no conscious control over it. But there's a point to it. I make some physical modifications to you, see? Implant some of Mannequin's equipment so you've got enough sustenance to keep you going and sustenance to keep the bugs you bring to you alive. You become a living hive, see? We could even make it so they crawl inside you and build nests there. The stuffed animal pushed the door open and walked into the cafeteria. The room darkened as it passed in front of a window. Please don't notice it. I've got a regular mod for your amygdala to make sure you behave and a frame I implant to your skeleton and heart to help control you, make you stronger, more durable. I figure we'll try to go for a cosmetic shift. I have to say I admire this armor. So why not let take that to the logical conclusion? We'll give you an exoskeleton. It'd be awesome. Compound eyes, claws. We'll see how far we can go. Won't that be fun? The stuffed animal had stopped in the middle of the cafeteria. Either it didn't hear Bonesaw, or something else had its attention. I could feel that not unfamiliar sensation of darkness creeping in around the edges of my vision. Was I passing out? How much blood was I losing? I blinked three times. Stall. No, no. She stroked my hair, and my forehead lit up with a burning pain where she'd cut it. We should get this done before you drop dead. Don't think I can't see the changes in your breathing and pupil dilation. She started up the saw and pressed it against my skull. The horror of what she was doing was compounded by the most god-awful noise and a grinding vibration of my skull. If it hurt, I didn't register it because the noise of the tool had drawn the stuffed animal's attention. It charged for us, slamming through the glass sneeze guard of the dining hall serving counter. It struck bone saw hard and the saw slid across my head, cutting through my hairline. I didn't care. My rescuer was some kind of cartoonish dinosaur made of black and blue fabric. I could see the logo of this health club repeated several times over the stuffed animal's exterior. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see Bonesaw slowly stand. The two combatants were at opposite points of my peripheral vision. Bonesaw stood to the far left, Parian's creature to the far right. That's really rude, Bonesaw said, putting inflection on each word. I was having a nice conversation with Skitter, and you interrupt. She snapped her fingers, and mechanical spiders leapt from a spot I couldn't see to latch onto the stuffed dinosaur, much as they'd done with me. Needles, saws, scalpels, and drills attacked the dinosaur, and it, 
in turn smashed the spiders to the best of its ability. Though it clubbed the spiders into pieces with its hands, feet, and tail, it still continued to march steadily towards Bonesaw, moving over me and the others. Bonesaw, for her part, was retreating, holding a pair of test tubes in one hand, dropping what looked like color-coded sugar cubes into them with the other. She glanced around quickly, then lunged for a nearby counter, grabbing a bottle of water. She upended it over the test tubes, going for haste over precision. More than half of the water splashed around her feet. Perion's creature struck the villainess a second time. Bonesaw was thrown into a metal shelf unit with enough force that she dented it. One test tube slipped from her fingers. The other, she whipped at the stuffed dinosaur. It hit with enough force that it shattered on impact. The dinosaur struck Bonesaw a third time. Heavy as the impact was, Bonesaw was cornered, and she couldn't go flying as she'd done before. My view of this scene was limited to the back of the dinosaur's head, and the occasional view of a stubby fingered arm as it was drawn back for a haymaker punch. It pounded her, one hit after another. My heart sank as I saw the stuffed dinosaur begin to deflate. It backed away from Bonesaw, and I saw a spreading area on its side where the fabric was thinning out, bleaching. Once the first holes appeared in the fabric, the rest of the process was swift. It crumpled, almost explosively, revealing a figure inside. Perion threw off the cloth that had covered her and used her power to rip away her sleeve and part of her dress, where it was disintegrating. Whatever had eaten at the fabric of her dinosaur armor was continuing the process with her clothing. I could see Bonesaw too. Her face was bloodied, her nose gushing blood, and her cheek was a ruined, abrayed mess. Whatever had eaten at Perion's dinosaur had gotten onto her too, devouring the edges of her dress, one sock, and part of the shoe on the same foot. Rude. You killed my mom, Perion shouted hollow. My teammates did the most of the actual killing, so I don't think I did. If that makes you feel any better. My aunt, my best friend, my cousin. They were all here. Wrong place, wrong time? Bonesaw shrugged. She slapped at a wasp that had managed to get in position to sting her. She wasn't in the area of her anti-bug smoke anymore. They told me to run, to protect the kids. But they were supposed to escape while I handled that. Perion shouted lost, dazed. I thought they'd get away, so I played dead. I didn't know. She wasn't a fighter, I remembered. She had held her own against Leviathan, but she didn't have experience. I wanted to scream at her, to make her stop talking, to do something to Bonesaw. If it makes you feel any better, some of them might still be alive. We didn't kill them all. Perion snapped her attention to Bonesaw. What? Some we left alive, so I could give them five-minute plastic surgery. My spiders handled most of it. Implants under the skin, some chemical dyes for hair. Plastic surgery? Perion shook her head. What? Why? To make them look like us. They're all running around out there, drawing enemy fire and freaking out. It's funny. And of course, it'll take a dozen visits to doctors less talented than I to get something even resembling their old faces back. Can you imagine how many people are going to double take when they look at them before they're all fixed? Like, oh no, it's Siberian. Except it isn't. Perion flung one hand in Bonesaw's direction. I didn't see what happened next. But the bugs that were still drifting in Bonesaw's direction to attack her were telling me that there were threads stretching between the two of them. A bug settled on the point of the needle where it had impaled the side of Bonesaw's cheek. Twenty or thirty needles with attached threads extending between them and Perion's sleeve. Bonesaw crunched something in her mouth. You're playing so rough. Ow. I think you broke one of my teeth with your dinosaur. Perion ignored her. A twist of her hands and Bonesaw was lifted into the air. Spread eagled. Bonesaw's skin stretched with the needles pulled at it. Perion advanced towards the villain. Broken tooth? No. When I'd kicked Cherish earlier, hadn't she said that Bonesaw had reinforced her teeth? Surely the psycho would have done the same for herself. She was lying. And there was nothing I could do to alert Perion. Perion picked up one of the scalpels Bonesaw had placed near me. Her hand was trembling, even after she had it in a white-knuckled grip. I don't want to do this. I never wanted to fight, but I can't let you walk away. That's the most important thing. I'm willing to compromise what I believe in, compromise myself to do that. 
Bonesaw rolled her eyes. Wall! Barrier! My bugs left Bonesaw's presence to form a barrier between her and Parion. But they were too few. Too many had died against Bonesaw's bug-killing smoke. Parion ignored them. In one motion, Parion stepped close and stabbed the scalpel into Bonesaw's throat. Then she did it again, and again, stabbing, over and over. Hysterical. It wasn't enough blood. I knew it, and Parion had to know it. Bonesaw spat into Parion's face. Her own flesh burned as whatever chemical she had been holding in her mouth spilled down her lip. Parion, for her part, dropped the scalpel, tore her mask off and staggered, blindly, in the general direction of the sink, her hands over her eyes. No. What I wouldn't give for the chance to change this, to act, to offer even one word of assistance. Bonesaw turned her head and spat again. Some residual chemical directed at the threads. When that didn't achieve the desired result, she repeated the process. The thread snapped, and she dropped to the ground. Burned my tongue, Bonesaw said, to nobody in particular, or to me. She stuck it out to demonstrate. It was scalded, blistered, and covered with dead white flesh, in much the same way her lip was. She spat again. Parian reached the sink, cranked on the tap. There was no water. She threw herself to one side, feeling along the counter for something, anything, to wash out her eyes. You're lucky I'm so nice, Bonesaw said. She lifted up the tattered bottom of her dress to dab her lip and tongue. I could make out test tubes, equipment, and pouches all belted to her thighs and stomach. If I was a less forgiving person, I'd make you regret that. Perrin sagged to her knees, hands still on the counter, heaving for breath. But instead, I'll leave you alone to think about what you've done. Bonesaw said. She plucked some of the needles out of her skin. I'll finish with these guys, and later, I can show you what I can do with a needle and thread. It'll be fun. Common interests. Making friends, Bonesaw? No. Any vestige of hope I had had disappeared. Jack leaned over the counter. Burnscar stood beside him, looking troubled. Jack! Yes, I'm having lots of fun. These people are so interesting, Bonesaw smiled. You hurt yourself, Jack frowned. Your mouth. The dull girl ambushed me. But I'm okay. I can fix myself after I'm done here. You have to finish fast. We're going. No! Yes. The enemy's recouping from the first few hits and they're stalling Siberian and Crawler. Only a matter of time before they engage in one good flank and blindside one of us three. We leave now, and all they remember is how hard we hit them and how little they could do. But I have research. Bring three. We won't be able to bring them all along. And you know how messy they get if you leave them like that for too long. Only three? Bonesaw pouted. Only three. Then, um, skitter. I felt hands seize my feet and pull me away from my teammates. Burn scar. She held me under one arm. My head and arms dangling. Beads of blood dripping down to the floor. Um, um, tattletale. I want to see what her brain looks like too. Tattletale it is. And trickster, because the ball of fire girl killed hack job. I want another. Hack job? Trickster it is. Finish off the rest. Can I leave Brian there? I have to show my art to people to get known. Brian, is it? Hmm. I think that's a very good idea. Yes. Then we'll go from the first to last. The girl with the horns. Imp? The circular saw started up with its high-pitched whine. Then it stopped. I could hear a strangled noise. Ah, look at his heart beating. So fast. Burnscar turned and I could tell they were looking at Brian. Another strangled noise, trying and failing to form words. It was so forced and ragged that it made my own throat seize up in sympathy. You don't want your sister to die, huh? That's sweet, Bonesaw said. Maybe you should have taught her the basics. Don't have to see her if she's going to walk straight into a modified wolf trap. Did you know? She turned off her power just so she could beg for help. From us. She's not very bright. He made a sound that might have been a growl or a howl of rage, but there was no volume to it. It was more high-pitched than anything else. Don't worry, Bonesaw said. I'll take good care of your friends. I felt a hand pat my cheek. Come now, Bonesaw, Jack said. It's just so funny watching him react. His heart beat faster when I touch her. It did. But we should go. Burnscar, 
torch the ones we're not bringing. I wanted to. You had your chance, little bee. You got distracted. I could feel the heat of a nearby flame as Burnscar manifested a fireball in one hand. Darkness rolled over Burnscar's feet, a carpet. There was no direction to it, and very little volume. It pulled on the grind and spread. Yes, he's doing it. Can I look? I just want to get the hard drive. No. But I could feel my heart pounding. Pounding, then stop. The pain was gone. I was gone, too. I had no body, only perception. The scene was familiar. At the same time, I couldn't have said what happened next. It was like a book I'd read years ago and promptly forgotten. Too strange to commit to memory. Two beings spiraled through an airless void, past suns, stars, and moons. They rode the ebbs and flows of gravity, ate ambient radiation and light, and drew on other things I couldn't perceive. They slipped portions of themselves in and out of reality to reshape themselves, push further into this reality to ride the pull of one planet, shift into another to ride that slingshot momentum or find some other source of momentum elsewhere. Ten thousand thousands of each of the two entities existed simultaneously complemented each other, drew each other forward. They shrugged off even the physical laws that limited the movement of light, moving faster with every instant. The only thing that slowed them was their own desire to stay close, to keep each other in sight and match their speeds. Yet somehow this movement was graceful, fluid, beautiful even. Two impossible creatures moving in absolute harmony with the universe leaving a trail of essence in their wakes. I focused on one of them, and I got the sensation that this wasn't a scene I'd seen before. I could see what it saw. It was looking forward, but not in distance. Ten thousand pictures at once, seeing situations where it arrived at its final destination, Earth. The further forward it looked, the broader the possibilities. It was looking for something, powering away the branches where the possibilities were few, an earth, in a perpetual winter, an earth, with a population of hundreds, an earth, with a population of more than twelve billion, that had stalled, culturally, and a modern dark age with a singular religion, and it communicated with its partner, signals transmitted not through noise, but wavelength, transmitted across the most fundamental forces of the universe. In the same way it received information, it worked with its partner to decide the destination. It viewed a world, one point in time, in the present, and in a heartbeat, it took in trillions of images, billions of individuals, viewed separately, and as a tableau, innumerable scenes, landscapes, fragments of texts, even ideas. In that one heartbeat, I saw people who were somehow familiar, a young man, a teenager, out of place among his peers, men who were burly with muscle, they were drinking. He was tan, with narrow hips, his forehead creased in worry, above thick glasses, but his mouth was curled in the smallest of wry smiles over something one of the men was saying, a snapshot, an image of a moment. It was my world, my earth it was looking at. Coming to a consensus, it transmitted a decision, destination. The reply was almost immediate. Agreement. More signals passed between them, blatant and subtle. A melding of minds. A sharing of ideas. As intimate as anything I'd seen, they continued to communicate, focusing on that one world, on the possible futures that could unfold, committing to none, but explored the possibilities that lay before them. They broke apart. The two massive beings that had spiraled together and I gradually lost my glimpse into what they were thinking, what they were communicating. Whatever view they had of the future, they were losing it. It was too much to pick through on their own. Where have I seen this before? I thought. But somewhere, in the course of forming and finishing the thought, I'd broken away from whatever it was I'd seen. It was slipping from my mind. The void I was in was not the world of the entities, but Brian's world, Brian's power, the darkness. 
coiled around me, through me. It was different, slithering past my skin to brush against my heart, tracing the edges of my wounds, the gouge in my skull that Bonesaw had made with her saw, slithering over and through my brain. I could feel my power slip just a little out of my reach, my range dropping, my control over the bugs just a touch weaker, but I could still see through my bugs. I could still feel what they felt. They'd gathered for the barrier I'd tried to erect between Parian and Bonesaw, and they'd dispersed in the time since, touching everyone present. Burn Scar had put out her flame, was cradling her hand to her chest. I could feel Bonesaw and Jack standing a short distance away. I could feel Trickster, Sundancer, Tattletail, Parian, Ballistic, and Imp. I could feel Gru hanging from the wall of the walk-in freezer. I could feel another person, someone who hadn't been there a moment ago, a man standing in the darkness. The man strode forward, uncaring about the darkness. He caught Burnscar around the face with one broad hand, and he brought it down hard against the counter. I was dropped to the ground. Burnscar fell across me, limp and unmoving, and the man flickered out of existence. The darkness slipped away, retracing its steps through my body, undoing its passage between my organs and joints, through and inside my blood vessels. A clearing formed, an expanse of dim light, lit only by one shaft of light that managed to come in through the corner of a window. Burnscar's head was pulverized, unrecognizable. She lay limp, unmoving, dead. Interesting, Jack said, looking down at his fallen teammate. Yes, I'm almost positive I've got this on record, Bonesaw squealed. Which you will have to leave behind. We'll retreat. I just need the hard drive. I've been trying to get data like this for ages, and it's a new system. Bonesaw started to head for the walk-in fridge, where Brian was, but Jack grabbed her by the back of the neck. No. It's Kay. Two seconds. I'll be right back. She slipped out of his grip, running into the freezer, opening one of the cases that looked mannequin made. The darkness continued to dissipate around Brian, and I was aware, as a masculine figure flicked into existence in the midst of the cloud in one corner of the walk-in freezer. It was Brian, but it wasn't. It was coloured in monochrome, with one eye open, the other half-formed. Markings in white covered its flesh, spiralling out from one pectoral, covering his chest and stomach. His hands were white to the elbow, and he was sexless. A Ken doll with only more white patterns between his legs. Or maybe he was white and the markings were in black. Almost casually, he reached out and seized Bonesaw's hands, which gripped the drive. He raised her off the ground, her feet kicking, and she grunted as his grip tightened. The things I put up with, Jack said, seemingly unconcerned. He whipped out his knife, slashing at the pseudo Brian. There was no effect. Hmm... Grabbing a meat cleaver from the kitchen counter, he hacked at Bonesaw instead. It took three swings to sever her arms at the wrists. She hit the ground running, her stumps jammed into her armpits. They disappeared over the counter of the dining hall, Jack helping Bonesaw up. Monochrome Brian lunged after them, but the floor of the freezer shattered beneath one foot. He lost his orientation, then flicked out of existence once more. I could see Brian from where I lay as I struggled to breathe with one hundred and whatever pounds that was piled on top of me. He hung there, haggard, glaring at nothing in particular. The man didn't reappear, but the stream of incongruent events continued. I could see one of Brian's ribs twitch like the limb of a dying insect. With a glacial slowness, his body parts began retracting back into place. The metal frames holding his intestines and organs into place bent. Then give way in the face of the inexorable pull. It took a long time, five minutes, maybe ten, but his skin crept back, tearing where it had been pinned to the wall, joining back together, then healing. Even the scratches that had crisscrossed his chest since he had fought cricket began to mend. The healing stopped before it was entirely finished. I saw the figure appear again, the monochrome half-formed brown, mercilessly. It tore out the metal studs that had impaled Brian's limbs to the wall. It caught Brian, then laid him carefully on the ground. He couldn't walk, so he dragged himself towards us. He had another trigger event. Two new powers. 
three, if I counted the way his power was diminishing my own. He touched my hand, held it between his own. I could feel something thrumming through me, willing me to take hold of it. It took me a minute to figure out how. The exposed bone on my forehead itched, then sang in exquisite agony as it mended. My skin was next. My seized-up muscles were last. My power was the last to mend, and I regained my control, though the diminished effect continued. I clenched my fist, struggled into a standing position. Brian hurried to Aisha's side, grabbing her. Four new powers? I hadn't heard about anything like this. Come on, he said in a hoarse voice. Don't have long. I... Damn it. His darkness flowed out from his skin, heavier than I'd seen it. Slow to expand, but it seemed to generate itself. It slithered through me yet again. Slithered through my bugs. It was minutes before the darkness dissipated. When it did, Tattletail was standing. Parian was standing on the other side of the rim. Eyes wide. The three travelers were huddled together. What the hell was that? I asked. Brian! Hey! I stopped. He was on all fours. His head hung, his cheeks wet with tears. I reached out for him, but a hand seized my wrist. Tattletail. She shook her head at me, while I backed off. Tattletail reached for Imp, whispering something in her ear. Imp bent down and took off her mask. In a voice far gentler than any I'd heard from her before, she said, Hey, big brother, let's get out of here. Brian nodded, mute. Aisha could approach him, but I couldn't. He stood, refusing Imp's offer for help and standing. He clutched one elbow with one hand, the arm dangling. It wasn't an injury, I was pretty sure. He'd healed the worst of it. It was something else. Some kind of security in the posture or something like that. Darkness boiled out of his skin, a thin layer. It moved slower than it had before. Thicker. More like trendles, sliding against one another than smoke. Just like the arm he had across his chest, gripping his elbow for stability, it was a kind of barrier, armor, or a wall erected against the world. He walked slowly. Nobody complained, despite the proximity of our enemies, and the fact that the darkness he'd spread out had to have alerted Huggles contingent about our existence. I watched Brian as I walked behind him. I'd just been paralyzed, about to receive involuntary brain surgery. Now, in a much different way, and for different reasons than before, I was again unable to offer him a hand. I couldn't even talk to him without being afraid I'd say the wrong thing. Even compared to being in Bonesaw's clutches, I felt more helpless as ever. I slept. But it was less like parking a car and more like running one into a ditch. I'd fallen asleep, not by choice on my part, but because I'd ceased to function. Over the past few days, I'd hit my limits of endurance, only to push past them over and over. We'd made our escape without incident. When we'd gotten Brian settled, I'd planned on staying awake and keeping an eye on him, only to drop off to sleep within a minute of setting down. I'd tried to push my limits once more, and I discovered them. When I woke up again, it was dusk. I was curled up in a chair with my head on the armrest. My eyes were sore and itchy. I wasn't sure why. We'd settled at Brian's headquarters, because it was close, and there had been the unspoken agreement that it would be better for him to be somewhere where he'd be comfortable. I was still tired and I kept my head on the chair's arm, clutching the blanket that someone, I suspected Tattletail, had draped over me. I could see her in the bed in the corner of the room, lying beside Aisha. When I dozed off, it had been Brian and his sister sitting on the bed. The blanket's presence unsettled me, and I couldn't put my finger on why. It was thoughtful. Nice. And the fact that I didn't know who'd done it, or that I'd been unconscious and helpless when they'd done it, it shook me from the twilight of near sleep. Which meant I was now wide awake when I desperately wanted to get back to sleep, to stop thinking for just a few minutes. 
The second I started worrying about things, my shot at a good rest would be gone. Worrying about things like Dinah and Cherish's hints that Coyle wasn't on the up and up about our deal. Worries about what that could mean in the long run. The newest were my anxieties ever grew. No, I wouldn't be getting to sleep any time soon. I turned my attention to checking my surroundings. Rising my swarm to check the surrounding streets and rooftops. Count the nearby civilians and get a sense of who was around. Sundancer was out cold in the bunk beds in the other room, and Bitch was sleeping in another bunk, in a heap with Sirius, Bastard and Bentley, occupying the open spaces. Trickster and Ballistic were walking outside, maybe keeping an eye out for trouble. Genesis was off sight. She had to be awake for a while to recharge her power. So she told us she was going to report to Coyle and check on Noelle. If my bugs were any indication, she wasn't back yet. Orion had gone her separate way. She'd had stuff to deal with. Her family was dead, or surgically altered. Their faces changed to make them near identical to some of the most hated individuals in the Western Hemisphere. I felt bad about leaving her with the aftermath of that scene. But we'd been prioritizing Brian. Seems Brian's commentary to me on the morning we'd find out about Dinah, the morning Leviathan came, was ultimately on target. When the cards were dying, we protected and helped the people we cared about. And we ignored the greater suffering of the world beyond that. I shifted restlessly. My bugs ran into a wall of Brian's darkness in the living room, on the couch. I could feel it seep through them, tracing their internal organs. I didn't move them further. I didn't want to wake him if he was sleeping. He wasn't. A hand settled over my bug and covered it. I felt him scoop up the cockroach and lift it into the air, holding it on the flat of his palm. The darkness dissipated, and the cockroach heard the bass rumble of his voice. I made myself rise from the bed. My ribs didn't hurt anymore, and my burns were gone, but my muscles had kinked up from sleeping in the fetal position on a piece of furniture meant for sitting. I stretched as I made my way to the living room. He was sitting on the couch with his feet firmly on the ground. You say something? I asked. I said, you can check on me in person, if you want. The words were kind, but the look in his eyes wasn't. His stare reminded me of bitch. Okay, I replied, feeling dumb. I'd come to do that anyways, hadn't I? And now I didn't know what to do with myself. I hadn't mentally prepared or planned for this conversation. I stood there, feeling an impending panic as I tried to think of what to say. I couldn't ask if he was all right. That might be the last reminder he wanted. In much the same way that I'd been trying to avoid dwelling on my own anxieties and worries. Could I approach closer? Or would that bother him? If I left, would I be abandoning him? Keep me company, he asked. Gratefully, I approached the couch and sat. I could see him tense as I jostled the couch. Are you hurt? I asked stupidly. He shook his head, but he didn't offer another explanation. Can I ask about the new power, or... Yeah, he interrupted. There was a pause. I saw him raise his hand and create a slithering mass of darkness around it. it. feels different, he said. And I can tell where it is. More. Slower to create. Spreads faster. But the other powers, I counted at least four. One new ability. I nodded. Didn't want to argue, so I waited. From the other end of the couch, he raised one hand and pointed it towards my head. I stayed utterly still as a trendle of darkness snaked through the air, taking its time as it approached. I stood up abruptly, and he jumped to his feet in alarm. I could see his hands clenched, lines standing out in his neck. An awkward, tense silence reigned, 
as we stood facing each other. I waited until he'd relaxed before I spoke. I had a bad time with someone else trying to get into my head not so long ago. Um, can we... Can we just skip the demonstration or make it more blunt? Right. It was like a shadow had passed over his face. He stared hard at the shuttered window at the end of the room. I sat down, pulling my knees up in front of me so I could wrap my arms around my legs, and I waited for him to rejoin me. He'd healed himself, but he hadn't exactly bounced back. It wouldn't be right to expect him to. Was this the kind of interaction Tattletail had wanted to avoid when she urged Aisha to go to Brian instead of me? I've talked to Tattletail about this. My powers always had some effect on capes, like Shadow Stalker. Her powers didn't work as effectively in my darkness. Velocity struggled too. He was slower, but I wasn't sure if it was because of the increased air resistance or something else. Yeah. So we think I always had some effect on that department. That's stronger now. Effects more powers, according to Tattletail. She's making an educated guess that this aspect of my power is going to be more effective on capes with a physical power. Right. And when it works, I feel a circuit. It's like the darkness comes alive. A cord or a wire between me and the people in my darkness. And I can actually see it. If I focus on it, it gets bright and hot. And I have access to whatever my power is seeping from them. A fraction of power, one power at a time. So the healing? Othala. I was so worried she'd escape my darkness before I finished giving you guys regeneration. I couldn't just use her power on each of you, because it was only lasting a few seconds after I touched you. And the regeneration was... Crawler? He nodded. I could see that dark look pass over his face. And then the duplicate you created would have been Genesis. He shook his head. No. No? She wasn't in my darkness, I'm almost positive, and my power's weaker than whatever I'm stealing. It doesn't make sense that I was able to form myself as fast as I did. It wasn't like she's described it, either. Remember, I worked with her when we were dismantling the ABB. I nodded. It was more like a force field, except not. A hole in reality, and it took something out of me to feed and shape itself. I blinked a little in surprise. If Brian was stealing a share of other people's powers, then... I blinked again. My eyes were itchy. Damn it, I groaned. He gave me a curious look. Or at least, that's what I took it for. I was having a hard time reading his expressions. Forgot to take my contacts out. My eyes are going to be sore for a while, and I don't have a spare pair of glasses to wear. He nodded. Sorry. So small a problem in the grand scheme of things. You need to be able to see. I reached into my utility compartment and got a small case with the spaces for the individual contacts and contact lens solution, then pried my right eye open and pinched the thing out. A few seconds later, my other contact was out, and I was half blind. The way the shadows fell over Brian's face... The shadows of his eye sockets made him look like he was wearing sunglasses. I couldn't see the lines of tension, anger, or anxiety. Whatever it was that had had him awake, sitting up and staring into space, at ten or eleven in the evening. Maybe I should have left them in, risking an eye infection, with small potatoes compared to fucking up this interaction. Except I couldn't put them back in without having to explain why. Why was this so hard? You get any sleep? He shook his head. None at all. Didn't need to. Didn't want to. Felt better by keeping an eye out for trouble than about sleeping. Trickster and Ballistic are out there. I know. 
I saw them step outside after Rachel came back. I smiled a little. Wasn't so long ago that you were getting on my case for not sleeping enough, mandating that I get a certain number of hours before we moved down the nine. He didn't respond, and he didn't move. I couldn't read his expression. Had I said the wrong thing? Should I not have mentioned the nine? Yeah. His reply was delayed, almost begrudging. It didn't sound gentle or kind or anything like that. It was more like I'd expect someone to sign if they were giving up the password to his safe at gunpoint. Sorry, I said. I wasn't sure exactly what for, but the apology was genuine. The smile on my face was gone. For a minute or two, neither of us said anything. What had we ever talked about that wasn't about our costumed life? At first, it had seemed like common sense. I was new to the cape scene. It was exciting. He was experienced. And I wanted to share his knowledge. We talked about our recent jobs, the implications, even jobs we were considering. I could count on one hand, maybe two, the times we'd done stuff that hadn't been centered around powers and fighting and violence. Now that I couldn't raise those subjects without reminding him of what had happened earlier, I was lost. You shouldn't have come for me. What? Should have left me there. I was as good as dead. Throwing away your life and the rest of the team to try and rescue me? You're not thinking straight. There's no way I'd leave you behind. Right because you're supposedly in love with me. So you go rushing off to rescue me. That stung. More than it should have. And it would have hit me hard anyways. I couldn't read his expression, so I went by his tone of voice. By the anger. The bite in his tone. The fact that he'd brought it up so casually. Emma jumped to mind. She'd been my best friend once. As I was friends with Gru. She'd also flipped on me, turned hostile and used private thoughts and feelings I'd shared with her to attack me. I took a deep breath. That wasn't why we came to help you, and it wasn't just me making the call. Really? Because I remember you were the only one who stopped Ballistic from putting me out of my misery. I clenched my fists. Any resolve I'd had to remain calm was gone. I would have done the same thing for Bitch, or Lisa, or Alec even. Are you seriously telling me you'd wish I'd let you die? You're alive now. It worked out. Because you got lucky. Christ, you always do this. Using my power, I checked on the others. One of the dogs had perked its head up at the shredding. But nobody else had roused. I didn't take my eyes off Brian, though. The look in his eyes was scary. Angrier than I'd seen him. I'd unconsciously defaulted to the same defences I used against Bitch. Eye contact. Pushing back when pushed. I deliberately lowered my voice. Always do what? You're smarter than average. So you count on your ability to think up solutions on the fly. You throw yourself into those reckless situations. Push and vote for the risky plans because you know that's a situation where you thrive. Where you offer the most to the group. Every step of the way you do it. Pushing the all-out assault on the wards of the bank. Charging in to fight Lung after taking on On Lee. The fundraiser. Confronting Purity. Attacking Leviathan with zero backup. The attack on the wards, HQ. Stop, I said. I was getting flashbacks to my conversations with the armsmaster now. You say you're not manipulative. That your undercover operation was pure in motive. But you are. You throw yourself into those situations solo. Or you join in on whatever fucked up plan the others come up with. And you do it because it makes you useful. Because you know we'd struggle without you. You're making us dependent on you. 
I swallowed past the lump in my throat. That's not... not what I'm doing. Every step of the way I had other reasons, strategies, or there were people I needed to help. Maybe Bitch was right about you all along. That's not fair. This isn't him. He's still reeling from what Bonesaw did to him. That excuse did little to shake my worries, that this was what he really thought. Was this the stuff he was holding back? Every day he was with me? That's not fair. What's not fair is that I'm the one who's tried to keep things sensible, to keep this group sane. And when push comes to shove, when I go with the majority because things won't go smoothly if I don't, I'm the one who gets captured and tortured. Your plan. Don't. Are you going to tell me I'm wrong? It, it wasn't fair. You're right. But I don't deserve all the blame here. I volunteered to be the person the tricks are swapped out. Knowing there was no way you could with your injury, so you let me. He stared at me with an intensity that I couldn't meet. I broke eye contact, looking down at my gloved hands, which were clutched together in my lap, fingers tangled. Tell me, Taylor, if you don't deserve the blame, who does? The Nine. Bone saw. But I could hardly say that. Not after seeing his reaction when I'd casually brought up the Nine before. However intent he seemed to be on hurting me, I wasn't going to retaliate in kind. That's what I thought, he said to my silence. I looked up at the ceiling, blinking to get the tears out of my eyes. Okay. What? I'll own up to it. My fault. The blame is at least partially mine. Maybe mostly mine. I've been reckless and others have suffered for it. Dinah, my dad, bitch, the people in my territory, you. Maybe I am toxic. Maybe me and my motivations, my issues, are causing everyone misery. I can leave the team if you want. Give me the word and I'll leave. There was a long pause. Christ, he said. I'm not telling you to leave. I'm just... You're making it clear I should. And you're probably right. I'm frustrated, and I went too far. It's not what I'm trying to say. Sure sounds like it. I stood up and turned away. I didn't want to see that look in his eyes. I tugged my armor into position and made sure I had everything I needed. It wouldn't do to get ambushed and killed as I left. My modified costume was heavier than my old one had been. And between that and the blanket, and this place's lack of air conditioning, I was sweating. My hair was stuck to the back of my neck. He wasn't saying anything. I'm going to go. Half my territory burned to the ground. My people need some attention. If you decide everyone's better off with me gone, just pass on the word. I won't make a fuss. I won't say you wanted me gone. I'll just make an excuse and leave. I drew some bugs around my lower face and eyes as a makeshift mask. My real mask was still in tatters. I noted that the modifications I'd made were no longer necessary. I wondered if I would go back to skin-tight leggings. It'd be good to get back to my people, to check on them, to ensure they were okay. Maybe they'd be better off without me. If Tattletail or Regent took over the... Stop, he said cutting off my train of thought. Didn't need to hear more of his accusations, his condemnations. I ignored him and headed for the front door. Please. His tone changed. I stopped walking. I've never really said anything like this to anyone, he said. But I'm scared. I'm more powerful now and I feel more insecure than ever. How was I supposed to respond to that? 
A part of me wanted to sympathize, to hug him and tell him it was okay. Another part of me was angry, wanted to slap him, scream at him, because he was still focused on himself, 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 after he'd just attacked me. I understood why he'd done it, but that didn't make his barbs hurt any less. I'm sorry, he said. I'm on edge. I'm spooked. I can't calm down. I shouldn't have said what I did. And you can't stop thinking. I feel like that. All the time, and I have for a while. They had Aisha. So much of what I've done, I've done because I wanted to support her. Make up for the fact that I wasn't there when she needed it. Before. Only we're putting her in more danger, and she doesn't respect me enough to let me keep her out of danger. I turned around. As long as I'm being honest and upfront, he said, I was thinking about you when I had my trigger event. I swallowed. I won't lie and say I suddenly realized I'm in love with you. I don't really know what I feel, so I can only comment on what I think. I can say I respect you, on a lot of levels, even if I can't figure you out. Sure as hell didn't sound like you respected me thirty seconds ago. I worry about you. You throw yourself into these situations, like you don't care if you die. Like you've got nothing to stick around for, except for those people you insist on protecting. Dinah, the people from your territory. People you barely know, if at all. And then you actually make it out okay, so you do it again, only more so. Risk your stuff. I folded my arms. This was uncomfortably close to what he'd been saying before. I started thinking about how I'm supposed to protect you. Get you to stop. Get you to focus on a goal that's actually attainable. Because you're so capable that you could be amazing if you stopped acting suicidal. Then I get pissed at myself and I get pissed at you because I can't figure you out. And you move forward so fast that I can't keep up. I let my guard drop for one evening to focus on other things. And then I find out you've gotten into a fight with Mannequin. It's not your job to look after me. If you wanted to get on my case because I'm putting you and the others at risk, that's fine. It's your right to yell at me for that. But don't make me feel bad because you can't be the macho guy protecting me. That's not... He stopped. No. I'm trying to say I think about you more than I should. I looked away. I might have asked whether he thought about me more than he should because he cared or because I was a fuck-up. I wasn't sure I wanted to hear the answer either way. Stay. When I asked you to keep me company, I was being genuine. Rather not be alone with my thoughts. I sighed. I could do with some tea. I could make you a coffee if you wanted. He shook his head. Jumpy enough already. I'll be right back. I headed into the kitchen, put the kettle on, and began digging around for tea bags. It wasn't easy when I was half blind. Once I had the tea bags and a mug set, I got my cell phone. Cranston here? The woman on the end of the line replied. What can I do for you, Skitter? Cranston was a woman Coyle had assigned to me, as he'd assigned employees to the others, so he wasn't personally dealing with each of us when he had other things to focus on. Need glasses. Coyle has the prescription on file from when he got me my contacts. I'll have them for you by morning. Anything else? No. Wait. I, yeah... Can you pass on a message to the PHQ? Coyle has contact information. Hookwolf's contingent exchanged contact details with the other teams, including the PHQ. No, I mean without going through Coyle's channels. I need to give them a message. From me. That can be arranged. I have a pen and paper if you'd like me to take dictation. Tell them Burn Scar's dead. 
and Bone Saw's missing a pair of hands for at least a little while. Four and a half members left. If they're being honest about waiting for the right moment to strike, this is probably a good one. Mm hmm. We can give them the location of the nine if they're interested. Should I give them your contact information? They have enough tankers that I'd be worried about them tracking me down. No. If they want to get in touch, I'll leave it to them to figure it out. Not going out of my way. All right. And one last thing. Tell them thanks for the help. I'll get the message to them promptly. I hung up. I returned to Brian, with a mug of tea for myself and a glass of water for him. The television was on, and he sat in the middle of the couch. He padded at one cushion. With the only way he was positioned, there was no way for me to sit a distance from him. At the same time, when I did sit, he didn't reach out to touch me, to put a hand on my shoulder or any of that. We watched terrible late-night TV, with the volume so low we could barely hear it. No talking. Not making body contact. Barely even looking at each other. He'd confess feelings for me, after a fashion. I had a special place in his thoughts. Even if he didn't know what that meant exactly. We were sharing personal parts of ourselves we'd never let others see. We even cared about each other. I just hadn't wanted it like this. It's like the world's gone mad and I'm the only sane person left. Director Emily Piggott finished the last of her coffee and paused to survey the enormity of the task that lay ahead of her. The scale of it could be measured in paperwork. Piles of it. Sometimes two feet high, the stacks of paper were arranged in rows and columns on every available surface, including the top of her coffee maker and the floor around her desk. There were stacks of staple pages, each topped with a weight to protect it from the gusts and breezes that flowed through the open window frames. She couldn't help but notice the way that the pages at the bottom of the pile were neatly organised, tidy, everything in line. The newer pages, the ones at the top, were the sloppy ones. Pages were slightly out of alignment, some dog-eared or stained. The same progression could be measured in the print. The older pages were typed, printed as formed with everything in its place. Abruptly, it all shifted to handwriting. Shatterbird's destruction of everything glass and everything with a silicon-based chip inside. Computer screens and computers. Computer screens and computers. The handwriting, too, grew less tidy as the rise of the piles marked the passage of time. On occasion, it would improve for a day or two, when her captains and sergeants complained about illegible handwriting, but it inevitably slipped back into disarray. A strong metaphor, Emily Piggott thought. Every part of it said something about the current circumstances. The shift from uniform typed words to countless styles of handwriting. It said something about the innumerable voices, the breakdown of a cohesive, ordered whole. What resulted were hundreds, thousands of self-interested voices. One in five condemned her, two in five pleaded with her for assistance in some form, and the remainder simply expected her to perform her duties as a cog in the machine. She looked over the sheer volumes of paper around the office. The PRT handled cases where power humans were involved, and these days it seemed like everything and everyone was touched in some way by the heroes, villains and monsters of Brockton Bay. Every time the other precincts had the slightest excuse, they would claim that it was a PRT's responsibility. If they had no excuse at all, they would claim it as a joint responsibility. Until she read over the cases in question, and either signed off on them or refused them, the job was in her hands. As far as the ones passing the buck were concerned, it was out of their hands. The first real intrusion on the average citizen's life had been the bombings instigated by the ABB. Frightening, but it had been easy for the average person to believe that they wouldn't be one of the victims, to shrug it off as the same background noise of heroes and villains that they'd experienced for much of their lives. Now, between Leviathan, Shatterbird, the fighting and the formation of territories, everyone had reason to worry and give serious thought to who they needed to support and how they were going to protect themselves. Just as the power humans had invaded the lives of those in the city, the paperwork seemed to dominate Emily's life. It crept onto the walls, onto bulletin boards and whiteboards, notes of the local players, timelines, messages and maps. Insurmountable. It was too much work for one woman to handle. She delegated where she could, but too much of the responsibility was hers and hers alone. The humans outnumbered power humans by 8,000 to 1, give or take, in urban areas. Outside of the more densely populated areas, it dropped a more manageable 1 in 26,000 ratio. But here in Brockton Bay, many had evacuated. 
Few places in the world, if any, sported the imbalanced proportion that Brockton Bay now featured. What was it now? One power human to every 2,000 people? One power human to every 500 people? Each power human represented their respective interests. She represented everyone else's. The people without powers. The whole nation was watching. People across America ate their TV dinners while they watched the news, seeing footage of the slaughters in downtown Brockton Bay, white sheets draped over piles of bodies. The before and after shots of areas devastated by shatterbirds. Flooded streets, fundraising efforts were launched, many succeeding, while yet others leveraged the situation to cheat the sympathetic out of money. The world waited to see if Brockton Bay would become another Switzerland, another Japan, another region that simply couldn't recover. Ground lost to the endbringers in the relentless campaign of attrition against humanity. So very few of them knew it, but they were counting on her. She heaved herself out of the chair and made her way to the coffee machine to refill her mug. Director? She turned to see Kid Wynn standing in the doorway. He looked intimidated. Yes? He raised a laptop he carried in his hands. The guys in CS asked me to bring this to you. She shook her head, refusing the offer. For now, every computer that comes in is supposed to be used for setting up consoles and communications. They're done, or almost done, for communications. They expect to be back up and running in two hours, but they have all the computers they need. Good. Access to the central database is up. Everything except the highest security feeds. Disappointing. I'll make do, I suppose. Thank you. Kid Wynn seemed almost relieved to hand her the laptop. It meant he could get out of her presence sooner. He was turning to leave the instant the laptop was out of his hands. Wait. She could see his shoulders drop, slightly, in the same way a dog's tail drooped when ashamed or expecting reprimand. Emily Piggott wasn't good with kids, or even young adults. She knew it. Outside of the time she'd played with dolls as a small child, she'd never entertained the notion of being a mother. She didn't even like kids. It was a rare youth that she actually respected now, and those few tended to be the ones who saw her firm leadership and respected her first. Now she was in charge of some of the most powerful children in the city. The next patrol shift is in... She turned to face the clock. Twenty minutes? Twenty minutes, yeah. Vista, with clock blocker babysitting. Weld and Flechette are out right now, patrolling separately. Postpone the next patrol, and tell Weld and Flechette to take it easy, but to be ready to report at a moment's notice. With the consoles up, we'll be ready to act. Pass on word to Miss Militia as well. I believe she's taken the next patrol shift? Yes, ma'am. The laptop would do little to help in the war against the paperwork until she had access to a printer. PRT divisions and precincts in neighbouring cities were all too willing to send along staff and officers to assist, but her firm request for the fundamentals for computers, printers, satellite hookups, electricians and IT teams were ignored all too often. She cleared space on her desk and started up the laptop. It would be good to have access to the files on the locals and guests alike. She would handle the paperwork better after a moment's break, whilst she focused on other things that needed doing. She was barely registering the words at this point. This would be a battle won with preparation, and for that she needed information. It took her a moment to adjust to the smaller keyboard. She entered her passwords, and answered the personal question the Dragon subsystems posed to her. Why is your nephew named Gavin? Your favourite colour? Irritating. She didn't even know her favourite colour, but the algorithms had figured it out before she did. All information divined from the countless pieces of data about her that were in official emails, photographs and surveillance footage from the PRT buildings. It was a moment of trepidation that she typed in, For Gawain, Knight of the Round Table, Silver. The fact that Dragon System could divine these details, as always, unnerved her. This time, in light of recent events, it unsettled her all the more. She typed the words, Slaughterhouse 9, and watched as information began appearing in lists. News items, sorted by relevance and dates, profiles, records, list of names, casualty reports. Emily clicked through the records. Sorting as a timeline, she found the entry modelled with Arms Master's simulation records and the fighting abilities of the Nine. He'd been preparing to fight them. A double check of the modification date showed he'd seen the records recently. So when he'd escaped, he'd done it with the intent of fighting the Nine. She'd suspected as much. She refined the search to remove the simulation from the results and found video footage. A video of Winter, an ex-member of the Nine, engaging in a protracted siege against no less than 20 members of the Protectorate. She'd been killed by one of her teammates. A sighting of Crawler shortly after he had joined the Nine. He'd been more humanoid then. Still large. Another member of the Nine from yesteryear, Chuckles, attacking a police station. No use to her, beyond serving as a testament to what might happen if she consolidated too many forces in one place. 
She found a file listed as case 01. She clicked it. We got her cornered. The person in the video spoke. Hearing the voice, noting the camera image of an apartment was mounted on a helmet, Emily Piggott knew who it was. She knew the video well enough. Think so, a man replied. The camera focused on legend, then swung over to Alexandria and finally Eidolon. We've got teams covering the drainage and plumbing below the building and the entire place is surrounded. She hasn't tried to leave? The face behind the camera asked. Why not? Legend can maintain eye contact. She has a victim. Alexandria spoke up. You'd better be fucking kidding me or I swear stop, Alexandria. It was the only way to guarantee she'd stay put. If we moved too soon, she'd run. And it would be a matter of time before she racked up a body count elsewhere. Then let's move, she responded. The sooner the better. We're trying an experimental measure. It's meant to contain, not kill. Drive her towards Main Street. We have more trucks over there. Emily turned off the sound of the four charge into action. She didn't want to hear it, but she felt compelled to keep watching. A matter of respect. It was Siberian. One of the first direct confrontations, more than a decade ago. It hadn't gone well. The protector had been smaller then. The lead group had consisted of four members. Legend, Alexandra, Eidolon and Hero. Hero had been the first tinker to take the spotlight. So early to the game that he could get away with taking a name that basic and iconic. He'd sported golden armour, a jetpack, and a tool for every occasion. His career had been cut short when Siberian tore him limb from limb in a sudden frenzy of blood and savagery. He'd been scooped up by Eidolon, who tried to heal him, who continued to hold the man as he joined in the ensuing conflict. Director Pegger had seen the film before, several times. It was the screams that haunted her. Even with the sound off, she could have heard it all together from the sounds that were engraved in her memory, right down to the cadence, the pitch. Seeing a teammate die so unexpectedly, so suddenly. The noises of panic as some of the strongest capes in the United States realised there was nothing they could do. Adjusting their tactics just to unsafe people, staying one step ahead of Siberian to minimise the damage she did as she waded through any defence they erected. Tossing the PRT trucks, modified fire trucks then, although they were light and aerodynamic as throwing knives. Invincible Alexandria was struck a glancing blow and had one eye socket shattered. The eye coming free in the midst of that bloody ruin. Eidolon had healed her after, but the scar was still there. Alexandria now wore a helmet whenever she was out in costume. After that telling blow, legend voice would be ordering the containment foam. Not so much to bind Siberian as to hide the wounded Alexandria from the feral lunatic. With the sound muted, Piggott would not have to hear legend crying out over what he had believed were the death of two teammates. It had always made her feel guilty to hear it as if she was intruding, seeing someone mighty at a moment in their life when they're stripped emotionally bare. And of course, Siberian had escaped, slipped past countless PRT officers and a dozen superheroes in the chaos. Nothing in the footage gave a clue as to how. A shadow passed over her desk. Turning, she saw the silhouette of a flying man against the light of a sun. Like so many power humans, he lapsed into intrusiveness and a self-centred mindset. Well, she wouldn't blame him for being emotional in regards to this. She composed herself and spoke. If you'd like to enter my office through the front door legend, we can talk there. Silently, he disappeared around the side of the building. She couldn't see through the wall, but she heard the commotion as he flew in through the window. He stepped into her office with the fluid grace one had when they could use the ability to fly to carry their weight. Blue and white costume, boots and gloves. Veteran member and leader of the protectorate. His lasers carried as much firepower as a battalion of tanks. She had to remind herself that she technically outranked him. Siberian, he asked. I'm reading up on our opposition. She wouldn't apologise, but she couldn't keep the sympathy from her face. I flew up to check if you were in your office, and I saw the video. My fault for seeing what I did. It wasn't a good day. She nodded curtly. It hadn't been. One could even suggest it was when things started to go bad. The loss of hero, the first time a truly dangerous villain made an appearance. What did you want to see me for? A note delivered for you at the front door. We gave it a high priority. You're taking the standard precautions? He nodded. It's already on the way to the lab. Join me? She lifted herself out of the chair, keenly aware of the differences in her and legend. Power human and human, male and female, lean muscle and 80 pounds of extra weight, tall and average in height. Of course. They walked past the reams of public servants, government employees and Piggott's own people. Emily knew she was not the only one overburdened with work. Not the only one sweating, trying and failing to keep cool. The rest of her people were staying awake with the benefits of coffee more than anything else. 
She couldn't turn away everyone that volunteered or was sent to Brockton Bay to assist her PRT division, but there were too many. Space was at a premium, and there were too few places where she could establish secure offices, where buildings didn't threaten to fall down and where assistance was actively needed. Still, she'd send people away where she could. How's the family, she asked. You adopted, if I remember right. We did. Arthur was worried that a surrogate parent would give birth to a parahuman, and if that happened, he'd be out of the loop. The odds are still high, even with an adopted child. It's likely more to do with exposure to parahumans at formative ages than genetics. I know, Arthur knows, but I don't think he believes it. Or he doesn't want to believe, Emily said. Legend nodded. He knew the price of admission, she said. Legend smiled. You're always straight to the point, Director. But the child is good? A boy or a girl? A boy, Keith. You've heard there are some third generation parahumans on record? For a while now, we knew they were being born anyways, right? We did, but nothing official until it's on record. But the point I was getting at was that there was apparently an incident. Oh? In Toronto, a five-year-old manifested powers. A third generation power human. Legend nodded, but he didn't respond right away. He stepped forward to open a door for her. Everyone's all right? He asked at last. No, but no casualties. The parents were outed in the chaos. Sobering. She nodded. The perils of being a superhero parent. Your child isn't a third generation cape. I know, but there are always risks. Still, I envy you. How so? Family. I wonder if it is harder or easier to get through the day if you have people waiting for you at the end. Yes. She smiled a little at that. They entered the lab and Emily Piggott very carefully measured the expressions of every person in the room when they noticed legend. Awe, surprise, amazement. Sometimes ambivalence. What could she take away from that? If she was to promote one of them, should she promote one of the awestruck ones? Or one of the taciturn? The starry-eyed might be in the PRT for the wrong reasons, but the ones who were unfazed by the presence of one of the most notable heroes in the United States could easily be plants, hiding their emotions or simply too used to the presence of capes to care. The note? No traces of toxins, radiation, powers or transfers. Why the priority? We get letters from cranks every day. The man who delivered the message reported a fairly convoluted series of safeguards to protect the identity of the sender. Apparently the man who gave him his instructions was given the note by a civilian and ordered to find a random individual and deliver it to the PRT, all with compensation arranged. You've told him? Of course. We doubt anything will come of it. No, it wouldn't. Can he make out the contents without touching the envelope? Can't be too careful. We can and have. The technician handed Emily a paper. She read it over twice. Ben Scar is dead, it seems, and Bonesaw won't be in the field for the interim. God knows how quickly she'll recover, but it's something. Good news, Legend said. Emily wasn't so sure. It's a change. Not a good one. The closing line reads, thanks for the help. I can't help but read in a sarcastic tone. The bug girl, Skitter? Emily nodded. Exactly. As good as it is to have one more member of the Nine dealt with, this shifts the balance of power towards another group of villains. It also serves to move up our deadline. What do you want me to do? Call a meeting. Protectorate and wards. All right. She looked at each of the capes in turn. Legend, Prism, Ursa Aurora and Cache were the outsiders. Heroes on loan. Miss Melissa's group was more worn out. Where their costumes had been damaged, stained or torn, pieces had been replaced from the generic costumes the PRT kept in stock. Miss Melissa had donned the jacket but left the scarf with a flag motif in place. She wore a blank tank top and camouflage pants with a number of empty holsters and sheaths on her weapons. Battery was wearing a plain black costume and goggles, while Assault had replaced the top half of his costume with similar odds and ends. Triumph still wore his helmet and shoulder pads with a roaring lion style, but his gloves had been replaced with the same utilitarian, generic ones the PRT officers wore in the field. The wards, at least, were in better shape. Tired, to be sure, but hadn't been directly in the fray. The patrol shifts were unending, and they always had something to do. Weld, flechette, clock blocker, vista, kidwin and chariot. She deliberately avoided looking at chariot, the mole in their midst. Did Coyle suspect she knew about the mole he'd planted? Could she afford to assume he didn't? Still, it would all be for nothing if she gave the game away. Back to the matter at hand. We have three priorities, she began. We take down the nine, we regain control of the city, and we don't die. She stressed the final two words, waiting to see their reactions. 
were any of her people thinking of performing a heroic sacrifice? There's no point in winning now if any of you die or get converted to the enemy side by Regent or Bonesaw. Even if we were to defeat the Nine outright, through some stroke of fortune, I harbour concerns that we'd lose the city without the manpower to defend it. It's a dangerous situation. She picked up the remote that sat in front of her and clicked the button. The screen showed a map of the city with a spread of territories. The Nine have the advantage of power, not necessarily in terms of the abilities at their disposal, but in terms of their ability to affect change and shape everything that occurs. They are our number one priority, obviously. With them gone, if nothing else, I can hope that more capes will be willing to venture into the city to help out. But we're operating with a deadline, and the undersiders and travellers have just moved it up dramatically. The Nine pose their challenges, and they're losing. There's now four rounds of Jack's little game remaining. Twelve days, depending on their successes and failures in the future. I've talked it over with Legend, and we're both working under the impression that the Nine will enact whatever penalty they mentioned in their terms for the game. Our working assumption is a biological weapon. There are nods around the table. In short, our worst case scenario is a Nine feeling spiteful or cornered, and deploying this weapon. When we attack, we need to make an absolute victory without allowing them an opportunity. Wards, I know you're not obligated to help in this kind of high-risk situation. This is strictly voluntary, and I've had to discuss the matter with your parents to get permission to even raise the subject, but I would value and appreciate your help on this front. The wards exchange glances. If you could raise your hand if you're willing to participate, she ventured. Every hand except two was raised. Chariot and Kidwin. It did mean she had Flechette, Clock Blocker and Vista, the ones she needed. Thank you. Rest assured, Chariot, Kidwin, that I harbour no ill will. My mum wouldn't forgive me if I went, Kidwin said. I understand. Now the nine are only one threat. Let's talk about the others. She clicked the remote again. Tattletile's undersiders have the advantage of information. We still don't know her powers, but we can speculate that it's a peculiar sort of clairvoyance. She was able to provide us detailed, verifiable information on Leviathan after fighting him, even though she was only participating for several minutes before being knocked out. She paused. I believe this is why, in a matter of 24 hours, they are able to fight the Nine twice and win both times. On the first occasion, they captured Cherish and Shatterbird, presumably enslaving the pair. So they have Shatterbird's firepower and Cherish's ability to track people now, Legend spoke. Piggott nodded. Skitter contacted us for assistance, and some of you will remember, when we refused, the Undersiders took the fight of the Nine a second time. Burnscar is dead. Bones still injured. She's invited us to attack them in the meantime. Why would we do that now, when we turn down her offer to cooperate? Weld asked. What's changed between now and then? Communications will be up shortly, Piggott replied. We now have consoles and trained employees ready to man them. And so long as we're back into this as a unit, we don't need to worry about other groups stabbing us in the back at any point during the battle while we engage the Nine. Would they? Legend asked. I have a hard time assessing their motives and morality. I don't know. Could they? Yes, and that possibility is too dangerous, especially given what Regent can do. The Undersiders do not pull their punches. The Travellers, oddly enough, are more moderate, but they do have 16 kills under their belt, due in large part to the sheer power at their disposal. Let's not forget the incident in New York, Legend said. 40 individuals disappeared in one night. Investigation confirmed the Travellers were occupying a nearby location. Chances are good that they were involved. They're complicated, no doubt, Emily confirmed. But for now, they're one knot in a very tangled weave. The Nine have power, the Undersiders have information. Cole has resources that may even exceed our own, including a precog of indeterminate power. Last, but certainly not least, Hookwolf's contingent is one and a half times the size of our own, and he's absorbing the white from the merchant to his own group. He commands a small army. It's a considerable series of obstacles stacked against us, Legend answered, and few capes are willing to step in and help defend the city. Credit to Legend and his teammates for joining us. Thank you. The group of guests nodded. There's more. Time to see how much information filters through to Coyle and how he reacts. With luck, we might be able to pit one problem against the other. Armsmaster's confinement was technically off the record to protect the PRT in this time of crisis. He escapes, and thus far, Dragon has not been able to track him. Without official record or reason to arrest him, our measures are limited. It's impressive that he got away from Dragon. Kidwin said. It is. Thus far, he has eluded every measure she had in place. Either he is much more crafty than even Dragon anticipated, keeping in mind that she's a very smart woman, or Dragon helped him. This gave the others pause. 
Dragon's record of service had been exemplary, Legend spoke. It has, and we put in an inordinate amount of trust in her as a consequence. How many of our resources are tied into her work? If she had a mind to oppose us, would we even be able to deal with her? We have no reason to think she's done anything. Emily waved him off regardless. Very little of this situation remains in our control. Arms Master is gone, the other major players are members of various factions, and we remain in the dark about who many of them are. There are nods all round. She had them listening. I have a solution in mind. The higher-ups have approved it. Clockblocker, you're going to be using your power defensively if things go south. They aren't patient enough to wait for it to wear off. You can protect yourself by using your power on a costume you're wearing, yes? Clockblocker nodded. Vista, I'm counting on you to help control the movements of the Nine. Siberian is immune to powers, but not to external influences. The timing will be sensitive. She clicked the remote and turned her head to look at the result. It was a warhead. On my command, a stealth bomber is prepared to drop payloads of incendiary explosives at the designated location. We evacuate civilians from the area, or lead the Nine to an area where evacuation is possible or unnecessary. Then we drop a payload on site. If they move, we drop another payload. Clock blocker, you protect anyone that's unable to clear out. Legend will ferry you to where you need to be. Cache can rescue people as the effects wear off. That's still not reassuring, Flechette spoke. You'll be equipped with fire-resistant suits. I ordered them in anticipation over fighting Burnscar, but the plan has been adjusted. You'll all look identical, except for agreed upon icons, colours and initials in each costume. One's Jack and the other members of the Nine will not be able to identify, please. There's a team ready to prepare the costumes at a moment's notice. It will help mask the identities of those involved and postpone any reaction from Jack over having broken the terms of the deal. But we are breaking the deal, even if Legend's team doesn't get involved, Miss Melissa started. The incendiary deployment will serve three purposes. They'll forestall any biological attack Bonesaw attempts. They'll force Siberian to stay put to protect her allies and they'll kill Jack or Bonesaw if she isn't able. Humans aren't biologically programmed to look up. Or whatever else Siberian is, she's still human at her core. And if Siberian does protect her allies? Weld asked. Flechette will see if her enhanced shot can beat Siberian's invulnerability. Failing that, Clockblocker contains the woman. His powers won't work on her, but we can cage her in thread or chain that he can then freeze. If we can do the same with Jack and Bonesaw, we can starve them out, or wait until they let go of Siberian. If you're prepared, Clockblocker, we can support you with relief teams. If it means stopping them, I'm down. Unless she's able to walk through that. Weld spoke. It's invoidable, Clockblocker spoke, leaning back in his chair. I'd sooner expect her to fold the universe in half. You sure? It's what the doctors say. And Crawler? Legend asked. Piggott spoke. Legend, Ursa Aurora, Prism, Weld, Assault and Battery will occupy him until we can contain him. He's still vulnerable to psychics. I'm hoping the white phosphorus explosives will keep him in the area long enough for us to put measures in place. As I said, we can't afford to do this halfway. If they get cornered, or if they think they'll lose, we run the risk they'll lash out. She glanced around the room at the 14 power humans present. We carry this out this evening, before any of our opponents catch us on our intentions and complicate the matters with their own agendas. That will be all. Prepare. Seat your suits in the lab. She watched everyone file out. Legend stay behind. Legend stayed behind. You're not saying everything, he murmured. No. Fill me in. Some of that is to mislead the spy in our midst. We have a follow-up measure. Does it pose a risk to the team? It does. Unavoidable. I suspect Coyle will inform Hookwolf and encourage the Chosen, the Pure, and even Faultline group to act. Tattletale, I suspect, will know something's going on and I intend to leak enough information to pique her curiosity. It's in the moment that the villains enter the situation that the risk to our capes occurs. But... But we have a store of equipment we confiscated from Bakuda when we raided her laboratory. Miss Melissa deployed a number against the Leviathan, but we have more. Once the other factions have engaged, we bombard the area with the remainder in a second strike. Our research suggests that several of these explosives can bypass the Manton effect. This breaks the unspoken rule between capes, and the truce against the Nine. I don't like this. It's a world gone mad. Do I have to join the madmen to make a difference? Don't worry, I'm the one who's going to push the button, Pigger answered, and I'm not a cape.
this is Meg. You just finished listening to a chapter from Arc 13, Snare, from the web serial Worm by Tracy McRae. This production is brought to you by the Worm Audiobook Project. If you would like to know more about us or to volunteer your own services, please check us out at audioworm.rain-online.org. You can download or listen to every chapter directly from our site, or you can find us on iTunes or any podcast app under Worm Audiobook. Thank you for listening.